Chapter One of The Return of Alfred. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Return of Alfred by Herbert George Jenkins. To those in many countries who have generously assumed responsibility for the authorship of Patricia Brent Spinster, this book is dedicated by the author. Chapter One The Girl at the Window. All change! The station master was wary of the phrase. He had shouted it, murmured it, purred it, and threatened with it, until he felt it the most odious combination of words the language contained. All change, sir! he repeated irritably, as the passenger for whose benefit he had made the statement showed no sign of movement. Strike begins at ten, he added. But it's not ten yet, smiled the young man, as he glanced at his wrist watch. There won't be time to get on to Upper Saxton, was the reply. We've had instructions to warn all passengers that trains may be left derelict at ten o'clock. Anyway, I think I'll chance it, was the imperturbable reply, and the fair-haired passenger, with his smiling blue eyes, proceeded to light a cigarette. Well, sir, I've warned you, said the station-master with the air of a man who wishes to clear himself of all responsibility. "'You most certainly have,' agreed the passenger, as he dropped the match upon the carpeted floor of the first-class compartment and put his foot upon it. The station-master had promised to be home by nine o'clock to a stewed steak and onion supper, a dish dear to his heart, and now he had been delayed nearly an hour by this miserable business of trying to explain to congenital idiots that if they persisted in their folly, they would, in all probability, be left stranded, and that it was no use threatening him with legal proceedings. In return, they had done nothing but pester him with their ridiculous questions as to what the company meant to do. Could he recommend a good hotel? Where could a motor-car be obtained? He banged to the door viciously. He hated strikes. He hated trade unions. He hated railways. He hated everything connected with locomotion. It was only from sheer lack of inspiration that he did not curse the day that gave to the world George Stevenson. "'Right, sir,' queried the guard, his whistle lifted towards his lips. "'Right,' echoed the station-master. "'One passenger won't get out,' he added, and he waved his hand with the air of a Pontius pilot repudiating all responsibility for the folly of others. He was wondering what, in the natural order of things, would be the effect of half an hour's delay upon stewed steak and onions. There was a shrill whistle, a green light described an arc-like movement, and the station-master turned to escape from a fiery-faced little man with an eye like a fish and a moustache like a walrus. On his lips the station-master saw imbecile questions framing themselves. "'Why didn't that gentleman get—' The station-master fled. Realization had suddenly come to him that every passenger who had alighted from the train at his suggestion would inevitably ask the same question. As the train gathered speed, the solitary passenger found himself wondering whether or no he had been wise in disregarding the advice officially tendered. There was something about the station-master, he decided, that had irritated him. He disliked taking advice from men who, because they were fair, spared the use of a razor. It was almost as bad as not washing your neck because you're addicted to high colours. He had been warned at Liverpool Street that the strike would begin at ten o'clock, and that it was more than doubtful if the train would get through to Norwich, its destination. Anxious and misguided officials even refused to book beyond Upper Saxton, where they were due at 9.58. But the train was late, and on arrival at Bittleborough, the station-master had become almost hysterical in his efforts to thwart the N.U.R., which he hated. Arguing that the leaving of trains derelict was against all precedent, and anxious to get on to Cromer, where the Grand Garden Hotel had a room booked for James Smith, Esquire, the passenger had decided to carry on. Once at Norwich, he knew he could get a car or a taxicab to run him to his destination. Now that he was committed to the adventure, he found himself curious to see what actually would happen at ten o'clock. At least he could sleep in the first-class compartment he occupied. He had known less comfortable quarters in France during the Somme battles, for instance. James Smith. 
how familiar the old name had seemed as he added it to the telegraph form. Private James Smith. Why had he given the name to the recruiting officer on that August morning seven years before? He had often wondered. He had no thought of enlisting other than under his own name. But somehow, when the moment came, Darrell Hildreth had seemed to cry aloud for a commission, and that was just what he was most anxious to avoid. He was determined to do his bit in the ranks. Yet, four and a half years later, he had returned to private life as Lieutenant Colonel Darrell Hildreth, DSO, MC, MM. He smiled a little grimly at the recollection. Those five years had meant something more than a temporary military rank and a string of initials after his name. They had somehow or other changed things. Just how, he had never been able quite to decide. Some new and strange influence seemed to have asserted itself. His perceptions had become keener, his judgments more critical, his general outlook more fatalistic. He had returned to his old niche, but somehow it did not seem to be his. He had gone away, one of England's young barbarians, as Matthew Arnold expressed it, and he had returned. What? What had happened out there to bring about such a change? There had been killing, suffering, and— Yes, perhaps that was it. Brotherhood. Class differences had been brushed aside. The man who at home would have touched a respectful cap to him had called him chum or matey, had spoken of his mother and family, of his own feelings. There had been no attempt to disguise emotion. Strong men had wept, big enough of heart not to feel ashamed. There had been self-sacrifice, too, and sentiment, and a belief in God. Suddenly a sort of time machine had thrust him back five years into an environment that no longer fitted. "'By Jove! They were humming along at a spanking pace,' was his thought as he glanced out of the window at the flying hedges and trees. Direct action or no direct action. Yes, he now saw things that hitherto had evaded him. Among others, those little crinkles that manifested themselves in Vera Truscombe's nose when she laughed— Hitherto she had seemed to him charming, a typical healthy-minded English girl, good-looking, well-born, popular, everything she should be, in fact, and all the time her nose had crinkled, and he had not seen it. In a vague way he had known that his uncle was set upon joining up the Hildreth and Truscombe estates, and when Sir John Hildreth, ninth baronet, set his mind upon a thing, it invariably meant either the thing became an accomplished fact or, as an alternative, that there was a series of violent explosions. "'What the devil does her nose matter?' his uncle had shouted that day in the library at Hildreth Hall, when he heard of the impending rupture of his plans, and his nephew had found it utterly impossible to explain that those crinkles in Vera Truscombe's nose were to him what a contemptible little army had proved to the Germans, an insurmountable obstacle." With the assurance of a confirmed bachelor, Sir John had plunged into his matchmaking schemes without even consulting his sister, Mrs. Compton Stacy, whose sound common sense and tact had rescued him from many an awkward situation into which his impulsive egotism had plunged him. "'Isn't he my heir?' Sir John had thundered. "'To the title and estates, yes,' she had replied calmly. "'But not to your taste in women.' He's a damn ungrateful young scoundrel. The words had been rapped out with all the force of Sir John's volcanic nature. His short white moustache had bristled, his naturally rubicund complexion had taken on a deeper hue as it always did when he was angry. In a vague way the little red-faced passenger on the platform had reminded the adventurous passenger of his uncle. He's as bad as that infernal fellow Peters. Sir John had exploded. Sooner or later he always dragged in the name of his late butler, with whom the growing of a moustache had been the cause of his feudal undoing. At the first sound of war Peters had enlisted, just how he had got his fifteen stone past the critical eye of the doctor into the army no one knew. Sir John Hildreth was furious at losing the best butler he had ever known, and had called it damned unnecessary. When, four and a half years later, Peters had stepped from behind that veil of mystery known as demobilization into the bright glare of civilian life. 
plus a henna-coloured moustache of gigantic proportions, the irate baronet had become almost apoplectic with rage. "'What the devil do you mean by it, Peters?' he had exploded. "'Go and shave that damn thing off at once!' During his years in the army, Peters had discovered, in himself, a new and hitherto unsuspected capacity. Nature had endowed him with the ability to grow a moustache of exactly the same curve and tint as that of Lord Kitchener, only more so. Sir John had stormed and sworn, damned the war, execrated all moustaches as unhygienic and obscene. Damn filthy, was his phrase, but Peters remained obdurate, and he had given notice. At this Sir John had sworn the more. He vowed that the very sight of the Auburn wealth upon Peters' upper lip made all thought of soup revolting to him. He reminded Peters of his fifteen years' service with the Hildreth. He offered to raise his wages, and ended by telling him to go to hell. Peters had temporized by going to Hasselmere, where he possessed a sister in the trade. Del Hildreth had suggested that his uncle should advertise for a modern Delilah, which had resulted in an even greater flow of eloquence and profanity from Sir John, who had failed to catch the allusion a circumstance that increased his annoyance. Realising that a butler with an auburn moustache of gigantic proportions would be like a fox-terrier with an unbitten tail, Peters had subsequently accepted service as a gentleman's gentleman with a nephew and heir, a post that would give him greater liberty to cultivate his moustache and indulge his passion for motorcycling. As it began to dawn upon Sir John that he was in danger of a second defeat, he had proceeded to explode like the backfiring of a high-power racing car. Finally he had delivered an ultimatum to his nephew. It was either marriage with Vera Truscombe, or being cut off with a shilling. Smith could almost hear the final terrific explosion which had taken place when he had made it clear that he could not accept his uncle's matrimonial views. He had been told to go to the devil, and go pseudonymously. In other words, he was told not to drag the ancient name of Hildreth into the mire. He had striven to explain to his uncle that the war had made a difference, only to be told that any fool could see that by the income tax. The upshot of the interview was that he had vowed to drop the family name, and never use it again without his uncle's permission, whereat Sir John had vociferated that he was a damn ungrateful young puppy, and had shot out of the library like a howitzer shell. Within the next hour he had discharged his chauffeur, the head gardener, and a frightened housemaid whom he encountered in a corridor. Smith smiled at the thought of the periodical discharges to which the domestics at Hildreth Hall were subject. No one ever took them seriously. Sir John had been known to discharge the same man half a dozen times in one week. From the scene at Hildreth Hall Smith's thoughts travelled to another scene at his own chambers in German Street. It had been less dramatic, but every whit as interesting. Peters had. Suddenly he glanced at his wrist-watch. The hands pointed to five minutes to ten. In a flash Sir John, Peters' moustache, and Vera Truscombe's nose had disappeared. The moment of drama was approaching. His eyes remained fixed upon the white dial of his watch. Would direct action triumph? If it did, he would find himself in the very devil of a hole. As the hands crept on, he found himself experiencing a pleasant thrill of excitement. He realized the feelings of the man in a film he had once seen, who, bound to a chair, watched a candle slowly burn down to the point when it would ignite a fuse attached to a hundred weight of high explosive immediately beneath him. Ten o'clock came. Still the train pounded on at a good forty miles an hour. One minute, two minutes, three minutes passed. Smith began to congratulate himself upon his foresight. He was conscious of a feeling of superiority over the passengers who had been so easily intimidated into relinquishing their journey. Such a triumph of mind over direct action was a thing worthy of another cigarette, he decided. Selecting one, he struck a match. As he did so, there was a sudden and violent grinding of brakes, and the train began to lose speed. In a flash he remembered that at Liverpool Street his watch had been four and a half minutes fast. He laughed, and the neglected match burned his fingers. Damn! He struck another match, lit the cigarette, and, with a quickening interest, 
rose and thrust his head and shoulders out of the carriage window. In the gathering dusk little was to be seen beyond the curve of dingy railway carriages. There was no signal in sight, no township or village, in fact nothing but a flat landscape over which heavy rain-clouds were hurrying, as if anxious to get home before night finally closed in. The head of the guard appeared at the rear of the train. He waved his hand, and appeared to shout something which Smith could not hear above the noise of the brakes. Presently the man swung himself out upon the footboard, where he stood with a leg and arm extended, looking like some mechanical figure fixed to the side of the train. As they jerked to a standstill, the guard dropped to the permanent way, and approached the carriage from the window of which Smith leant, an interested spectator of direct action in process of application. "'We're not going any further,' said the guard. Smith regarded him curiously. "'I'm going on to Norwich, and eventually to Cromer,' he said, with an assurance he was far from feeling. "'I'm afraid you can't, sir,' said the guard civilly. He had now reached a point immediately beneath Smith. "'The strike's begun.' Smith did not reply immediately. The news required digesting. "'They warned you at Biddleborough.' "'But what's going to happen to you?' cried Smith. "'Camping out here until the strike's all over?' "'We shall run the train on to the upper Saxton siding and go home.' "'I see. "'If you'll hand down your luggage, sir,' said the guard, his professional instinct triumphing over his trade unionism. "'I think I'll go on with you to upper Saxton, wherever that may be,' said Smith, with the air of a man who has just solved a difficult problem. "'I'm afraid you can't, sir,' was the reply, uttered with just a tinge of impatience. The strike's begun. It's against orders to carry passengers after ten o'clock. Then consider me a member of your union, smiled Smith. I'll pay the subscription now. He drew from his pocket a letter case and proceeded to extract a one pound note. Charlie! came a voice from the engine. What the hell are you doing, Bo? Stopping here all night? The guard waved his hand in acknowledgment of the remark but without diverting his gaze from the note in Smith's hand. "'It can't be done, sir,' he said regretfully. "'Orders are orders. You'll have to get down, sir.' "'But your quarrel isn't with the passengers. It's with the company,' suggested Smith. "'If we didn't do something, the passengers wouldn't know there's a strike on.' "'Oh, little things like that are bound to get about,' said Smith pleasantly, as he returned the note to his case, and the case to his pocket." The guard turned aside with a sigh, and Smith lifted down his suitcase and gathered up his raincoat. Opening the door of the carriage, he dropped down beside the guard, just as a further shout from the engine, again invoking the speakers hereafter, reminded his comrade that he was no longer a servant of the public. "'Well, perhaps you're right, guard. It will be quite a novel experience, camping out on the up-track.' With a shrill on his whistle and a wave of his arm, the guard swung himself up on to the footboard and proceeded to haul himself along the carriages towards his own van. "'I'm sorry, sir,' he called down to Smith, a few seconds later as he was drawn past. "'I would have done it if I could.' "'Which means,' muttered Smith, "'that the instinctive venality of railway guards remains unimpaired by any action, direct or otherwise.' Slowly the train pushed its way into the night its tail-light gleaming evilly at the stranded traveller marooned upon the up-track. Smith watched the red eye turn to pink, the pink to a blur, which finally became absorbed in the grey wall of the landscape. The rumble of the train still crescendoed back to him, accentuated by the low-lying clouds. When that in turn ceased, he became conscious of a strange sense of loneliness. From where he stood, he commanded a limited view but nowhere could he detach from the varying degrees of shadow anything that was definitely suggestive of a house. A spot of rain on the back of his hand gave warning that it was time to think of shelter for the night. He glanced up at the clouds, which appeared desirous of showing how close they could get to the earth without actually touching it. Somewhere in the distance an owl hooted its challenge to the oncoming night. "'Direct action!' he muttered, as he picked up his suitcase and clambered down the embankment. Can be the very devil. There seemed nothing to do but to walk on until he struck some habitation, where he might either inquire the way to an inn, or else obtain shelter until morning. Instinctively he turned to the west, 
where a faint grey light still lingered. It seemed less inhospitable than the rest of the landscape. The pervading flatness of the countryside made it impossible to identify those hedges which bordered roads. The landscape gave the impression of being as trackless as the prairie, and as destitute of population as the Sahara itself. Occasionally some unseen beast, wrapped to the horns in the greyness of evening, would send forth a subdued low of foreboding, but no other sound broke the stillness. As the last flicker of grey vanished from the west, the rain began to fall, as if it had held back only in deference to the departing day. Putting down his suitcase by a gate giving access to a field of what looked like barley, Smith struggled into his coat. A few minutes later he was trudging against a slant of wetness that left him in no doubt as to its determination to soak him to the skin. With head down and shoulders hunched, he continued on his way, conscious of only two things, that the man who had labelled his coat rain-proof was a liar, and that direct action was the invention of Satan himself. At the end of half an hour's steady plodding, he had dropped direct action, and found himself concentrating, with all the misanthropy of which he was possessed, upon the maker and the vendor of his coat. At length a gate brought him quite unexpectedly to a promising-looking road. Even in this land of apparent troglodytes there must be some progressive spirits who lived above ground. As if fate had wearied of the game and had decided to throw in her hand, a few minutes later Smith found himself standing before a pair of wrought-iron gates, opening on to what appeared to be a drive. He tried them. They were locked. He struck a match. The wind blew it out. He struck another. A spot of rain extinguished it. After exhausting some half a dozen matches and all his patience, he decided to make an effort to scale either the gates or the wall visible on either side. In all probability this was the only house for miles round. He realized the risk he was running. He might be shot, or arrested, or even torn by dogs but anything would be preferable to his present intolerable condition. He had already roundly cursed the station-master for not possessing a more compelling personality. To ensure greater freedom of movement, he removed his raincoat and threaded one of the sleeves through the handles of his suitcase. He then tied the two sleeves round his neck and swung the case behind him. The sensation of being half-choked was not pleasant. Grasping the ironwork of the gate, he proceeded to haul himself up. In the course of the next few minutes, he realized that the high priests of obstacle races had proved themselves lacking in imagination. To climb a high gate in drenched garments, with a suitcase tied to your back by the sleeves of a raincoat, epitomized a veritable grand national of obstacles. When he eventually descended on the inner side of the gate, he was conscious that the front of his right trouser leg was ripped from knee to hip. Two buttons had been torn from his coat, together with about two square inches of material. He had dropped his hat on the roadside of the wall, and the raincoat had caught on a spike, leaving a considerable section of the skirt fluttering somewhere between heaven and earth. In short, he had left about those gates sufficient apparel to enable a really intelligent detective to deduce both the act and the gender of the perpetrator. Allowing the suitcase to remain strung behind him, Smith began to explore what was obviously the drive belonging to a residence of some size. A few yards up he was able to identify the porter's lodge. He paused irresolutely, and glanced at his wrist-watch. The luminous hands pointed to five minutes to eleven. Should he make his appeal to this unknown Horatius, or proceed to the house itself? Arguing that a servant was not likely to manifest hospitable tendencies to a wayfarer appearing before him, minus a hat, two buttons from his coat, a strip of his trousers, and about a third of his raincoat, he decided to make for the house, and risk the possibility of being treed by a dog. It was foolish to look on the dark side of the adventure. The owner might possibly prove to be an eccentric, who would see nothing unusual in one man scaling another's gate after dark in order to offer to spend the night with him. The place might even turn out to be a private asylum, which would render explanations unnecessary. If it were a ladies' school, his act would appear in the light of romance. He would, in all probability, be handed over to the gardener, 
and in the morning become the hero of a hundred pigtailed hearts. There was always the possibility of his host to be turning out to be a bad temper and a good shot, in which case the responsibility for the explanation would devolve upon him. It was all very interesting. Still, the dark, tree-bordered drive was devilishly long, and the rain on his uncovered head infernally wet, and that suitcase had gone in a real stranglehold. Just at the point when he decided that the drive was bewitched, and, like Vanderdecken's efforts to round the horn, continued for ever, Smith suddenly stopped dead. He blinked several times, as if to make certain that he really were awake. The strain of his suitcase, however, reassured him. There, a few yards ahead, was a girl at a window, apparently occupied in gazing down at him, whether in sorrow or in anger he could not say. He was prepared to swear that she had not been there five seconds before. She seemed suddenly to appear from nowhere, like rain at Henley Regatta. She must have drawn back a curtain, or suddenly switched on a light, but whatever it was, she was now looking out into the night, possibly at him. The light behind threw out her slim figure in strong silhouette. She was of medium height, he noticed, and was dressed in green. She— Then the picture was blotted out, leaving him gazing at a blank of darkness, and speculating as to whether or no there was sufficient left of the skirts of his raincoat to hide the rent in his trousers. Approaching the house warily, he mounted the steps, and felt about for a bell with which to announce his presence. Nowhere could he find anything suggestive of how a guest was to apprise the occupants of his arrival. It required the expenditure of two matches before he saw the handsome wrought-iron bell-pool on his right. Without hesitation he tucked at it. The strain of the suitcase was becoming intolerable. He thought he detected the distant whirr of an electric bell. As he waited for his summons to be answered, he found himself speculating as to the identity of the girl at the window. Was she the mistress, or the daughter of the house? Was she beautiful, or did her nose crinkle when she laughed? Would she realize the humor of the situation, or would she see in him only a vagrant who had audaciously climbed the ancestral gates to arouse the household at dead of night? Possibly she kept a covey of hungry hounds, which were automatically loose at the first alarm. For one thing he was thankful. It would not be she who would open the door. Should she appear subsequently— there would, in all probability, be some hospitable chair or table behind which he could take cover, and thus hide the deficiencies of his clothing. Suddenly he became conscious of the grotesque figure he must present, with a suitcase tied to his back by the saturated remnants of a raincoat, which really was not a raincoat at all, but a vivid, palpitating lie which direct action and Norfolk weather had been successful in exposing. He essayed to undo the sleeves tied under his chin but they seemed reluctant to part. The tension, coupled with the rain, had hardened the knot. The sound of bolts being withdrawn hastened his movements. Pulling his suitcase round to the front, he tried to slip the raincoat over his head, and thus disembarrass himself of the two encumbrances in one movement. Something, however, had apparently caught, for what remained of the skirts of the tattered garment fell over his eyes, effectually blinding him to anything that might result from his summons. He struggled to free his head, or at least his eyes, but the wretched garment seemed suddenly to have assumed the proportions of a marquee. The sounds in front of him continued. From what he heard of the drawing of bolts, he decided that the girl at the window must be in nightly fear of abduction. As he struggled with the enveloping folds, he became conscious that a light had somewhere broken out from the darkness. He could see it indistinctly through the material of the lying raincoat with which he was unwillingly playing at Blindman's Buff. Suddenly a tear manifested itself just in the line of his vision. The door had been opened some ten or twelve inches where it was held by a chain. Through the slit he saw the figure of an old man, garbed in a royal blue dressing-gown, time-worn and obviously made for one of slimmer build, a pair of carpet slippers and a bandana handkerchief loosely twisted about his neck. At the sight of two eyes peering at him from the khaki-coloured folds of the tattered raincoat, the old man started back. "'I'm frightfully sorry,' apologised Smith, in muffled tones, as he continued to struggle with the infernal thing that seemed determined to envelop him for ever. "'I'm frightfully sorry, but 
could you possibly put me up for the night the expression on the old man's face at this unusual request struck smith as irresistibly funny and he laughed at the same moment the raincoat fell away from him carried to the ground by the weight of the suitcase mr alfred the old man whispered the words as if afraid of being overheard in his eyes was a look half of fear half of incredulity mr alfred he repeated as his trembling fingers began to fumble with the chain on which the door was held a moment later it was opened to its widest extent smith stepped across the threshold tripped over the suitcase and lurched forward as he fell he clutched wildly at the dingy dressing gown got the wearer round the knees and brought him down in the real rugby style a moment later the two men were sitting toe to toe gazing into one another's surprised eyes the dressing gown had parted up to the knees exposing grey worsted underwear and what looked like the tails of a nightshirt throwing back his head smith laughed the expression on the old man's face suggestive of a medley of emotions coupled with the wild absurdity of the adventure rendered him almost hysterical the more he looked at the quaint figure opposite the more ridiculous the thing appeared what is the matter willis inquired a quiet and perfectly inflected voice smith looked up sobered as if by magic there standing at the head of the stairs and looking gravely down at them as if accustomed to seeing two men in nondescript garments sitting on the hall mat late at night was the girl he had seen at the window the question seemed to break the spell the butler scrambled awkwardly to his feet hastily wrapping the dressing gown about him whilst smith rose behind the remains of the raincoat which he modestly draped over the chair in his trouser leg it's mr alfred come back miss marjorie whispered the old man hoarsely and clutching smith by the coat sleeve he broke down and sobbed like a child great gulliver cried smith and in his astonishment he dropped the tattered remnants of the raincoat. End of chapter one. Chapter two of the Return of Alfred by Herbert George Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter two. A question of identity. As he gazed down at the bent figure of the old man, whose shoulders were heaving convulsively, Smith realized, from the slight swaying of his body, that he was on the verge of collapse. "'Oh, Mr. Alfred,' he murmured, as Smith placed a steadying arm across his shoulders, "'how we've all prayed for this day!' And the tears coursed unchecked down his cheeks. Through Smith's mind fluttered a medley of impressions, he was torn between a desire to laugh and a feeling that he wanted a glass of water with which to wash down the lump in his throat. He was acutely conscious of his torn trouser leg, which he was unable to cover up, until the butler, he was obviously the butler, began to manifest signs of stiffening into a more rigid position, after which Smith decided to take cover behind a chair. The whole affair brought back to his mind a scene from The Silver King, which he had seen as a boy. "'Please let him sit down.' The girl had descended the stairs, and now stood regarding the butler with anxious eyes. Smith turned to find himself gazing into a pair of large violet eyes, grave and steady, but capable, he felt, of breaking into mischievous light. He moved closer to the butler, that the dilapidation of his clothing might be less obvious. Turning Willis in the direction of the nearest chair, Smith half led, half propelled him towards it, taking short steps that his right leg might be in close proximity to the skirt of the dingy dressing-gown. "'I'm so sorry, Mr. Alfred,' murmured the old man, as he was gently lowered into the chair. "'It was a shock, and at my heart I'm getting old, sir,' he added apologetically, his pale blue eyes smiling weakly through the tears with which they were still swimming. "'Keep quite still, Willis,' said the girl, looking at him with grave concern. "'You'll feel better presently.' By a quick movement Smith placed himself behind the chair on which the old man sat, his eyes fixed upon the raincoat lying a few feet away, but out of reach. 
The girl looked at him curiously. His sudden dive to cover seemed to strike her as odd. "'Oh, Miss Marjorie! What is it? Is it a burglar? Is Mr. Willis hurt?' Smith looked up suddenly at this new diversion. Coming down the stairs was a bright pink dressing-gown, enveloping a little round woman with a little round face surmounted by iron-grey hair, roughly bundled into a net. She seemed in a great hurry as, with both hands gripping the banisters, she pulled herself from stair to stair like a child. She was so round that Smith felt her best chance of reaching the hall quickly would have been to bounce down. The eyes of the three in the hall were fixed upon the quaint little figure descending the stairs. Smith began to wonder if he were passing through some new manifestation of the Arabian Nights. In all probability, houris and dancing girls, flute players, and negro slaves bearing great baskets of fruit would appear in due sequence. The whole affair was too ridiculous for an ordinary commonplace mind. Such things did not happen in well-ordered Norfolk mansions, and, well, the whole thing was utterly and egregiously absurd. A sudden movement from the chair before him distracted his attention. The butler still seemed undecided as to whether or no he should faint. A moment later Smith felt his right arm clutched firmly, almost fiercely, and he found himself looking down into a pair of china-blue eyes that gazed up at him from a round, cherubic little face. "'Oh, my lamb! My lamb!' cried the little creature in the pink wrapper who, on reaching the level, had covered the distance between herself and Smith with a remarkable speed. "'You've come back to us at last!' I, I, "'I beg your pardon?' Even as he uttered the words, Smith was conscious of their absurdity. "'I knew you would come back to us, you poor lamb!' she cried. "'And, oh, look at you!' She stood back from him and gazed at his torn clothing. "'Look at your poor trousers!' His trousers were the last things upon this earth to which Smith desired attention to be drawn. He was conscious that the eyes of all three were fixed upon the lower part of the rent, not quite hidden by his coat, which had managed to fasten by the top button. "'You poor dear!' wailed the little woman again. "'What have they been doing to you? Tell, Higgy!' The position was one full of embarrassment. Smith happened to catch the eye of the girl. He could have sworn he detected a glint of laughter, but it was gone in a flash. "'I thought you must be a burglar,' continued the round little body, "'and that you had killed poor Mr. Willis. I heard him come down. "'Oh, Mr. Willis!' she cried, turning to the butler. "'To think we should live to see this day!' Willis uttered something suggestive of a sympathetic moan. "'Really,' broke in Smith, smarting at the recollection of the laughter in the girl's eyes. I don't know what all this means, but— He stopped. It was devilishly awkward to explain to three people that he had climbed an iron gate at eleven o'clock at night in order to seek shelter. "'We must cable to her ladyship,' murmured Willis, making an effort to rise. "'I—' He sank back again, however. Obviously the shock had shaken him badly. "'Not to-night, Willis,' said the girl with decision. "'It's too late.' and the post office is closed. Then, turning to Smith, she added, "'She is not strong, and she went to South Africa for a voyage.' "'But,' began the little woman in pink, then she stopped suddenly. Willis was nodding his head in approval of the girl's words. "'Don't you think, Mrs. Higgs, you had better release this gentleman's arm?' inquired the girl with a little friendly smile. "'He looks very tired.' "'This gentleman?' cried the little woman, addressed as Mrs. Higgs. "'Why, Miss Marjorie, he isn't a gentleman. He's Mr. Alfred. Our Mr. Alfred. Surely you—' "'But then you were only in short frocks when he—when he went away, wasn't she, Mr. Willis?' "'You had better show Mr. Alfred to his room when you feel well enough, Willis.' There was a noticeable pause before the girl pronounced the name. "'And then I think we might all get to bed.' "'It's late,' and she glanced at her wrist-watch. "'Yes, Miss Marjorie,' murmured Willis, with the air of one accustomed to receiving orders from her. With a slight bow to Smith, the girl turned, crossed the hall, and ran lightly up the stairs, leaving him speculating as to what would be the attitude of her ladyship 
in regard to his sudden appearance in the family circle, and, above all, what relationship was supposed to exist between them. He more than half suspected that he was to be proclaimed an erring son, returned to the ancestral roof after years of wandering. Would Marjorie turn out to be a sister? What wonderful hair she had, and what ankles! He was sure that she could laugh without crinkling her nose. "'Feeling better?' he inquired of Willis, as the girl disappeared at the top of the stairs. "'Thank you, Mr. Alfred,' was the grateful reply, as the old man looked up, an expression in his eyes that was almost adoration. "'I'm so sorry, Mr. Alfred. I ought to—' He made another ineffectual effort to rise, but sank back again. "'That's all right,' said Smith cheerily. "'You just sit down there until you're feeling fit again.' "'Isn't that just like Mr. Alfred, Mr. Willis?' She, whom the girl had called Mrs. Higgs, having relinquished Smith's arm, now stood looking up at him with an affection which he found positively embarrassing. "'Your poor trousers! How—' "'Between you and me,' said Smith with a smile, "'my trousers are my Achilles' heel.' "'So?' she crooned, without understanding the classical allusion. "'You poor lamb! And how wet you are!' Once more she made an effort to clutch his arm, but Smith was too quick for her. He stepped quickly back, ostensibly to move his suitcase to the side of the hall. "'Do you mind telling me who I am supposed to be?' he inquired, looking from Willis to Mrs. Higgs. "'You're Mr.' began the butler, when he was interrupted by the old lady. "'Who you're supposed to be?' she cried. "'Why, you're our Mr. Alfred! My Mr. Alfred!' she added, as if to remove from his mind any possibility of doubt as to her share in him. "'Didn't I nurse you when you were a baby? Didn't I—' "'Hush,' said Smith. "'Let us draw a veil over these embarrassing intimacies.' "'Isn't that just like Mr. Alfred?' she cried, showing a perfect set of teeth, as she turned to Willis for corroboration. He nodded, and rubbed his eyes with the back of his hand. "'But who is Mr. Alfred? Or who was Mr. Alfred?' asked Smith. "'And who is everybody? Incidentally, who are you?' He smiled down into the china-blue eyes. He felt that the time had come to make an effort to escape from the skein of misidentification in which he had become involved. "'As if you don't remember your poor old nurse, your old Higgy!' "'Oh, that's it, is it? You're Mr. Alfred's nurse, and Willis, I take it, is the major-domo. I'm the butler, Mr. Alfred. Surely you haven't forgotten.' "'And who is Miss Marjorie?' interrupted Smith. "'And who is her ladyship?' "'Miss Marjorie is a friend, Mr. Stannard's daughter, Master Eric's sister,' she explained in the soothing accents one adopts with a refractory child. "'And her ladyship is your mother, Mr. Alfred.' He was conscious of a feeling of relief that the consanguinities left the field clear in one direction, although the sudden possession of an unknown mother might prove an embarrassment. Still, she was in South Africa. "'I'm very sorry,' he said at length. "'But I'm not Mr. Alfred. I—' "'Not Mr. Alfred!' cried Mrs. Higgs. "'Not Mr. Alfred!' repeated Willis. The two gazed up at Smith incredulously, the expression on their faces so ludicrous that he found it difficult to restrain a smile. Willis struggled to his feet, as if such an amazing statement could be confuted only in an upright position. "'Perhaps, Mr. Alfred, perhaps you've lost your memory,' he suggested. "'Ah!' cried Mrs. Higgs, clutching at the straw as if it had been a body life-belt. "'You've been ill and lost your memory.' She seemed quite satisfied with the explanation. "'Anyway, if you'll let me dry my clothes, I shall be eternally grateful to you both.' said Smith. "'Norfolk seems rather a wet county,' he added. The effect of his remark was instantaneous. "'I'm so sorry, Mr. Alfred,' cried Willis, picking up the suitcase, whilst Mrs. Higgs clucked round him like a broody hen, feeling the wetness of him, and murmuring, "'You poor lamb!' and "'Look at your poor trousers!' Without further argument, the procession formed, Mrs. Higgs leading the way, using both hands to help herself up the shallow stairs, 
whilst Willis brought up the rear with the suitcase. He had made a valiant effort to attach to himself the raincoat, but Smith, quicker of the mark, secured what was, in reality, the only thing between him and flagrant indelicacy. Never, Smith decided, had a more extraordinary procession mounted the staircase. The three might easily have formed the characters in a knockabout farce. The pink of Mrs. Hicks's wrapper clashed wickedly with the blue of Willis's dressing-gown, whilst as for himself, surely never in the history of prodigals had one returned in a more thoroughly dilapidated condition. The one thing that began to trouble him was the prospect of securing a few husks. He was uncommonly hungry. The act of walking up this strange, heavily carpeted staircase seemed to bring him to a realization of the hopelessly false position in which he had become involved. What would happen if the real Alfred were to turn up? He, Smith, would be branded as an impostor, and, in all probability, booted out, or perhaps even prosecuted. At the head of the stairs Willis took the lead, still tottery, but making an effort to control his weakness. Beside Willis toddled Mrs. Higgs, the two whispering together. Smith distinctly heard the words, lost his memory. Halfway along the corridor they paused at a door on the right, which Willis threw open. Mrs. Higgs once more grasped Smith's coat-sleeve. "'Oh, my dear,' she murmured in tones that were none too steady, "'Mr. Willis will look after you.' "'I assure you,' Smith began. Then he paused. It seemed so futile to attempt to dispute the testimony of these two good souls who seemed, without question, to accept him as the missing Alfred. "'There has been an extraordinary mistake,' he continued. "'My name isn't Alfred. It's Smith, James Smith, of—' He paused, then quickly added, "'Of London. I came to ask—' "'Hadn't you better change your clothes, Mr. Alfred?' interposed Willis, pushing open the door to its fullest extent. "'You are very wet, sir.' It seemed to Smith absurd to be ordered to change into dry clothing on the assumption that he was someone else. Still, he had to spend the night somewhere, and shelter seemed difficult to find in Norfolk. Anyhow, everything could be explained in the morning. "'He must have a hot bath at once, Mr. Willis.' The words broke in upon his thoughts. "'The poor lamb,' continued Mrs. Higgs. "'Many's the time I've bathed him. "'Ah, oh, Mr. Alfred,' she added reminiscently, "'you are such a beautiful child in your—' Suddenly she sneezed. This seemed to remind her of the hour, for, with a hurried grip of Smith's hand in both her own, she turned and trotted down the corridor, obviously reluctant to leave to Willis the honours of the occasion. Smith entered the room, followed by the butler. Having closed the door, the old man stood alternately blinking and dabbing his eyes with a coloured handkerchief, which he had just produced from somewhere. As he entered the room, Smith looked about him curiously. The first thing that struck him was not the atmosphere of luxury, or the obvious comfort of the room itself, but two bowls of roses, one on a table in front of the window, the other on the dressing-table. There was something pathetic and touching in these silent symbols of memory. He walked across to the dressing-room, and then into the bathroom. Slowly he was becoming convinced that it was a dream, from which he would presently awaken to the realities of trudging across rain-soaked fields in search of shelter. He had heard that policemen sometimes fell asleep when on their beats at night. "'Don't you think you ought to get your things off, Mr. Alfred?' he heard Willis saying in an anxious voice. You know where everything is. He paused, as if suddenly recollecting Mrs. Hicks's suggestion about his loss of memory. The cigarettes are over there, Mr. Alfred, he continued hastily, and the whisky and soda there. He indicated where each was to be found. You look so tired, sir. A hot bath? It's not a bad idea, said Smith, as he glanced across at the bed. Yes, I think I will and turn in afterwards. You'd better turn in, too," he added, smiling in spite of himself at the quaint figure the butler presented. I'll put your things out, Mr. Alfred, and prepare your— You'll do nothing of the sort, said Smith, with decision. You'd better have a whisky and soda to pull you together, and then get a good sleep. 
"'Thank you, Mr. Alfred,' said the old man gratefully. "'But—' "'Never mind about the but. Do as I say,' was the smiling retort. There was something very lovable about the old fellow. "'Yes, Mr. Alfred,' said Willis obediently. He still lingered, however. Smith looked at him interrogatingly. "'I—I I only wanted to say, sir, how—how how happy this will make us all.' His voice shook. "'Her ladyship has been ill. We were afraid she was—but she'll be better now.' And he left the room, blinking rapidly. Having turned on the water in the bath, Smith proceeded to undress, walking about the room as he did so, examining first one thing, then another. Selecting a cigarette from a silver box on the dressing-table, he lighted it, and then continued his wandering into the dressing-room and on to the bathroom again, like a man who is puzzled at finding himself in unaccustomed surroundings. Luxury there was everywhere, comfort and happiness. Yes, and the cigarettes were good. Evidently somebody had a delicate taste in tobacco. He opened the wardrobe and peeped in. The clothes had every appearance of being unworn. Out of curiosity he tried on the jacket of a lounge suit, and stood regarding himself in the long mirror. Certainly Alfred's figure was not unlike his own. The jacket was a very passable fit. Walking over to the dressing-table, he tested the razors. They were sharp and ready for use. In short, everything seemed to indicate that the room was in occupation. His eyes suddenly caught sight of a pincushion. The bright heads of the pins with which it was stuck gave him an idea. Taking a final deep inhalation from his cigarette, he selected a pin, and deliberately stuck it into his forearm. It hurt. He looked about him. No, he had not awakened. Once more he ran the pin deep into the flesh, this time of the other arm. He waited a moment, but still he did not waken. He gazed at the pin between his fingers, then stabbed it back into the pincushion. Walking over to the bathroom, he discarded his remaining clothing and stepped into the grateful warmth. "'Well, it isn't a dream, anyhow,' he said, with a sigh in which there was a supreme contentment. "'It isn't drink, and it isn't cocaine. I wonder what the juice it is.' As he lay smoking, Smith found himself wondering what Peters would think if he could see him in another man's bath, endowed with another man's identity. In all probability— he would just rearrange the bath mat, inquire if there were anything more, and with a very good, sir, pad his fifteen stone noiselessly out of the room, closing the door softly behind him. That was the best of Peters. Nothing seemed capable of diverting him from his natural orbit. When he had been told that in future Darrell Hildreth was to be known as James Smith, his very good, sir, was as perfect in its inflection as if he had been instructed to get a taxi. With a face as expressionless as the entrance of a tunnel, Peters had heard the news. Smith thought he detected a slight starting forward of the prominent bloodshot eyes, which in the army had contributed to the nickname of the Whiskered Prawn, but he could not be absolutely certain. How different he was from Willis! How would they get on together? Within an hour everything had been arranged. Peters had declined both the notice and the month's salary. He had placed himself upon board wages, packed two bags for his master, and announced his intention of setting out upon a motorcycling tour. The future he had brushed aside with the unconcern of a confirmed fatalist. All was done with that quiet efficiency that had gained for him in the army three stripes on the sleeve, garnished with a crown above. Smith realized that Peters regarded the breach between himself and his uncle as a merely temporary rift. It was impossible to argue against Peters' convictions. Smith had discovered that years ago. He would say, "'Very good, sir,' and there the matter would end. But the course of events remained unchanged if, in Peters' opinion, a disarrangement were undesirable. Yes, Peters would certainly bully Willis, and Willis would as certainly submit." But, of course, that could not be allowed. Among other things, Peters knew that Smith was in no immediate need of money. His gratuity lay at Cox's bank untouched, and, to Peters' practical mind, money meant power. 
life in the army had but confirmed a belief he had held from childhood. In the languorous comfort of a hot bath, Smith found the difficulties of the situation vanishing. Why should he not accept what the gods offered? The old niche had proved a misfit for the new man. Why not try another? Possibly Alfred Warren's was the very one he was seeking. Did not the hermit crab change its habitation according to the demands of its physical growth? Why should not he, James Smith, apply the same rule to his physical growth? It would at least solve one problem of the future. There would be no puzzling what to do when his stock of money was exhausted, no striving to decide whether to enlist or become a clerk at three pounds a week, no trudging along dusty roads ribboning out interminably before him, hungry and thirsty, dreading the approach of rain that would drench his couch for the coming night. Instead, there was all this comfort and luxury, with money to spend, clothes to wear, and food to eat. If it were ever discovered that he was not the real Alfred, he could easily say that he himself had been the first to point out the mistake. It was an adventure, and life was fearfully tedious. Then there was the girl in the green frock. Why had she left him as she had? It seemed a bit odd. Anyhow, he must see her again several times. Why should he not grasp this splendid opportunity? No one would know. He is not robbing anyone. He— Here, get out of it, he cried aloud, as he turned on the cold water tap. Hot baths cause the downfall of Rome and the ruin of Moorish Spain. A Spartan could be a casuist in a hot bath, he muttered ten minutes later, as he toweled himself vigorously. Still, it's been rather jolly, and it will certainly last the night, he added. When he returned to his dressing-room, he found a goodly plate of sandwiches, flanked by a decanter of whisky and a siphon of soda. "'Great Gulliver be praised,' he muttered. "'The very thing!' And he proceeded to mix himself a drink, and set to work upon the sandwiches with the earnestness of a hungry man. Suddenly his busy jaws ceased working. There had flashed across his mind a question that startled him. "'What sort of a niche was this?' that fate seemed determined he should occupy. In other words, why had Alfred Warren left home? End of chapter 2「Chapter 3 of The Return of Alfred » by Herbert George Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter 3 what the butler told. When Smith opened his eyes the next morning, it was to see Willis padding about the room with stealthy tread as he gathered together the clothes he had thrown off the night before. For some minutes he lay watching through half-closed eyes. The old man shook his head sadly as he noted the torn and dilapidated condition of Smith's discarded clothing. When, however, he picked up the boots, sodden and encrusted with mud, he blinked several times, as if striving to keep back the tears. Having gathered together the various items of Smith's rain-soaked apparel, and placed them on a chair by the door, the butler glanced at the clock, the hands of which pointed to ten minutes past eight. Tiptoeing over to the bed, he stood for a moment gazing down at the apparently sleeping man. "'Mr. Alfred, sir,' he whispered, "'it's ten minutes past eight. So it isn't a dream after all, yawned Smith, as he sat up and proceeded to stretch luxuriously. A dream, Mr. Alfred? repeated Willis. Yes, that I'm here. I thought it was a dream, you know. And he laughed a little self-consciously. Willis smiled sympathetically. It's almost too good to be true, Mr. Alfred, he said. I'm sorry to wake you, sir. I've put everything ready, he indicated the clothes. "'Feeling better?' inquired Smith, mentally registering the opinion that black suited the old man's complexion better than royal blue. "'Thank you, Mr. Alfred. I'm all right again now. It was the shock, sir. Would you like me to remain, Mr. Alfred?' "'Yes, I want to talk to you,' said Smith, springing out of bed. "'But I'll have a bath and shave first. Ah! as his eyes fell upon the tea-tray by the bedside. "'It's cold, Mr. Alfred.' I'll get some more, and, picking up the tray, Willis left the room. 
When he returned, Smith had finished his bath and was halfway through shaving. For the next quarter of an hour he devoted himself to his toilet, assisted by Willis. Some difficulty arose as to what clothes he was to wear. Willis had made the selection from Alfred Warren's wardrobe, whereas Smith insisted upon the contents of his own suitcase being drawn upon. With a sigh of obvious regret, Willis returned Alfred Warren's clothes to drawers and wardrobe, whilst Smith completed his toilet. "'Now I feel equal to meeting even dragons,' he cried, as he buckled on his wrist-watch, with him always the last act in his preparations for the day. Willis smiled benevolently. He appeared to have reached that stage of happiness where words seem unnecessary. "'By the way, how long ago is it that I am supposed to have disappeared?' Smith inquired. Seven and a quarter years, Mr. Alfred,' was the reply. "'You went away on March 10th. "'And yet all those clothes are new,' he nodded in the direction of the wardrobe. "'Her ladyship looks after your wardrobe herself, sir. "'Every year she sends orders to your tailor for new clothes. "'She always looked after the flowers, too, until she went away, "'and put fresh cigarettes here, "'so that when you came back you would be able to—' The old man broke off, his voice failing him. Smith picked up a cigarette, and, for some minutes, smoked in silence. He was wondering what sort of a son Alfred had been to inspire such devotion. "'Now, Willis,' he said presently, "'I want to have a little chat with you. Sit down over there and be comfortable.' "'But breakfast, Mr. Alfred,' he queried. "'Breakfast can wait,' was the reply. As Smith glanced at the clock, Willis walked swiftly over to the dressing-table, opened a drawer, and, a moment later, returned with a gold cigarette case. "'I quite forgot, Mr. Alfred,' he said apologetically. Smith took the cigarette case and proceeded to examine it. On the side was engraved the monogram T.W.A. or A.T.W. "'Sit down, there's a good fellow,' said Smith, as Willis still hesitated on the brink of a chair whilst he himself dropped into an armchair by the window, first returning the cigarette case to the dressing-table. Willis complied, seating himself on the extreme edge of a chair opposite. "'Have you ever read Alice in Wonderland?' asked Smith. "'No, sir,' replied Willis, apology in his tone. "'I never was much of a one for reading, except the newspapers.' "'That's a pity,' murmured Smith, as if to his cigarette. "'I'm sorry.' "'Mr. Alfred,' he began hesitatingly. "'So am I, Willis. It would have helped. However,' he continued, puffing contentedly, "'what I want you to do is to tell me something about Mr. Alfred.' "'Yes, Mr. Alfred. Tell me all about him.' "'You are Mr. Alfred Warren, sir, only son of Lady Warren and the late Sir Joseph Warren.' "'Good Lord!' cried Smith. Not a baronet. Visions of further and even more embarrassing complications presented themselves. No, Mr. Alfred, Sir Joseph was knighted for his charities. Smith sighed his relief. Good. Burke's landed gentry will tell the rest. Now we shall get on better. Had this Mr. Alfred any marked peculiarities? inquired Smith. Are there any points you can give me? Did he take red or white wine? English or continental cheese, dry ginger ale or champagne. In short, tell me any little details that you think may be helpful. For a moment Willis hesitated. He was obviously embarrassed. Come, out with it, man. Whatever may have been laid against Mr. Alfred does not affect me. He was beginning to find the situation amusing. He had no doubt that eventually his alleged mother would set matters straight. In Anno Domini, 1921, it did not require a Solomon to decide little affairs like this. In the meantime, he was determined to enjoy to the full a novel experience. Later he would apologize for his likeness to Alfred and go his way. "'You... you generally drank whisky, sir, with...' he hesitated. "'With?' repeated Smith, helpfully. "'Were there any other pussyfoot characteristics?' "'Sometimes.' "'With a little soda, but mostly neat, Mr. Alfred.' The words seemed to come almost apologetically. Smith gave a little whistle. "'So that was it,' he muttered under his breath. 
then aloud, "'Well, I'm afraid I can't line up to that standard now. I prefer soda with a very little whisky." As he made this statement, there flashed into the old man's eyes a look which, if it were not relief, was something closely akin to it. "'Any other marked peculiarities?' continued Smith. "'You smoked cigarettes, and cigars, mostly, Mr. Alfred. You didn't take coffee for breakfast.' "'And whisky for tea,' suggested Smith. "'Tea and coffee didn't agree with you, sir,' said Willis loyally. "'Was Mr. Alfred a pleasant sort?' inquired Smith, watching Willis's face intently. He saw the old man wince slightly. Was he popular? Did his contemporaries serenade him at night, or burn him in effigy by day? "'You, um, a pleasant sort,' he hesitated. "'Was I what you could call, well, on good terms with people?' asked Smith helpfully. "'Oh, yes, Mr. Alfred,' replied Willis, and then, as if it were forced from him in spite of himself, he added, "'Of course, everybody has enemies, sir.' Smith regarded the end of his cigarette thoughtfully. "'And friends as well, I take it.' He looked up. Again there was in the old man's expression the same look of embarrassment he had noticed before. "'Yes, Mr. Alfred. You—you you had friends?' he stammered. "'What sort of friends?' questioned Smith. "'Well, you—' began Willis. Then he paused, gazing helplessly at Smith. "'Well?' "'You—you you were always rather democratic, Mr. Alfred.' "'You used to say so, sir.' "'I see,' said Smith, half to himself. "'When Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman?' he quoted. "'Yes, sir. You often used to say that,' replied Willis, with obvious relief. "'That juice I did,' muttered Smith. "'Had Mr. Alfred many women friends?' was his next question. This time the expression in Willis's eyes was that of fear— he looked away from Smith, then back again, then down at the carpet. He cleared his throat and made an effort to speak, but without result. Seeing his obvious distress, Smith refrained from pressing the question. After all, it was no affair of his to probe into the depths of Alfred Warren's murky past. "'Drink, low company, and women,' he mused, as he pressed down the lighted end of a cigarette upon the ashtray on the small table beside him. So that was why Alfred left home. It wouldn't be surprising if the man who doubled his own part with that of Alfred found that he'd come into rather an awkward inheritance. "'Now, Willis, your attention,' he said, as he selected another cigarette. "'I want you, as a man of the world, to give me your opinion on something of importance.' Willis became all attention. "'If you were strolling along Piccadilly, say, and someone came up and hailed you as the king of montenegro for instance and insisted in it bringing forward other people to prove that you were his montenegrin majesty what exactly would you do i should tell them mr alfred that i was not the king of montenegro he replied gravely but if they insisted that you were how would you get out of it continued smith suppose they brought the queen of montenegro the prime minister the commander-in-chief the Lord High Admiral, and the whole blessed lot, to swear that you were the King of Montenegro. What then? For some minutes Willis pondered deeply over the question. I should tell them that I was George Willis, Lady Warren's butler, he said at length. There are hundreds of people who can prove it, he added. Ah, well, said Smith, after a pause. I don't suppose anyone will ever mistake you for the King of Montenegro, Willis. Besides, Kings are out of date in these Bolshevist days. During the next quarter of an hour, Smith gained much information about the menage at the Grange. He learned that Marjorie Stannard, the girl he had seen at the window, was almost a daughter to Lady Warren. Marjorie, it appeared, was the daughter of Miles Stannard, a recluse who lived some thirty miles away. After his wife's death at the birth of Eric Stannard, his fourteen years old son, he had retired to his library and his historical studies leaving the upbringing of Eric to an old nurse and Marjorie, then seven. 
Smith gathered that Marjorie spent much of her time at the Grange, where she had her own bedroom. Her horse Nero, a present from Lady Warren, had a sumptuous loose-box in the Grange stables, there being no accommodation for him at her home. He also learned that Lady Warren was a semi-invalid, and that she depended more and more upon Marjorie. Although Willis did not actually say so, it was clear to Smith that Lady Warren's state of health was largely due to the shock she had experienced at the sudden disappearance of her only son. She had never been strong, and this sorrow seemed to have prostrated her, leaving her heart permanently affected. A famous London physician had insisted upon a sea voyage as absolutely necessary. "'Now about breakfast,' Smith cried finally. "'Your Norfolk air has made me hungry.' "'Will you take it here, Mr. Alfred?' "'No, I'll be down in five minutes. I suppose I shall be able to see Miss Stannard and explain.' "'Miss Marjorie always breakfasts early, Mr. Alfred, but I'll tell her.' And he turned and walked across the room. As the door closed behind him, Smith threw himself back in his chair. "'The good fellow has put his finger on the weak spot in my armour. he murmured. "'I can no more prove that I am not the egregious Alfred by the means he suggests, that I can bring evidence to show that I am the grand Khan of Tartary. I was wrong, he murmured as he rose. Alice in Wonderland was nothing to it. I wish, however, that his name had not been Alfred. I think I could have borne almost anything but that, with all respect to the royal amateur baker. I wonder if my intimates will call me Alf. Halfway across the room he was arrested by a slight tapping at the door. "'Come in,' he cried, pausing. "'Oh, Mr. Alfred!' It was Mrs. Higgs, tightly encased in a black gown, with a cameo locket suspended over her ample bosom by a heavy gold chain. "'Oh, Mr. Alfred! Mr. Alfred!' she cried. "'To think that I should live to see this day!' "'It is rather jolly,' he said, glancing out at the blue and green of it all. "'You're—you're you're not angry, Mr. Alfred?' There was such appeal in the eyes, and such a childish tremor in her voice, that Smith laughed. "'Angry?' he cried. "'What about?' "'With me for coming, Mr. Alfred.' Her tone was that of a child, fully expecting to be scolded. "'I ought to have asked if I might.' "'Why, you dear sweet creature, I'm only too delighted,' he cried heartily. "'But, as I said last night, I don't in the least know who you are. I—' "'Don't know who I am!' The statement seemed to startle and revive her. "'Don't know Higgy, as you used to call me when you were a little toddler in blue pinnies. Don't know Martha Higgs!' Smith shook his head with a smile of deprecation. "'I'm awfully sorry,' he said. "'But handicapped as I am, I can't say I do. Still, I'm very glad to make good the omission now,' he added. "'But I nursed you!' she cried. He smiled down at her, and she, too, broke into a smile, showing a set of beautifully even, white teeth that owed nothing to the dentist. "'You see,' he continued, "'there has been an awful mistake. It's a most extraordinary case of mistaken identity.' "'Mistaken identity!' she cried. "'Mistaken identity! No, Mr. Alfred,' she continued with decision. "'You might deceive a mother, but you can't deceive a nurse.' "'I should have known you anywhere as my Mr. Alfred,' she added with conviction. "'The deuce you would,' he muttered under his breath. "'Didn't Mr. Willis recognize you at once?' she inquired. "'He most certainly did,' he responded. "'That's the peculiarly embarrassing part of it. Everybody seems to recognize me. I'm afraid the epidemic may continue.' "'Then doesn't that convince you?' she inquired. He shook his head. "'It might,' he said dubiously, "'if I didn't happen to know I'm someone else.' "'You poor lamb,' murmured Mrs. Higgs, "'to think of what you must have suffered, "'and us not able to do anything. "'Now you've lost your memory. "'But we'll make up for everything now, Mr. Alfred, "'and you'll never leave us again, sir, will you?' "'There was such earnest entreaty in her voice "'that Smith felt like a fellow about to rob a widow of her all. "'If—' he began, then stopped. It seemed so utterly futile to endeavour to convince these good people that he was not the missing heir. The more he protested, the more convinced they seemed to become. "'You won't, Mr. Alfred, 
will you? she pleaded. Now, if you want to be very nice, he said persuasively, you will let me go and get breakfast. I want that more than anything else on earth. I'm as hungry as a buffalo. You poor dear, cried Mrs. Higgs, as she turned towards the door. And to think of all the times I've put your bib on and fed— Well, this is one of the times that you're not going to put my bib on and feed me. I'm quite a clean eater, he added with a smile as he walked along the corridor, his hand upon her shoulder. Suddenly she seized his hand, carried it swiftly to her lips, then, dropping it hastily, turned and trotted down a side corridor. There was something confoundedly affectionate about the domestic atmosphere of the place, he decided, as he passed downstairs, prepared for the worst, but hoping that it would be Marjorie. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of the Return of Alfred by Herbert George Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter Four. The Vicar Decides to Act. One. Alfred Warren's back. The Vicar paused in the act of unfolding his napkin across his knee and gazed across at his sister over the top of his gold-rimmed spectacles. Where did you hear it, my dear? He inquired mildly as his eyes wandered to the French windows opening out onto the lawn, where the sun spread a golden carpet of light. "'I have often wondered,' he continued irrelevantly, "'why we do not breakfast out of doors?' "'Because it's better to take eggs and bacon hot, and marmalade without wasps,' replied Miss Lipscombe grimly. "'True,' said the vicar. "'I had forgotten that. "'Thank you, Hannah.' he added, as he took from her the cup of coffee she handed him. For fully a minute there was silence as the vicar stirred his coffee, awaiting the arrival of Janet with the bacon and eggs. "'The instinct towards sun-worship is easy of understanding,' he murmured, as he continued to gaze out of the French windows, where an impatient robin was hopping about, awaiting the breakfast of bacon-rind and crumbs that Miss Lipscombe never failed to supply." The passing of the night with all its dangers, he continued dreamily, the return of the life-giving sun. I said that Alfred Warren had returned, remarked Miss Lipscombe. Then, a moment later, she added a warning. Shh! The vicar's wandering thoughts returned to the breakfast table, and he gazed with short-sighted eyes across at his sister, as if puzzled to account for her sudden admonition to silence. The sight of Janet, however, with a dish of bacon and eggs, explained matters. "'He arrived last night,' continued Miss Lipscombe, as the girl closed the door behind her. "'Tom Bassingthwaite told Janet this morning, when he brought the letters.' "'Ah,' said the vicar, as he reached for the plate Miss Lipscombe handed to him. "'What do you think will happen if he meets Bob Thurkettle? demanded Miss Lipscombe. "'An excellent fellow.' Thurkettle, he murmured as, with great deliberation, he kept the rind from the rasher of bacon on his plate. "'A murderous ruffian,' retorted Miss Lipscombe. "'My dear,' expostulated the vicar, in a tone of gentle surprise. "'You haven't answered my question,' persisted Miss Lipscombe, who was accustomed to her brother's absent-mindedness. "'What will happen if they meet? Thurkettle might return any day.' "'What will happen?' repeated the vicar vaguely. "'What should happen, Hannah?' Miss Lipscombe looked across at her brother with tightly closed lips, and something in her large grey eyes that was half amusement, half rebuke. Her pose was to be uncompromising, grim, material. At first glance she gave this impression, with her smoothly brushed grey hair parted in the middle and carried to the back, where it was done up into a neat knob, her lined, almost colourless face, her steady gazing grey eyes, and the nose that spelled character. "'Have you forgotten why Alfred Warren left Little Bilstead?' she inquired. For a moment the vicar gazed at her, as if foraging somewhere at the back of his mind for an explanation. Suddenly he laid down his knife and fork upon the plate, and there crept into his eyes a look of concern. "'Bless my soul, Hannah!' he exclaimed. 
I'm afraid I had. How like you, John? The tone was that of one making an excuse rather than an accusation. I am very forgetful, Hannah, very forgetful, he said humbly. I sometimes feel that I am unworthy of being the shepherd of a flock. I am not sufficiently watchful. Rubbish! Miss Lipscombe's mouth reassumed its line of grimness. You always say that, he continued, but I often feel that I ought to write to the bishop, relinquishing a charge I am no longer worthy to hold. A shepherd should be watchful, he added sorrowfully, and, and I forget, I seem to forget everything. Including the fact that Alfred Warren has returned, she said. Get on with your breakfast, John, and we'll talk about it afterwards. Yes, yes, said the vicar, gazing with unseeing eyes at the robin. I really must give it serious consideration. And once more he took up his knife and fork and proceeded with his meal. It was never wise to discuss parish matters with the vicar during a meal. Either he wandered from the conversation or forgot the play before him, and it was his sister's self-imposed mission to see that his body was properly nourished. If no meals were announced for a week on end, she fully believed that he would not notice the omission. When rebuked for his absent-mindedness, he would acknowledge his lapse with such humility that Miss Lipscombe felt it was she and not her brother who was the guilty party. The meal finished, Miss Lipscombe gathered together the crumbs from the various plates and the bread-dish, cut up the bacon rind into small pieces, and, putting them all in one plate, carried them to the window and threw them on the lawn for the birds. There was a whir of wings, and soon a group of starlings, blackbirds, thrushes, sparrows, together with two pigeons and a robin, was busily engaged upon breakfast. "'Now, John, come and smoke your pipe on the lawn, and try and listen to what I'm going to say,' said Miss Lipscombe, as she picked up her knitting. With an admonition to her brother to mind the birds, she assumed the old faded blue linen sunbonnet she habitually wore out of doors, and passed quietly through the windows so as not to disturb her visitors at their meal. The vicar wandered off to find his pipe, which he invariably lost a dozen times a day. A few minutes later he joined his sister on the lawn. "'You were saying, my dear,' he began tentatively, as he proceeded to fill the generous size bowl from a dingy chamois leather tobacco pouch. "'That Alfred Warren is back.' The vicar made no response. He was busy with the filling of his pipe. "'And Bob Thurkettle may return any day,' she continued, as if determined that the full flavour of the drama should be reached. "'An excellent fellow, Thurkettle,' he murmured, as he proceeded to light his pipe. "'An excellent fellow.' "'A murderous ruffian,' repeated Miss Lipscombe. "'My dear,' he expostulated, "'Thurkettle is one of the steadiest.' "'Do you call it steady, to go about with a gun, threatening the life of a fellow creature?' she demanded. The vicar looked startled. "'I had forgotten that, Hannah,' he said humbly. "'Yes,' he added a moment later. "'That was wrong, very wrong.' "'And what will happen if Alfred Warren meets Bob Thurkettle?' she demanded, pausing in her knitting to look across at her brother. "'What will happen?' he repeated mechanically. Then, as if with sudden inspiration, he looked across at his sister. "'They must shake hands and be friends, Hannah. They must forget their differences.' And the vicar puffed peacefully at his pipe, as if he had solved a difficult problem. Miss Lipscombe dropped her knitting on her lap, and sat gazing fixedly across at her brother. Conscious of her gaze, he fidgeted like a boy discovered in some misdemeanor. "'I'm sorry, Hannah,' he said presently. "'Have I said anything I ought not to?' She smiled, a superior, loving smile. "'Have you ever thought what will happen to you, John, when I go?' she asked. "'When you go, Hannah?' he queried, startled in spite of himself. "'When you go where?' "'When I die,' she said uncompromisingly. "'My dear, you're not feeling unwell,' he leant forward anxiously. "'If so, you must see Crane at once. I will—' In his concern he had half risen from his basket-chair. 
"'Sit down, John.' At the quiet, resolute order, he resumed his seat. "'You are so drenched with the milk of human kindness, John, that you cannot understand that a man who has gone about with a gun, threatening to shoot another man, cannot be expected, when he does meet him, to hold out his hand and say, "'How do you do?' "'True, true,' said the vicar. "'I had not thought of it in that light, Hannah. "'I'm sorry. "'But you're quite sure you're not ill?' "'He added, after a pause. "'Rubbish!' she cried, as she smiled across at him. "'It was the smile of a mother for a child "'that is unable to look after itself. "'You've never understood the Norfolk character, John,' she said. "'The Lipscombs hailed from Devonshire. "'True,' said the vicar. "'A remarkable people. "'But not English, Hannah. "'Not English.' "'Scandinavian in origin,' he continued a moment later. "'People of strong passions, resolute wills.' "'There you've expressed it,' she broke in. "'You need not go beyond that. "'When a man of strong passions threatens the life of another man, "'it is hopeless to expect them to meet and be friends. "'Besides, Bob Thurkettle has every reason in the world to hate young Warren.' "'But it was never proved,' suggested the vicar in the tone of a man desirous of finding extenuating circumstances. "'There are some things too obvious to require proof,' was the grim retort. "'True,' said the vicar, nodding his head slowly. "'I will see Thurkettle when he returns, Hannah. I will reason with him. I will—' "'You'd much better see Alfred Warren and persuade him to go away,' said his sister. "'Persuade him to go away?' repeated the vicar. "'But—' "'My dear, I couldn't. What would Lady Warren say to me when she comes back?' "'What will she say if Thurkettle kills her son?' she demanded. "'Oh, but he mustn't. He mustn't,' he protested. "'We cannot have anything.' "'John,' she said, rising, "'for unadulterated unworldliness recommend me the Reverend John Lipscomb of Little Bilstead.' And with that she walked into the house." leaving the vicar wondering what he had said to cause her to put so sudden a termination to their conversation. For half an hour he sat smoking and thinking. Slowly there was coming back to his mind the memory of that time five years ago when little Bilstead seemed to live in a ferment, when Robert Thurkettle was to be met wandering aimlessly about the countryside, a gun under his arm, his face dark with hate. To none would he vouchsafe a word, until one day the vicar planted himself in his path, and, with Christian tactlessness, besought him to remember that he who had a sin requiring forgiveness had best himself forgive. For a few minutes Thurkettle had listened. Then he had terminated the interview by saying, "'Give over prating, sir. This is a man's job, not a parson's. If I get that mucky slink, I'll blow him to hell, the varmin.' And with that he had passed on leaving the vicar staring after him in astonishment. At the end of half an hour the vicar rose, and, passing indoors, picked up his hat from the hall-table. As he did so, Miss Lipscombe came out of the dining-room. "'I will call and see Alfred Warren,' he said. "'You might call in and see Postle on your way, and warn him to be on the lookout,' she said grimly. John Postle was the village constable. "'True, Hannah,' said the vicar. It will do no harm. With a man like Bob Thurkettle, she said, a policeman is better than Christian charity. Having given vent to this passing shot, Miss Lipscombe went into the kitchen, leaving the vicar to digest it as he walked down the drive and turned his steps towards the village. 2. Whilst the vicar and his sister were discussing the dramatic possibilities of the return of Alfred Warren, Smith was enjoying a meal of which he stood in considerable need. When at length he leaned back in his chair, it was with the air of a man who has at last caught up with his appetite. Breakfast had not passed without incident. It seemed that at every step there was to be some new manifestation of the strange tastes of the absent Alfred. The first thing that had caught Smith's eye on seating himself at the breakfast-table was a large decanter of brandy, flanked by a siphon of soda-water. His next discovery was that, although Willis furnished the solids of a really pucker meal, he seemed entirely to have forgotten the liquids. 
the embarrassment of the butler when his attention was drawn to the fact made it clear that alfred passed tea or coffee at breakfast in favour of brandy and soda it was willis hushed assurance that it was the sixty-five mr alfred that convinced him of the prodigal's devotion to a hare from the dog that had bitten him smith was engaged in reviewing this and other circumstances of the past eleven hours with a philosophic detachment of a man who can meet a good meal with an equally good digestion when willis entered dr crane would like to see you mr alfred if you've finished i've shown him into the library dr crane he repeated who is dr crane and why should he want to see me he is her ladyship's doctor sir explained willis miss marjorie telephoned for him i see does he want to go over me with a stethoscope or is he to assist in my identification by mole mark or dimple i don't know sir was the grave reply perhaps miss marjorie thinks he may have caught cold he added smith had already realized that willis could be safely looked upon to supply the most charitable explanation possible for any one's action you have a kind heart willis he remarked as he rose thank you mr alfred said willis gratefully as he held open the door as smith passed out into the hall no doubt the family doctor had been summoned by marjorie smith decided to advise her as to what action she should take in lady warren's absence it was a little difficult to have to meet an entire stranger who in all probability would insist on proclaiming him the missing heir however he must go through with it now he had eaten the bread and salt of the grange and now he must make some sort of effort to disentangle the family skein which willis and mrs higgs seemed to have got into a thoroughly disordered state in all probability dr crane will be whiskered and pompous refer to his parents as we and insist on going over him with a magnifying glass after all the stepping into another man's shoes was not quite so easy as it had seemed the evening before when the butler threw open the library door smith saw with relief that the doctor was clean-shaven and human with a lean lithe poise of body suggestive of a man who took exercise and plenty of it in his greeting and handshake smith saw the doctor rather than the man then there was a perceptible pause. Evidently, Dr. Crane was finding it a little difficult to begin. "'You arrived last evening,' he said, by way of an opening. "'Last night, to be meticulously accurate,' replied Smith. He, too, was weighing up his man. "'I climbed the gates of the Grange.' "'Miss Stannard telephoned asking me to call,' said Dr. Crane. You see, she is in rather an awkward position, with Lady Warren away. The position is even more awkward than it appears at first sight, said Smith pleasantly, and they proceeded to explain exactly how matters stood. It was something of a relief to him to find that there was someone in Little Bilstead who did not recognize him at sight. His satisfaction, however, was modified to some extent by Dr. Crane's explanation that he had acquired his present practice only some four years previously then you won't be able to establish my identity by the shape of my fingernails he inquired i'm afraid not was the grave reply it was clear to smith that he had yet to convince the medico that he was not alfred warren there was a pause dr crane glanced from time to time across at smith as if weighing the pros and cons of the case it's obvious that you do not accept my story smith said at length Dr. Crane gazed at him steadily for nearly a minute. "'I would not say that,' he said at length. "'I understand from Miss Stannard that you have lost your memory.' "'That's merely Willis' idea to account for my not proclaiming myself the returned prodigal,' explained Smith. Dr. Crane nodded. "'There is Lady Warren to consider,' he said. "'Somebody is sure to write and tell her, and then—' he paused. "'If I disappear, it will complicate matters,' suggested Smith. "'Exactly. "'And if I stay, I shall probably get into the very juice of a mess all round.' "'In all probability, you will,' was the dry retort. "'And what would you advise?' inquired Smith. There was another long pause. Dr. Crane was obviously a man who thought before he spoke. "'It is a matter on which I cannot advise.' he said at length. 
is it possible for two men to be so much alike as to deceive even their most intimate friends and relatives it is rare but i should say it is possible was the doctor's reply in such matters we can judge only from what we know has taken place there was the adolf back case for instance where every mark on the body of both men was known and recorded yet twice adolf beck was convicted of crimes that are known now to have been committed by his double a man named smith by the way then i saw it stated in the papers some time back that a woman had applied to a magistrate saying that she was doubtful if it really were her husband who had returned from the war and with whom she had been living for three months dr crane nodded again there was the case of a man also a smith who murdered women in baths he continued one woman identified him as her husband yet months later her real husband turned up and she recanted in the high courts i remember said dr crane with the inevitable nod but why not establish your own identity he suggested turning to smith a gaze of keen professional appraisement that is just what i am not prepared to do at the moment was the quiet reply it puts you in a false position it does agreed smith it might even involve you in certain difficulties suggested dr crane it has already said smith with a smile as he recalled the episode of the night before and i have every reason to assume there are more to come he added why the interrogation came like the snap of a pistol trigger because i have been here long enough to get a general idea that alfred warren led a fairly hectic life once more dr crane's head moved up and down like that of a mandarin i want you to tell me frankly what you advise said smith couldn't you cable to lady warren the doctor shook his head the shock would be too great he said it might kill her and your advice do you ask it professionally or as man to man as man to man i advise you to clear out came the prompt reply and i shouldn't lose any time about it if i were you he added smith was startled by the decisiveness of the tone in which the advice was given it was obvious from the doctor's manner that the position was a serious one perhaps after all it would be the best thing to get away from what might involve him in serious difficulties why he demanded the other shrugged his shoulders with the air of a man who has said all he intends to say smith walked over to the french windows and gazed out upon the lawn where a starling was strutting about as if trying to impress upon everybody that he had not overslept suddenly smith heard marjorie's voice asking willis something about a bowl of roses decision came to him with a flash of inspiration i'll be damned if i do he said turning to dr crane that is inevitable in any case was the grim retort end of chapter four Chapter Five of *The Return of Alfred* by Herbert George Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter Five. Little Bilstead receives a shock. Matters were becoming interesting, and there was certainly the promise of drama later. Smith decided as he walked down the drive of the Grange a few minutes after Doctor Crane had taken his departure. Why had the medico been so uncommunicative? why had he not been frank with him and given some idea of what it was he was up against only once had the man triumphed over the general practitioner when he had referred to the inevitable damnation of alfred why did he know too much or was what he did know so bad that he was fearful of becoming mixed up in a scandal in any case no man could desire a situation more promising in exciting possibilities as he passed through the iron gates smith glanced up to see if any portion of his raincoat still clung to them as evidence of his unconventional entry but someone had evidently collected the clues following willis instructions he turned to the left in the direction of the village conscious of a curious feeling of expectancy after the departure of dr crane and left to his own resources smith had decided upon a visit of exploration with the object of giving the villagers a chance of passing judgment upon his likeness to alfred warren 
He had heard of men completely forgetting their own identity, or who had deliberately traded upon the likeness they bore to others. Never, however, had he heard of anyone being plunged into such a position as that in which he now found himself. There was Adolf Beck, as he had remarked to Dr. Crane, but that proved nothing beyond the fact that one man could be so like another as to have his identity sworn away by a score of witnesses, including prison warders, in whose charge he had been for months at a time. The dramatic possibilities of the situation were endless. Clearly there was some mystery about the original Alfred, an unsavoury mystery, he decided, judging from the embarrassment of Willis and Mrs. Higgs, and the curious attitude of Dr. Crane. If Alfred Warren had done anything which rendered him amenable to the law, then the possibilities might become something more than merely dramatic. What if he were secretly married? He shuddered at the thought. Through no merit of his own he had acquired a new mother, now mercifully some two or three thousand miles away. But a hitherto unknown wife! He wondered how it would feel to be claimed as a long-lost husband. One thing was clear. He could not continue at the Grange. He could swear an affidavit that he was not Alfred Warren, it was true. But a judge might not unreasonably inquire why he had continued to occupy an obviously false and invidious position. He could not appeal to the courts to restrain people from identifying him as Alfred Warren. The obvious thing was to make a bold of it. But, somehow or other, that was the last thing he desired to do. It was all very ridiculous, he decided, as, plucking a long blade of grass, he hoisted himself upon a gate giving access to a meadow, and proceeded to clean his pipe with the leisurely deliberation of an inveterate smoker. After all, the situation might develop quite naturally and pleasantly, although at the moment he had to admit the portents were not favourable. He was roused from his thoughts and the enjoyment of his pipe by the sound of approaching footsteps. Coming towards him, from the direction of Little Bilstead, were two quaint little figures engaged apparently in an animated discussion. They looked as if they might have stepped straight out of a Jane Austen novel. They appeared to be discussing some topic of absorbing interest, upon which they were not in entire agreement. When within a few yards of the gate on which he sat, the one nearer to him glanced in his direction. She started, paused, then stopped dead. The other, following the direction of her companion's gaze, paused in turn, then, seizing the arm of the first, hurried her along. As she who had first seen Smith passed, she bowed slightly, with a nervous, apprehensive side-glance at her companion. Smith lifted his cap, and, a minute later, they passed out of sight round the bend in the road. He watched them disappear from view. Obviously, the one who had bowed was getting it in the neck. For some minutes he sat speculating as to the identity of the two quaint little ladies. Who could they be? Why had one hesitatingly acknowledged him, whilst the other ignored him altogether? Were they involved in some family feud with the Warrens, or was their attitude typical of what he might expect from little Bilstead society? In any case, he told himself as he slid from the gate, the true humour of the situation would develop later. He had been walking for about five minutes, enjoying the warmth of the sunshine, when, a few yards ahead of him, there turned out from a heavily rutted lane a man in labourous corduroys, carrying a pick and a spade over his shoulder. At the sight of Smith his jaw dropped, and he stared to the full extent of his eyes. "'Well, I'll be grimed,' he stuttered at length, swinging the pick and spade from his shoulder and resting them on the roadway. "'If it aren't Mr. Alfred!' and he broke into an evil ripple of mirthless chuckles. "'Mr. Alfred!' he repeated. "'Well, I'll be grimed!' Incredibly dirty, bent, and misshapen, he seemed the embodiment of evil as he stood, his slobbering lips set in a sinister leer, his shifty little eyes fixed on Smith, who had involuntarily come to a standstill. "'You have got a nerve, mister,' he said at length, gazing up at Smith. "'You have got a nerve,' he repeated, as if finding satisfaction in the words. "'You think so?' remarked Smith easily, as he looked down at the sinister figure before him. The man's stoop threw his head forward, and, as he gazed up at Smith, he looked strangely like a toad. "'I do,' was the response, 
uttered with an air of conviction. "'But there, you always was a rum'un.' And there was a grudging admiration in the man's tone. "'So you think I am Mr. Warren?' inquired Smith calmly. "'Think?' repeated the man. "'I have no need to think. You wait till old Bob Zerkettle gets back, and then you'll cop it a rum'un. He's going to give you cosh. Used to go about with a gun for months, he did, and here you be a-coming back. Well, you have got a nerve.' "'And who is Bob Thurkettle?' asked Smith, sensing revelations from the man's dark hints. "'Who's Bob Thurkettle?' Again he broke into a slobber of chuckles. "'I fair to think you'll know all about who Bob Thurkettle is when he comes back. He ain't forgot what you done to his mother.' "'Mother?' repeated Smith in a puzzled tone. "'What is a mother?' Ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, ho, cackled the man. What's a mouther? So you come back, Mr. Alfred, and don't know the meaning of good Norfolk. You wait till old Bob gets back. He'll kill you, Mr. Alfred, sure as you're there, he added with satisfied conviction. And when will he be back? asked Smith. Ho, ho, ho. A cunning glint sprang into the man's eyes. I be not going to tell you, or you'll just hike off. I know you. That's what you did a fool, he added, as he swung his pike and spade once more upon his right shoulder. Fare you well, Mr. Alfred. And then, as if a sudden thought had struck him, he added, I suppose you don't know who I be. I haven't the foggiest idea. Don't know Tom Simmons, don't you? I suppose you've forgotten about the whiskey. And he leered up at Smith from under his head brim. I suppose I must, as I have no recollection either of you or of the whisky. Well, I'll be grimed, exclaimed Simmons. If that ain't a good un. Well, I must be getting along, Mr. Alfred, he said, with a tinge of respect in his voice. Fare you well, but you wait till old Bob gets you. And he shuffled off, murmuring, Who's old Bob's mother? Well, if that ain't a good un. Smith continued on his way, his opinion of Alfred's unpopularity confirmed. He reached the village without further incident, apart from the fact that two labourers had saluted and stared at him as if he were an apparition, but he took that merely to indicate the courtesies of the countryside. Little Bilstead consisted of a spatter of houses and shops lying in a slight fold of the ground on either side of the main road. It seemed a disappointing place, neither populous nor picturesque. There were two or three people to be seen, but the general atmosphere was one of intense somnolence. He walked through the village, past the post office and general store, and an insignificant little inn called The Pigeons, from the door of which came the smell of rank tobacco smoke and stale beer, tainting the sweetness of the morning air. Several people seemed to appear from nowhere, and stood staring at him, just as the evil old man had stared a few minutes previously. As no one saluted or made any move to accost him, he walked leisurely on. Continuing along the main road, he strove to evolve something like a definite cause of action from the tangle of his thoughts. Wisdom told him that the best thing to do was to leave Alfred Warren a little bilstead, the one to his destiny, the other to its dullness. There was something else, however, that bade him see the thing through. He had all the time there was, as the Americans say. Why not stay on for a few days and see what drama really had in her pouch? At the end of an hour he turned and retraced his steps. As he neared Little Bilstead again, he found himself more than ever reluctant to abandon what promised to afford an interesting, not to say exciting, adventure. As he entered the village for the second time, it was obvious that unseen eyes had been on the watch. The whole place seemed suddenly to have come to life. Groups of women stood at their doors, and there was a generous sprinkling of men. As Smith approached, they seemed all to be smitten with a great silence. Some saluted him as Mr. Alfred, but there was no cordiality in either their looks or their words. At the door of the pigeons stood a big man with a bald head, surrounded by a fringe of sandy hair, a heavily jowled face with small pig-like eyes destitute of lashes. "'Morning, Mr. Alfred!' he called out when Smith was within a pace or two of him. Smith nodded and paused. 
"'Surprising seeing you back,' said the man. For a moment Smith hesitated as to whether or no he should enlighten the fellow as to his real identity. But he decided that it would be useless to do so, for wherever he went he was accepted as Mr. Alfred without question. "'Seen Bob Thurkettle?' inquired the man, with a sly look in his little eyes. "'Bob Thurkettle?' repeated Smith. "'No. Who's he? I saw a queer old fellow on the hill, but he said his name was Tom Simmons.' The man took his clay pipe from his mouth and stared at Smith in frank amazement. "'Oh, give over, Mr. Alfred,' he cried. "'There aren't nothing to joke about, that's a sure moral.' There was something in the man's manner that prompted Smith to pass on with a curt nod. Things were becoming quite interesting, he decided, as he walked slowly in the direction of the Grange. "'What about Bob Thurkettle's mother?' The suddenness of the cry from behind caused him to start perceptibly, otherwise he took no notice, and the cry was not repeated. The attitude of the villagers made it clear that, whatever Alfred Warren's popularity with the servants at the Grange, there was obviously some very good reason why he had left Little Bilstead, and an even better one for his not returning. Everything seemed to turn upon old Bob's mother, whatever that might mean. Possibly Willis would be able to enlighten him. He did not attach serious importance to the statement that Bob Thurkettle, whoever he might be, really threatened his life. Still, an encounter between them would inevitably result in awkwardness, if not in an open breach of the peace. What puzzled him most was that in his own household Alfred Warren had apparently been idolized, but outside his immediate circle he appeared to be extremely unpopular. When clear of the village, he suddenly became aware that a short distance ahead of him was a tall, bent form garbed in clerical black. With hands clasped behind him, head bent forward, and a large green umbrella thrust under his left arm, he gave the impression of one whose thoughts were far away. Smith increased his pace slightly, making as much noise as he could in order to attract the old man's attention. He drew level and, for nearly a minute, walked abreast but the vicar's thoughts were far away from Little Bilstead. "'Good morning, sir,' he said at length. The effect upon the vicar was that of a dum-dum bullet. It stopped him, but with a suddenness for which Smith was entirely unprepared. "'Why, it's—it's—' The old man stopped, as if searching the records of his memory for Smith's identity. "'My name is Smith, sir, James Smith, but I'm supposed to be rather like—' "'Bless my soul!' broke in the vicar. "'It's Alfred Warren!' And, dropping his green umbrella into the road, he clasped Smith's hand with both his own and shook it warmly. "'Hannah said you were back,' he said, still working Smith's hand up and down. "'In fact, I came out to look for you. I've just remembered.' And he gazed at Smith with near-sighted blue eyes, as if expecting a rebuke. "'I knew there was something,' he added, as by way of extenuation. "'I'm very forgetful,' he continued. "'Terribly forgetful. I would write to the bishop, but Hannah says no.' "'But I'm not really Alfred Warren. You see, Hannah will be delighted. She will want to see you. She... He paused, as if something had just occurred to him, casting doubt upon the greatness of Hannah's joy. "'You remember Hannah,' continued the vicar. "'A wonderful manager. They call her the curate in the village.' "'Hannah?' repeated Smith. "'I'm afraid—' "'My sister,' explained the vicar. "'We were talking about you at breakfast. That is why I came out to warn you about—' He paused, in his eyes the puzzled expression of the man who has forgotten. "'I was saying, sir, that I am not Alfred Warren. My name is Smith, James Smith. We must be very much alike.' Smith was conscious how stilted his words sounded. As a diversion, he stooped and picked up the vicar's umbrella, which seemed to bring back to the old man a realization of his mission. Dropping Smith's hand, he took the proffered umbrella and thrust it beneath his left arm. "'And now you must come and see Hannah,' he said. 
she will explain what it was I came to tell you. She will be delighted to see you. Judging by the expression on the faces of the two old ladies he had met that morning, Smith felt doubtful as to the accuracy of the prophecy. "'I'm afraid I have to go.' He paused, but the vicar proved himself a man of action. Transferring the umbrella to his right arm, he linked his left through Smith's, and, a moment later, was striding along, once more apparently lost in thought. Smith had perforce to keep pace with him. He could not tear himself away from the old man's friendly grasp, and there seemed nothing for it but to acquiesce in the vicar's determination to take him to Hannah. At the end of five minutes the vicar suddenly swung round, and, before Smith knew what was happening, he had entered a gateway and was walking up a drive, obviously leading to the vicarage. A minute later they passed through the French windows into the drawing-room, where the vicar left him, with a murmured excuse that he would go and find Hannah. It was a bright and cheerful room, and, with a sigh of content, Smith dropped into a comfortable-looking chair. He was feeling pleasantly tired with his walk, and after the warm sun without, the coolness of the vicarage drawing-room was peculiarly soothing. Somewhere in the distance a door banged, and then the heavy silence of a summer midday descended upon the room, broken only by the loud ticking of the ormolu clock upon the marble mantelpiece. Five minutes lengthened into ten, ten minutes into a quarter of an hour, a quarter of an hour into half an hour, and still no vicar. Obviously the absent-minded cleric had forgotten about him, and in all probability was deep in the composition of Sunday's sermon. Still, it was very restful, and time was to him of no object. Suddenly he sat upright and blinked several times at a tall spare woman with calm grey eyes and a firm mouth who stood gazing down at him. A moment later he had scrambled to his feet. As he did so, he caught sight of the dial of the armory clock. Its hands chronicled that just an hour had elapsed since he had entered the room. I, "'I'm afraid I was asleep,' he apologized. "'Did Janet show you in here?' asked the owner of the grey eyes. "'No, the vicar.' smiled Smith, realizing that he had indeed forgotten. "'My brother is very forgetful. I must apologize," she said, as she extended her hand. "'Have you been here long? We heard you were back.' "'An hour,' said Smith, taking the long, tapering hand in his. "'And I am not Alfred Warren,' he added. With a motion of her head she bade him resume his chair, seating herself upon a high-backed chair opposite. For some seconds she sat eyeing him steadily. "'Not Alfred Warren,' she said at length, and Smith realized from her tone that another had gone over, bag and baggage, to the enemy. "'I am in a most unhappy position,' he continued, wishing he could remember the vicar's name. Willis had mentioned it. "'Everyone here insists that I am Alfred Warren, and it's a little embarrassing,' he concluded lamely. For fully a minute, Miss Lipscombe sat regarding him with a keen, steady gaze, as if intent upon seeing right into his soul. "'My brother recognized you?' she queried at length. "'In a flash,' he replied gloomily. "'Everybody does. That's what makes it all so embarrassing. May I tell you the whole story?' he added. There was something about her that inspired confidence. She nodded. Miss Lipscombe was notorious for her economy in words upon certain occasions. In the village it exercised an excellent effect, for, with every wrong thought that entered a little Bilsteadian brain, there was a vision of the grey eyes and steady gaze of the vicar's sister. In as few words as possible Smith told of the happenings of the last twelve hours, omitting all mention of the reference to Bob Thurkettle's murder. He must first find out what a murder actually was. At the end of his recital Miss Lipscombe was still gazing straight into his eyes. "'And now,' he added with a smile, "'if you go over to the Warrenites, I shall feel that I am in a hopeless position.' "'But why not prove who you are?' she asked. "'Because there are reasons why I can tell you only that I am plain James Smith,' he replied gravely. "'That is not my real name,' he added hastily. "'I think I ought to tell you that.' but it will serve for the time being. "'The likeness is remarkable,' she remarked, still fixing him with her keen grey eyes. "'But surely,' he began, and then paused. 
it seemed mean to call attention to the weaknesses of Alfred Warren's character by inquiring if it were not stamped upon his features. "'There are no differences that could not be accounted for by six years of changed—' She paused, as if searching for the correct word. "'Environment?' he suggested, relieved that she should have read his thoughts aright. She nodded. "'That is what has puzzled me,' he said, feeling that her remark had established a bond between them. She was obviously a clear thinker and a sound reasoner. Six years change a man,' she remarked musingly. "'You look stronger and harder, both mentally and physically. You served during the war?' "'Every hour of it,' he said simply. "'Physical discipline begets moral and mental discipline,' she remarked, still as if to herself rather than to him. Again, Smith saw the straw at which he was clutching, about to be swept beyond his reach. "'You'd better come and stay at the vicarage.' At this startling announcement he sat bolt upright. "'Stay at the vicarage?' he repeated. "'Why?' "'You cannot very well continue at the Grange whilst disclaiming your identity.' "'The identity of Alfred Warren,' he corrected her gently. "'It amounts to the same thing,' she replied grimly. You'd better arrange with Willis to send your things over, she added practically. And now I must go and see about my brother's luncheon. And she rose. So you won't believe in me as James Smith, he said as he rose. I preserve an open mind, was the response, as they stood facing one another, each trying to read beyond the reserve barrier of cultured people. I give you my word that I am not Alfred Warren, he said quietly. "'We dine at half-past seven, was the reply. But the firm line of her mouth broke, and Smith realized that she had indeed an open mind. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of The Return of Alfred by Herbert George Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter Six, The Strangeness of Marjorie. One. On his return to the Grange, Smith immediately went in search of Willis, finally running him to earth in Alfred's bedroom. As he entered, the old man turned, a trousers stretcher in his hand. "I've been looking for you everywhere, Willis. I I'm sorry, Mister Alfred, if I wasn't. Oh, it's all right," said Smith, sinking into a chair striking a match and proceeding to light a cigarette. "'What do the little Bilsteadians mean by Bob Thurkettle's mother?' With a crash the trouser stretcher fell to the floor. At the sight of Willis' face Smith sprang to his feet and went over to him. In a flash the butler seemed to have become ten years older. He was trembling violently, the colour had gone from his face, and in his eyes there was fear. He appeared on the point of collapse and Smith led him over to the chair which he himself had just vacated. Fetching a glass of water, he held it to Willis' grey lips. "'I'm awfully sorry,' he said soothingly, as the butler swallowed a little of the water, gazing with wide-open eyes at Smith as he did so. "'I didn't mean to upset you.' Willis lay back in the chair with closed eyes, as if desirous of shutting out something. Smith forced him to drink some whisky and water, and presently the colour began to come back to his grey cheeks. Smith studiously avoided any further reference to the cause of the butler's collapse, and when he eventually left the room it was with strict injunctions to Willis to remain where he was until quite recovered. He had a feeling that his presence acted only as a reminder of the shock the old man had suffered. The return of the modern prodigal was not without its attendant excitements, was Smith's thought, as he descended the stairs. He must at all costs find out the meaning of the word mother, a term that appeared to be full of sinister menace, judging from the evil leer with which the old roadmender had uttered it, the fact that it had been shouted after him in the village, and the distress shown by Willis on hearing it repeated. Refilling and lighting his pipe, he made his way round to the stables, where he hoped to encounter some one from whom he could obtain the information he sought. He heard sounds issuing from the harness-room, first a hissing, dear to the heart of the horse-keeper, 
followed by a few shrilly whistled bars of an air he did not recognize. These suddenly developed into a song in a high but not a melodious tenor. Walking across the yard, Smith looked in at the open door. As he did so, the song broke off, and the hissing was resumed. "'Morning, Mr. Alfred.' A spare, sandy youth paused in the task of polishing a set of harness. "'Good morning,' said Smith. "'Busy?' "'Things get that mucky in no time,' said the youth. "'Horse has been a mort of work,' he added, as he returned to the polishing of the metalwork. "'What's your name?' inquired Smith. "'Nut, Mr. Alfred,' he replied. "'Dick Nut. Father keeps the pigeons.' That was the worst of village communities, was Smith's mental comment. Everybody was either somebody's father or somebody else's son. He hesitated a moment before putting his fateful question. In all probability, Dick Nudd would spread the story of his interrogation throughout the village. What if he did? It would only go to prove that Smith was entirely ignorant of anything and everything concerned with the Thurkettle affair. "'Can you tell me what the more there is, Nudd?' he asked striving to make the question sound casual. It was a relief that Nut did not collapse. Instead, he looked up from his polishing, a sheepish grin on his freckled face. Obviously, the question was not so distressing to him as to poor Willis. Possibly it was due to the difference between youth and age. "'A mother, Miss Alfred,' repeated Dick Nudd, his grin broadening. "'Fancy you asking a question like that. I don't have the truck with him myself.' he added, as if by way of exculpation. There was nothing disrespectful in his tone. The inquiry appeared to him obviously in the light of a joke. Yet it was equally obvious that, in his opinion, Alfred Warren had no need to put such a question. "'Well?' inquired Smith quietly, but in a tone that made it clear he required an answer. "'What does it mean?' "'A mother, Mr. Alfred?' he repeated, scratching his head through a black-and-white check cap of sporting design and cut. "'A mother is a girl, Miss Alfred, a woman.' In a flash the truth dawned upon Smith. Bob Thurkettle's mother was his daughter, perhaps his wife. And his jaw set squarely. "'A man doesn't go looking for another with a gun because of something done to his womenfolk unless that something be serious. Everything was now clear to him.' Tom Simmons' salacious slobberings, Nut Pear's contemptuous remark, Willis' distress, and young Nut's clearly expressed surprise that Alfred Warren should require enlightenment as to the meaning of the word mother. "'I'm afraid I've been underestimating the dramatic possibilities of the situation,' he murmured, as, with a nod to Nut, he turned and walked slowly towards the house. 2. "'I wish I could convince you that I am not Alfred Warren,' remarked Smith, half an hour later, as he unfolded a napkin and spread it across his knees. Marjorie gazed at him with grave politeness, an almost imperceptible frown puckering her eyebrows. "'You see,' he continued, "'it's just a dream. I am no more Alfred Warren than I am the missing link. It's all very awkward, though,' he added. He had already decided that, in a blouse and skirt, she looked as attractive as she had the night before in green. "'Willis tells me you have lost your memory.' Willis beamed on him as, with soft tread, he moved about the room. "'Willis is a part of the dream,' said Smith. "'In fact, he is not a little responsible for all the trouble.' He watched Willis pour hock into Marjorie's glass, his interest centred in the decanter he carried in his left hand. As he approached, Smith made a motion of refusal of the decanter. Willis seemed surprised, and looked irresolute. "'Perhaps you would prefer champagne, Mr. Alfred. There are some of the nineteen hundred that was kept back,' he murmured. "'This,' making a movement with his left hand, "'is the sixty-five brandy.' "'I never drink it.' Smith glanced up at him with a smile. Marjorie looked from one to the other, her expression for the first time manifesting interest. Recovering himself, Willis replaced the decanter upon the sideboard. Smith realized that he was making things difficult for the real Alfred, should he ever return. For some minutes the meal proceeded in silence, Marjorie's brow slightly puckered, as if there was something about it all that puzzled her. 
"'The weak point in my position,' said Smith presently, "'is that I cannot prove who I am, "'although I can say definitely that I am not Alfred Warren. "'In the village this morning,' he continued, "'smiling in spite of himself at the look of anxiety on Willis's face, "'everybody seemed to know me, and I knew nobody. "'It will lead to all sorts of complications,' he added. "'Again there was silence.' Several times during the meal, Smith was conscious that he was being gravely scrutinized by Marjorie. Immediately she caught his eye, however, her own were lowered, to remain fixed upon her plate. She was certainly a difficult girl to talk to. During these periods of silence he had ample opportunity of looking at her and confirming his first impression. Her well-modelled head was crowned with a dense mass of auburn hair that seemed to hold somewhere in its depths the sunlight of June. He noted the little tendrils framing her face. They seemed to laugh at their own cleverness in escaping restraint. Her eyes were a deep violet, and there were little cuts at the corners of her mouth suggestive of the fact that humour lurked there. Yes, she was beautiful. Her attitude was correct, whilst entirely lacking in cordiality. There was in her manner almost stiffness. Her eyes were capable of sparkling with mischief, he told himself, her short upper lip, the impudent cuts at the side of her mouth, and the nose that was just the tiniest bit retroussé, all conspired to render her piquant and provocative. Yet her demeanour was that of a vicar's wife towards the village reprobate. She could have been little more than a child, he argued, when Alfred had disappeared. She was certainly not more than twenty-one now. He waited until Willis had finally withdrawn. He was determined to try and solve the mystery of Marjorie's dislike. "'I wish you would try and dislike me for myself alone,' he said suddenly. She looked up quickly. For the fraction of a second the little cuts at the corners of her mouth quivered, but it was only a momentary lapse. She gazed at him, her head a fraction on one side, her eyebrows slightly lifted. "'At the present moment,' he continued, "'you are disliking me because you think I am Alfred Warren.' You might at least give me the chance of earning your dislike by sheer merit. Then she laughed, a short gurgling sound, which died away almost immediately. Smith thought he had never seen a girl's face so transformed. As she had been beautiful, she now became fascinating, irresistible. Someone has given Alfred Warren a bad name, and you are going to hang me for it, he continued, as she made no comment. "'Is there not something between friendship and—and and the other thing?' she queried. It was obvious that, whatever Alfred had done, he had sinned beyond forgiveness. It must be something very grave indeed to place him beyond the pale of her forgiveness. He had already gathered sufficient to convince him that Alfred's private life had been full of hectic episode and florid incident. This, in all probability, was responsible for Marjorie's uncompromising attitude of disapproval. He knew enough of women to appreciate that it would be hopeless to endeavour to modify the bad impression. She was too young and unsophisticated for philosophy or the development of social charity. Inwardly, he cursed Alfred Warren and all his ways. To inherit a man's relatives and friends was sufficiently embarrassing, but to be saddled with his past was intolerable. "'Of course, I cannot stay on here,' he said presently. "'Why?' She looked up quickly, a startled expression in her eyes, as if he had said something quite unexpected. "'I am in an utterly false position.' "'But—' She stopped short, her fingers playing nervously with a piece of Chinese jade suspended from her neck by a black silk ribbon. She seemed embarrassed, as if she wished to say something she found it difficult to express.' "'It's horribly awkward,' he said with a smile that did not reflect the mood of his mind. She gazed at him gravely. In her eyes there was a question, of that he was convinced. "'I shall be leaving this afternoon,' he said. "'This afternoon?' There was alarm, consternation in her voice. Smith was thrilled. Could it be that she really wished him to stay? "'Yes, if I can evade Willis and dodge Mrs. Higgs.' "'I—I—' I, she paused. "'Lady Warren would—' In a flash he saw her perplexity. There was Lady Warren to be reckoned with. 
If we were allowed to go, what would she say? How would it affect her? You are great friends? Yes. Her eyes still gazed across into his. And you are wondering whether or no you ought to instruct Willis to lock me up in the wine cellar until she returns. Immediately he had uttered the words, he regretted them. The reference to the wine cellar had been as unfortunate as it had been unintentional. He could have kicked himself as he saw her stiffen. "'I am afraid someone will write to her,' she said coldly. "'The shock might kill her.' "'Miss Lipscomb has asked me to stay at the vicarage,' he said, feeling it unfair to keep Marjorie on the rack of doubt. A look of relief in her eyes gave him no pleasurable thrill. On the contrary, he then and there made up his mind to leave the vicarage next day. The situation was an impossible one, he decided. Marjorie rose, and, a few seconds later, Smith closed the door behind her. Crossing over to the window, he stood looking out into the blue and gold of the summer day. "'Anyway, thank heaven her nose doesn't crinkle when she laughs,' he murmured. "'Sir?' queried Willis, who had entered unheard. "'Nothing, Willis,' said Smith turning from the window. I was merely removing my fly from somebody else's ointment. And the butler registered a mental note that it was just like Mr. Alfred. 3. Phew! Smith drew a long breath of the tired air, heavily scented with mothball. At his own suggestion he had penetrated to Mrs. Hicks' Holy of Holies, her private sitting-room, and already he was regretting it. The solitary window was tightly shut and sealed along the ledge, where the upper and lower sashes met, by a faded red sandbag looking like an unhealthy sausage. "'You sit down, sir, and I'll send Mrs. Higgs,' Willis had said, as he closed the door of the housekeeper's little sitting-room. "'Sit down? To do so seemed a desecration. As well think of sitting down upon the high altar of St. Peter's at Rome. Never could he remember to have seen a small room that contained so many objects.' The owner's main idea, apparently, had been to cover up every inch of exposed surface of floor, mantelpiece, or wall. It was bewildering. Antimacassars, little woolwork mats, and china plugs, plush photograph frames, letter weights, and boxes encrusted with seashells, mugs and large shells, cups and saucers from every watering place in Great Britain. On a small table was a stuffed canary, at which the moth had got in spite of its glass cage. A small spaniel, also stuffed, looked up from the hearth-rug, with hard and glassy eyes. The whole was composed of a multitude of mats, and what their owner affectionately called knick-knacks. This was obviously Mrs. Higgs' treasure-house. Remove or break one single item, and she would know it instantly, and mourn over it as over the hundredth sheep. The room was something of an autobiography, Smith decided, its treasures having been hoarded from year to year. He examined the photographs that adorned the walls, or stood on mantelpiece or table, moving about gingerly, lest he should upset something. The object of his visit was the hope that he might find a portrait of the absentee Alfred, but he could find nothing even remotely resembling himself. He was in the act of mentally registering a vow never to go to Cromer, inspired by the sight of a large pink, white, and gold mug which proclaimed to the world in garish lettering that it was a present from that place, when the door opened to the accompaniment of a persistent rustle and the sound of heavy breathing. He turned to find Mrs. Higgs, purple with excitement, and respirating like a small gas engine, standing beaming at him. Willis was just behind her, closing the door. "'This is kind of you, Mr. Alfred,' she said, "'and to think that I should not be here when you came.' "'I've run every step of the way from the second floor,' she panted. "'It was so good of Mr. Willis to fetch me. Do sit down, sir, please.' Smith looked about him in despair. Eventually he selected a chair which seemed less ornamental than its fellows, although Mrs. Higgs's eyes had been fixed on a papier-mâché construction inlaid with mother-of-pearl and adorned with a royal blue cushion, a white antimacassar being tied with orange ribbon to its back. "'Oh, Mr. Willis, please sit you down.' she flustered. At the sight of the old woman's obvious happiness, Smith was conscious of a slight contraction at the back of his throat. "'Now, don't you think we might have a cup of tea, Mrs. Higgs?' suggested Smith. "'Oh, Mr. Alfred!' she cried. "'How good of you! I'll go and see—' "'No, not a bit of it,' said Smith. "'Ring the bell. 
will be waited on like gentlefolk. She beamed on him and rang the bell. Mr. Alfred would like to take tea with Mr. Willis and me here, Salter, she said to the parlour maid in a tone that was almost apologetic. And, and Salter, she added, as the girl was about to leave the room, she whispered something he did not catch. Oh, Mr. Alfred, this is good of you, she cried. Isn't it, Mr. Willis? She turned to Willis for corroboration. It is indeed, Mrs. Higgs, said Willis, his face reflecting the happiness stamped on that of the housekeeper, but in a lower key. We are all so happy today, said Mrs. Higgs. Why, all the morning I've hardly known whether I stood on my head or my heels. The thought of the portly Mrs. Higgs standing on anything but her feet amused Smith. Poor Mrs. Death has been crying all the morning. Mrs. Death is the cook, explained Willis, seeing the look of surprise on Smith's face. She has visions. But why should she cry? asked Smith. You see, sir, said Mrs. Higgs, it reminded her of when she lost Mr. Death. Smith was puzzled why the return of an alleged prodigal should remind a woman of the loss of, in all probability, a good husband. But he refrained from comment. Probably the visions explained it. For fully a minute there was an awkward and constrained silence. Mrs. Higgs radiated happiness. Willis looked uncomfortable. Smith longed for the courage to break a pane of glass. He was sure the window would not open. "'I suppose you're convinced that I am Mr. Alfred, Mrs. Higgs,' he said at length. "'Oh, sir!' she cried, and began to chuckle in a way that set her triple chins throbbing with sympathetic enjoyment, whilst her cameo locket danced up and down upon her generous person. "'And,' continued Smith, "'Willis is prepared to swear it upon a whole mountain of Bibles, aren't you, Willis?' "'Yes, sir,' said Willis, gravely. "'Now,' continued Smith, "'don't interrupt me until I've finished. "'I am no more Mr. Alfred than I am the Shah of Persia or Jack Johnson. "'My name is Smith, James Smith, "'and you've got me into rather a hole "'by persisting in saying that I am Mr. Alfred Warren.' Mrs. Higgs exchanged glances with Willis. In that look Smith recognized the utter futility of endeavoring to convince either of them that he was not Alfred Warren. "'You've been ill, you poor lamb,' said Mrs. Higgs. "'It's your memory, sir,' echoed Willis. "'You—' He stopped suddenly as Salter entered with the tea-tray. At the sight of it Smith groaned aloud. There, in the centre, dominating the tea-things, stood the inevitable siphon of soda-water and decanter of whisky. The girl looked about her inquiringly. Mrs. Higgs bustled over to the round table in the middle of the room, the corner of which she managed to clear off its albums and photo-frames. There the girl placed the tray. Smith fixed his eyes upon the decanter. "'Surely, Mrs. Higgs, you don't prefer whisky and soda to tea?' Uh, "'Oh, no, sir,' she stammered. "'Then it must be you, Willis.' "'Me, sir?' cried Willis, starting up. "'Oh, no, sir. I like a cup of tea above—' "'Then it must be your mistake, Salter,' said Smith, with a smile. The girl looked at Mrs. Higgs, and then, at a nod from her, picked up the siphon and decanter, and left the room. Mrs. Higgs disguised her embarrassment by becoming engrossed in the pouring out of the tea, whilst Willis fixed his eyes upon the moth-eaten stuffed canary that looked so pitifully devoid of life. As Smith looked at Mrs. Higgs, he was certain that her chins vibrated with something that was akin to song. She looked for all the world as she were purring. Willis still sat as if uncertain of the stability of the chair, but he reflected on his own genial features the happiness that was Mrs. Higgs. "'It's obviously no use endeavouring to convince you two good people that I am not Mr. Alfred,' said Smith, as he took the cup that Mrs. Higgs handed him and, with a motion of his head, declined the bread and butter and scones that Willis proffered. They both smiled at him, as if in entire agreement with his words. So, continued Smith, you might tell me something about my alleged self. Your alleged self, sir, repeated Mrs. Higgs. Yes, tell me something about Mr. Alfred. Mrs. Higgs looked across at Willis, anxiety and apprehension in her eyes. Willis looked uncomfortable. 
"'Yes, sir, certainly,' said Mrs. Higgs, and to gain time proceeded to cool her tea by blowing upon it, holding the cup and saucer with a prim awkwardness that was evidently intended for refinement. Smith waited, smilingly patient. Having reduced the tea to a satisfactory temperature, Mrs. Higgs sipped it three or four times, then replaced the cup and saucer upon the tray. "'You... you were a beautiful baby, Mr. Alfred,' she began hesitatingly. Willis nodded his head approvingly. "'I remember saying many a time as I used to—' "'Tell me more about Mr. Alfred when he wasn't a baby,' Smith suggested. "'Just before he went away, for instance.' Again he noted the look of apprehension that passed between the two old servants. "'There isn't much to tell, sir,' she said. "'Only—only—' only... she paused. "'Only what?' asked Smith. "'Only that one day you disappeared, and—and—' Again she hesitated. He noticed that tears were gathering in her eyes. Presently one tipped over the brim and slid down the side of her nose. She proceeded to ferret about among her lower draperies in search of a handkerchief. When at last it was retrieved, there were two wet lines running down her face, one on either side of her nose. "'But why did he leave home?' "'Ah, sir,' she sniffed with dolorous significance, "'you may well ask.' "'Well?' queried Smith. "'It was terrible, sir, terrible, wasn't it, Mr. Willis? And her poor ladyship!' Willis inclined his head with melancholy decision. "'Terrible,' he repeated. "'Yes, but you are not helping me in the least,' protested Smith. "'There must have been some reason.' "'There were a lot of wicked people, Mr. Alfred,' said Mrs. Higgs huskily. "'There usually are,' he smiled. "'And they were jealous of you,' she continued. "'Yes, but I wasn't supposed to be kidnapped, was I?' "'No, sir.' You went away. You were always very sensitive, and—and—' and It was obvious that Mrs. Higgs was on the point of breaking down. He thought it kinder to give a turn to the conversation. "'Do you know what I was looking for when you came in?' he asked. "'Looking for?' she repeated. "'No, sir.' "'I was looking for a photograph of Mr. Alfred, and I couldn't find one.' "'Lord of mercy me!' she cried pulling herself into an upright position by means of the table. Trotting over to the corner of the room, she opened a drawer in a table and took out an album. From the keys at her side she selected one, unlocked the clasp, and handed it to Smith. "'We put them away because of our ladyship,' she explained. With something nearly approaching excitement, he opened the album and found himself gazing at a baby, seated upon a high stool, with a deplorable insufficiency of clothing. From the right-hand side of the photograph a hand was to be seen, stretched forth to save the child from its own obstreperousness. It was a faded print of a bygone day, and Smith had to confess to himself that he could see no very marked likeness between this indelicately exposed infant and himself. He turned to the other end of the album, where suddenly he found himself gazing at what seemed to be his own photograph, taken some six or seven years previously. When it recovered from the first sensation of shock, he could see slight differences. The chin was rounded and sensual, the eyelids drooped, and the face, although by no means a bad one, was obviously that of a man lacking in will-power. Conscious that the eyes of the others were fixed upon him, he passed on from photograph to photograph. Alfred appeared to have been photographed at every conceivable age and, in his earlier days, in every conceivable absence of clothing. It was positively indelicate, he told himself, thus to parade parental indiscretions to a full-grown man. As the photographs showed the passage from childhood into boyhood, and from boyhood to young manhood, he found the likeness to himself more pronounced, until the last photographs of all might easily have been taken for portraits of himself. No wonder these people all insisted upon identifying him as the missing Alfred. In face and figure they were obviously very similar almost uncannily alike, in fact. But, and this is what struck him most, it seemed almost incredible that, however similar facially they might be, they should possess personalities that might be mistaken one for the other. Alfred was obviously of a weak character, easily influenced, 
but there must have been something peculiarly attractive in his personality to earn for him such affection as was shown by the servants. Was it due to loyalty, or to real liking for the missing Alfred? From what he had heard of Alfred's habits and associates, there was little to suggest a lovable character. Yet, on the other hand, there was the obvious devotion of Willis and Mrs. Higgs, to say nothing of the somewhat dubious testimony of the tearful Mrs. Death. As he continued to gaze at the photographs, he wondered if his actions, his personality, and his bearing were similar to those of the missing heir. Yet had not Mrs. Higgs on several occasions drawn a parallel between them by returning to Willis and exclaiming, "'Isn't that just like Mr. Alfred?' Suddenly he looked up from the book. "'I want you each to tell me in what I am most like Mr. Alfred,' he said. For fully a minute there was silence. "'It's your smile, sir,' said Mrs. Higgs. "'I should have known you anywhere by that.' "'And you, Willis?' queried Smith. "'I think, sir, the way you half-close your eyes when you seem to be resting, when you're smoking, that is. Then he had got that droop of the eyelids he had noticed in Alfred's photographs. It was all very extraordinary. If he went far enough, he would, in all probability, find someone to identify his every movement. Suddenly he had an inspiration. "'Did Mr. Alfred like games? Cricket, football, and that sort of thing?' he asked Willis but it was Mrs. Higgs who replied. "'No, sir, you were always very gentle. You played cricket against Upper Saxton, sir, and you sometimes played tennis.' "'Was I any good?' inquired Smith. "'At cricket, I mean,' he added. "'You were generally unlucky, sir,' said the loyal Willis. "'And... and... but even his resources were not equal to the occasion.' "'I suppose there was some marked physical peculiarity about Mr. Alfred,' said Smith, hopeful of finding a stray straw at which to clutch. "'A blemish, an Achilles heel,' he had almost said, a cloven hoof. "'Sir,' queried Mrs. Higgs, not quite following the classical trend of his thoughts, "'had he a scar, for instance, or a mole?' "'Ah, Mr. Alfred!' she cried her puzzled frown dissipating into smiles. "'You were such a beautiful baby!' Upon the subject of infants, he decided, Mrs. Higgs was almost offensively ecstatic. "'Her ladyship used to say you were without blemish, and you were, sir. Everybody said so.' "'And didn't I ever break a leg or an arm?' he persisted. "'Or even a rib?' "'Never, sir,' said Mrs. Higgs with an air of finality that seemed to prick his bubble of hope. It was obvious, he decided, that Alfred Warren had concentrated upon the commandments. "'Well, thank you very much for giving me tea,' said Smith, and he looked down smilingly at Mrs. Higgs. With a sudden gulp, he added, "'I envy you this delightful little room.' Then, with the brand of Ananias on his lips, he passed out of the housekeeper's room. "'It'll have to be cricket, then,' he muttered, as he walked along the corridor. "'A sentry might do it.'" End of chapter 6《Chapter 7 of The Return of Alfred by Herbert George Jenkins This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon Chapter Seven, Little Bilstead sits in judgment. I'm so nervous, Jane," fluttered Miss Mary Jell. "Don't be absurd, Mary," retorted Miss Jell. "You ought to show more self-control." "But suppose he were to call," whispered Miss Mary, her eyes round as those of a frightened child. "I should faint. I know I should," she added with conviction. "I was so frightened this morning." Miss Jell drew in her lips, but made no remark. The two sisters were seated in their drawing-room, awaiting the callers that the third Thursday in the month always brought them. Miss Jell had assumed her usual position opposite the door, whilst her sister had taken a chair near the window. Her natural inclination to watch the callers as they approached, having been rigorously curbed by her more decorous sister, Miss Mary had compromised by sitting as near to the window as she dare 
and in such a position as enabled her, when her sister was not looking, to obtain an occasional glimpse of the roadway that ribboned down towards the village. The Mrs. Jell were both small, both grey, and both of unknown age. But whereas Miss Jell was reserved and austere, as befits an elder sister, Miss Mary was sometimes spontaneous and always gentle. They were gentlewomen, and they looked it. They had lived in Little Bilstead all their lives, and were invited to the Grange, a distinction they shared with the vicar, his sister, Colonel Enderby, the doctor, and Mrs. Trespert Green. Somewhere in the dim recesses of the past, a magazine, long since defunct, had accepted a story by Miss Jell. From then onwards she was, by common consent, looked upon as literary, and upon all such matters she was regarded as an authority, and deference paid to her opinion. Never having reached such height, Miss Mary had perforce to accept a more lowly position, not only in the household, but in the social world of Little Bilstead. The Cedars, where the Mrs. Jell had lived all their lives, was a small house with a garden back and front. An estate agent would have described it as standing in its own grounds. As a matter of fact, there was at least a yard and a half of ground either side between the hedge and the house, but nowhere was there to be seen anything dimly resembling a cedar. Not even the oldest inhabitant could remember such a tree rearing its browns and blacks anywhere near the house. How the place had come to be called the Cedars, no one knew, and no one seemed to care. The social event of the month in Little Bilstead was the Miss Jell's third Thursdays. About half-past three in the afternoon, Little Bilstead, that is to say, such portion of Little Bilstead as had been socially born, would be seen making its way towards the Cedars, which stood on the rise of the hill at the easternmost end of the village. Colonel Enderby would bring out his tall white felt hat with a black band, winter or summer it made no difference, stab into his tie a horseshoe pin, composed of brilliants, which had been presented to him by an Indian rajah, button on his white spats, and, with gloves and cane clasped jauntily in his left hand, would set forth to pay his respects, as he expressed it, to the Mrs. Jell. Mrs. Spellman would don a new headgear of her own construction, and her passing the window of Rose Cottage would be a signal for Miss Marshall, who for the last half-hour had stood watching behind the curtain to make the plunge. With her would be her father, a retired civil servant, who possessed the soul of an albino and the appetite of a cormorant. During the afternoon, generally when the last callers were preparing to leave, the vicar would sometimes look in. Social little Bilstead lived for the Miss Jell's third Thursdays, they had to discuss and rediscuss all that had happened, and a great deal that had not happened, in the village during the previous month. Others extended hospitality, but it was sporadic. The marshals sometimes indulged in a whist drive. Mrs. Spellman was generally at home by special invitation twice in three months, thus exercising an economy of thirty-three and a third per cent per annum, without it being particularly noticeable. Colonel Enderby gave Little Bachelor teas, whilst the others did their social best for Little Bilstead. Still, the Mrs. Jell could claim pride of place. "'Here's Mrs. Spellman!' cried Miss Mary, forgetting in her excitement that she had obtained the information by illicit means. "'How many times have I told you, Mary, not to—' "'She's had the red-tipped dyed magenta,' broke in Miss Mary, unable to restrain herself within the limits of discretion." "'If you insist on looking out of the window, Mary, I shall have the blinds drawn,' announced Miss Jell, who, with hands folded austerely before her, sat awaiting the first peal at the bell. Miss Mary subsided with a little sigh of regret. To her, the third Thursdays would have been so much more enjoyable had she been allowed to sit at the window and watch the arrival of the first callers. The little sigh with which she received her sister's remark indicated that this little pleasure had been consigned to the limbo of things that are not to be. Two minutes later the little bell tinkled to announce the arrival of Mrs. Spellman. This was followed almost immediately by the eruption into the placid atmosphere of the drawing-room of a little woman in a fawn dust-coat. On her head was what had come to be known in Little Bilstead as Mrs. Spellman's talk. Mrs. Spellman possessed certain millinery materials a wire shape, covered with dingy gauze, which in form was not unlike a martello tower, two tips, 
little tufts of feathers raped from some inconspicuous portion of an ostrich, several pieces of gold-coloured bullion lace, and an infinity of odds and ends of black satin and coloured velvets. One of the tips was black and the other coloured. Each was from time to time re-dipped, the coloured tip, like the foliage of a cedar, gradually darkening in shade with the passage of years. Each month Mrs. Spellman produced something new in the way of millinery. Never had she been known to repeat herself. The final result was always too large, giving to it an appearance of top-heaviness which seemed to threaten with entire extinction her small features. "'Oh, Miss Jell, what do you think of it?' she cried. "'He was in the village only this morning. I meant to go down to the post-office to get a money order for my old nurse. Just as I was leaving the house, Prinnikins knocked over a jug of cream. Milly was so annoyed. I had to stay and comfort her and remove the cream from Prinny's tail. Wasn't it vexing? But for that I should—' "'To whom are you referring, Mrs. Spellman?' inquired Miss Jell, with that touch of coldness in her voice she invariably kept from Mrs. Spellman. As the widow of a tradesman, she had to be kept in her place. "'Oh, haven't you heard?' she continued. "'Alfred Warren has returned. The village is in a state of ferment. I'm sure something terrible will happen. To think that but for dear little Prinny's playfulness I should have seen him this morning. You remember all about the Thurkettle.' "'I don't think we need discuss that,' said Miss Jell, with a glance at her sister, as if she had been in her teens. "'But don't you realize, continued Mrs. Spellman, "'that we shall be flung into a veritable—oh, here's Colonel Enderby,' she cried, as the door was opened by Ellen, the Miss Jell's elderly maid, to admit a tall, spare man with a white, bristling moustache, the eyes of a crawfish, and the jowl of a bloodhound. "'Oh, Colonel Enderby, have you heard?' Mrs. Spellman stopped suddenly. Colonel Enderby had fixed into his right eye the monocle that always dangled from his neck by a piece of broad black ribbon, and froze her as if she had been an untidily clothed recruit. He then turned to Miss Jell and Miss Mary, and proceeded to greet them, with a ceremony suggestive of the days of Thackeray. Finally he turned to Mrs. Spellman and greeted her. "'You know, Colonel, I nearly saw him this morning,' cried Mrs. Spellman. If it hadn't been for Prinnikin's upsetting a jug of cream and then sit—I mean, putting his tail in it, I should have met him in the village." "'Met whom in the village?' demanded Colonel Underby. He disliked widows, especially those of what he called damned daily breaders. "'Mr. Warren, you know he's back, don't you?' "'I heard it this morning,' he cried, his moustache bristling even more fiercely. If I meet him, it will be my pleasant duty to tell him that he's a scoundrel. I've half a mind to—' Colonel Enderby paused and gazed about him with bellicose intensity. Miss Mary looked up at him admiringly, whilst Mrs. Spellman smirked. "'You soldiers are always so terrible,' she said, whereat Colonel Enderby straightened himself. He had been known in the army as Ramrod Enderby. "'I—' he began— when he was interrupted by the reappearance of the flat-footed Ellen. "'Mr. and Miss Marshall,' she announced, in a voice that seemed several times too small for her. It was Ellen's rule never to announce the first two arrivals. Her publicity began with the advent of the third. Miss Jell had striven long and arduously to break her of this habit, but to all her protests Ellen would reply, "'Yes, Miss,' and on the very next occasion proceed to do exactly as she had done for the last thirty years. Whilst the marshals were being made welcome, Colonel Enderby proceeded to blow out his cheeks and glare about him, as if accumulating energy for an outburst against the prodigal. His ideas of conversation were those of a monologue, with himself cast for the speaking part. Whilst his daughter was engaged with the Mrs. Jell, Mr. Marshall was taking stock of the sideboard upon which the refreshments were laid out. He was a gaunt man, with the expression of a rabbit and the veracity of an ostrich. A grateful country had bestowed upon him a pension, totally inadequate to his needs, even had his appetite been normal. As it was, his daughter, Amelia, a near-sighted, sandy-haired young woman, whose bust and lower waist measurements seemed somehow to have become confused, found it difficult, even with the aid of tin foods, to keep expenditure upon bowing terms with income but for the social instincts of little Bilstead she would long since have been forced to give up the struggle. But Mr. Marshall was a good forager, 
and could generally be depended upon to scratch a fairly decent meal at any function to which he was invited. Upon such days Miss Marshall was able to eke out existence with a bread-and-cheese luncheon and a small tin of salmon for dinner. "'I regard it as a scandal,' announced Colonel Enderby, as if he were addressing a squad of defaulters. "'Eh, hey, Marshall?' Uh, uh, "'Certainly,' stammered Mr. Marshall, recalled from an earnest contemplation of a plate of deep-tinted fruit-cake. He had already decided that it should form the foundation of his afternoon meal. "'Such a dreadful example for the villagers,' remarked Mrs. Spellman, casting up her eyes to the ceiling, as if her thoughts were with the rude forefathers. "'It is certainly very unfortunate,' remarked Miss Jell primly. "'Unfortunate, man,' cried Colonel Enderby. "'It's an outrage. When I was a young man, such a thing would have been impossible.' Colonel Enderby was never tired of cataloguing the things that would have been impossible when he was young. "'That terrible Thurkettle affair!' Mrs. Spellman paused at the sight of the frown upon Miss Jell's brows. Miss Mary Jell turned aside and coughed modestly, whilst Miss Marshall blushed. They were interrupted by further callers, and, for the next quarter of an hour, Miss Jell and her sister were kept busy receiving guests and ministering to their needs. As caller after caller arrived, they, in effect, repeated Mrs. Spellman's, "'Oh, Miss Jell, what do you think of it?' and then each proceeded to tell what he or she had heard. Although the prodigal had been back less than twenty-four hours, every one seemed to be possessed of a vast amount of information concerning him. Mr. Williams, a small man with a small voice and a still smaller income, had heard that he had spent the whole of the previous day at the pigeons and had been seen to leave in a state of marked hilarity and with unsteady gait. Mrs. Gainford, who had private means and public meannesses, had been told by her maid that there had been a terrible scene at the Grange, in which the butler had been severely handled by his master, because he refused to give up the key of the wine-cellar. The atmosphere was hot with rumour, and the temperature was further heightened by the increasing excitement. The attendance that afternoon created a record for the Miss Jell's third Thursdays. Even Dr. Crane found time to slip in and out again, saying a few words, nodding his head, and diplomatically avoiding any definite expression of opinion. Dr. Crane's conception of the attitude of the general practitioner was that silence added weight to the few words he spoke. In this he was abetted by the almost bovine placidity of his wife. The excitement seriously interfered with Mr. Marshall's customary meal, and that night Miss Marshall had to reinforce the small tin of salmon with a can of baked beans, She spent a restless night wondering in what direction she could exercise economy to cover the additional expenditure. The entrance of young Eric Stannard, Marjorie Stannard's red-headed and freckled brother, caused a sudden hush to fall upon the company, a tribute alike to the immaturity of his fourteen years and their own curiosity as to whether his sister were coming. Having told Miss Jell that he had arrived by the three-twenty, he proceeded to slay his own social importance by announcing that, "'Margie's sorry she won't be able to come.' He then drifted over to the sideboard, taking up a strong strategical position in the neighbourhood of the plate of fruit-cake. Mr. Marshall watched him anxiously. He had fully intended to get back to it again later. At the moment he was engaged upon anchovy sandwiches, constructed out of margarine and bloater paste of a strength capable of disguising anything. The excitement broke out again at the advent of Mrs. Trespit Green, who, as a second cousin of a baronet, bulked large in the social life of Little Bilstead. "'Oh, Mrs. Trusbert Green!' cried Mrs. Spellman. "'Isn't it dreadful?' In Little Bilstead, no one but Liddy Warren ever dared to omit the Trusbit for Mrs. Green's name. "'I hurt you halfway down the road,' was Mrs. Trusbit Green's uncompromising retort. Rudeness was her poise.' rudeness and an ostentatious deference to the rulings of the almighty to her there was little virtue in being the second cousin of a baronet unless she could snub the relict of a tradesman if you mean about mr warren's return continued mrs trusbit green presently i have heard and what do you think of it asked mrs spellman in her eagerness forgetful of the snub she had just received there was a hush all were anxious to know how the news would strike the second cousin of a baronet. "'Heaven has been very good,' she replied. 
when any social uncertainty assailed her, Mrs. Trusbett Green invariably saddled Providence with the responsibility. "'That's what I say,' broke in young Stannard, his mouth full of jam turnover, in the making of which Miss Mary Jell was an adept. "'Top hole,' he added, as if to leave no doubt as to the soundness of his theology. Mrs. Trusbett Green took the cup of tea from the tray that Ellen held before her. She was a puffy-faced woman, the blueness of whose complexion some ascribed to bismuth and others to brandy. "'You mean,' queried Miss Jell of Mrs. Trusbett Green, as Ellen extended to her a plate containing the last ham sandwich, "'that the fate of our dear friend, Lady Warren, has made her whole,' murmured Mrs. Trusbett Green, taking a nibble at the sandwich. She was what she herself described as a good churchwoman. "'But think of that scandal!' cried Mrs. Spellman. "'The what?' Mrs. Trusbett Green lowered the sandwich from her thin lips and fixed her fish-like eyes upon Mrs. Spellman's toque. "'The... the...' She paused, uncomfortable under the other's scrutiny of her millinery. "'Don't you think it will be very awkward?' she finished lamely. "'If God has so ordained it, so let it be,' was the response. It was not that Mrs. Trusbett Green disliked scandal. She merely objected to its high priestess in Little Bilstead. "'I hear that he denies he is Alfred Warren,' said Mrs. Crane, thickly. "'He says his name is James Smith, and that he has lost his memory,' she added irrelevantly. A sudden silence fell upon the room at this amazing announcement. In her surprise at the effect of her bombshell, Mrs. Crane allowed a piece of viscid pineapple flan to slip from her saucer, and Miss Mary promptly trod on it. For the first time in her self-possessed life, Miss Jell was at a loss, whilst Miss Mary was almost in tears, owing to her ineffectual struggle to remove the slice of pineapple flan from the instep of her right shoe. The tension was relieved by Mr. Marshall giving tongue. At the sight of Eric making for the last jam tart, he had swallowed a half-masticated mouthful of coconut cake, some of which had, like the girl in the play, taken the wrong turning. So far he had stifled his agony, but it would not be controlled, and he now burst out into a violent fit of coughing, which brought tears to his eyes, and his daughter solicitously to his side. Nature had given to Mr. Marshall the instincts of the cormorant, without making the necessary physical adjustments, with the result that he frequently choked. The real diversion, however, was caused by Colonel Enderby, whose face had turned an apoplectic purple. He seemed engaged in an endeavour to emulate the frog and Aesop. "'It's an outrage against decency!' he cried, his moustache bristling like the quills of a porcupine as he glared about him savagely. His explosion seemed to clear the air and loosen tongues, coupled with the fact that Miss Mary had freed her shoe of the clinging pineapple, and that Mr. Marshall had almost recovered, due to the promptness with which his daughter administered all the milk available, upwards of a pint. She was a girl of quick decision, and she knew that milk was rich in proteids. "'He thinks to avoid punishment by denying his identity,' barked the colonel, the young scoundrel. "'In my opinion, he's insane.' "'He thinks to pull wool over our eyes,' cried Mrs. Spellman, whose expressions were sometimes intensely colloquial. Colonel Enderby glared at her. She was stealing his thunder. "'If I were to commit a crime,' he said, still glaring at Mrs. Spellman, "'and go away, returning years later, and saying that I was not Colonel Enderby, but had lost my memory, would you believe me?' A murmur passed round the room. Suddenly all saw the depths of wickedness to which Alfred Warren had sunk. "'But perhaps he really is, Mr. Smith,' ventured Miss Mary, timidly. She had always a thought and a word for the underdog. "'Be quiet, Mary,' said Miss Jell severely. "'You forget that Willis and Mrs. Higgs recognized him as well as ourselves. I knew him at once,' she added, as if to leave no loophole for doubt. This was bombshell number two, their hostess, they always regarded Miss Jell as their hostess, had actually seen and recognized the reprobate. Everybody said something, and each seemed to hurl an excited question at Miss Jell. "'I don't believe it. There are no Dromeos in real life,' announced Mrs. Trespit Green, with decision. She was proud of her knowledge of Shakespeare. 
there was a sudden hush. No one knew what a dromeo actually was, or if it were respectable. "'Would the law exonerate me from responsibility?' demanded Colonel Enderby, determined to recapture the ball of conversation. "'Would it, ma'am?' he demanded of Miss Jell. "'No,' he barked, without waiting for a reply, and that bark caused Mr. Marshall hurriedly to withdraw the hand he had extended towards the last piece of currant cake. Again there was a murmur of approval. Colonel Enderby had once more become the centre of interest, and for the next five minutes he held forth on the iniquity of Alfred Warren in endeavouring to evade responsibility for his past crimes and misdemeanours by announcing that he was not Alfred Warren, and had lost his memory. "'I shall inform the police,' he announced at length. "'I may even write to the Chief Commissioner at Scotland Yard.' Having beaten Mr. Marshall in a dash for the last cheesecake, which he demolished in two bites, Eric Stannard threw himself into the fray. "'Jolly rotten, I call it,' he said to no one in particular. "'Slicing up a fellow in his ab.' "'You are too young to understand, Eric,' said Mrs. Pelman, a comfortable-looking body in puce and myrtle green. "'He's turned over a new leaf,' was the uncompromising retort. "'Prods always do. That's why they're prods.' "'You mustn't talk about things you don't understand, Eric,' said Miss Jell firmly. There came over young Stannard's generously freckled face a look of obstinacy. "'Anyhow, it isn't fair to slice him up when he isn't here, is it, Mrs. Crane?' he asked, turning to the doctor's wife. "'Is it what, Eric?' she queried. Mrs. Crane was, as Mrs. Trespit Green put it, fat and stupid. "'Is it fair to cut out a fellow's giz when he isn't here?' "'Really, Eric,' protested Miss Jell. You ought not to use such expressions. Sorry, Miss Jell, he grinned, but it slipped out. Anyhow, he continued, turning to Mrs. Spellman, I'm going to back him up, and so will father. He's a dab at backing also, Rands. As an historian and a fellow of King's, Miles Stannard was noted for his uncompromising championship of the Monmouths and the Perkin Warbucks of history. Well, I must buzz off, said Eric, extending a dubious hand to Miss Jell. There was nothing now to wait for, and he would still be in time for another tea at the Grange. Two minutes later he was making good progress in the direction of home. The run upon the Miss Jell's refreshments that afternoon had been in excess of the supply, owing to the unprecedented number of callers, and, in consequence, Eric and Mr. Marshall had suffered. For the next two hours social little Bilstead discussed the return of Alfred Warren and what it might mean to them and the neighbourhood. All were agreed that it would be impossible to receive him. Yet there was not one there who did not yearn to meet him. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of The Return of Alfred by Herbert George Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter Eight, Eric Stannard promises support. One. I say, are you the prod? Smith started, nearly overbalancing himself from the top of the gate, where for the last hour or more he had been smoking and meditating upon the photographs he had just seen in Mrs. Higgs' album. Gazing up at him stood a red-headed boy of about fourteen, his freckled features screwed up either in interrogation or because the sun was in his eyes smith could not determine which i say are you the prod he repeated the what queried smith recovering from his surprise the prodigal you know i was afraid some vagrant husk would betray me he smiled as he proceeded to dig in the bowl of his pipe the boy stared then he grinned it must be a rare sport being a prod he remarked, as he proceeded to subject Smith to a thorough and unembarrassed scrutiny. "'Although I suppose it's fairly rotten, hanging about, waiting for the what-you-call-it moment. "'It was, as you say, unspeakably rotten,' Smith assured him gravely. Again the boy regarded him with a puzzled expression. "'I say, I hope I don't seem impert,' he said at length. "'Not at all. If you don't see what you require in the window—' Step inside. You pulling my tip, what? 
"'Nothing was further from my thoughts,' Smith assured him, "'even if I knew just where your tip lurks. "'They've been holding an inquest on you at the jelleries,' the boy volunteered after a pause, during which he seemed to be engaged in a fruitless endeavour to get at Smith's meaning. "'That old ass and, Colonel Enderby, you know, talked pie like a pussyfoot. It gave me a pain in my giz. I stuck up for you, though, and then the temp got a bit low, so I slid it. "'And why?' inquired Smith, as he gazed down at his self-constituted defender. "'Why did you champion the monosyllabic prod?' "'The what?' "'Well, the prod without the qualification,' suggested Smith. "'I say, you're a bit wonky, aren't you?' He regarded Smith with a puzzled expression that relieved his remark of any suggestion of impertinence. "'That was what all the row was about this afternoon with old End.' He said you went away funny in your habits, and came back ditto in your brain. You get me?' "'Generally by playing back,' said Smith with a smile. "'There's an awkward spin about your conversation.' "'I didn't know you played cricket,' he cried, his eyes brightening, and the puzzled frown vanishing from his forehead. "'My name's Stannard,' he added inconsequently. "'You know my sister, Marjorie.' Smith folded up his tobacco pouch and returned it to his pocket. The information that this rather startling youth, with the flaming hair and archipelago of freckles, was Marjorie's brother, seemed to affect the situation. "'I've come to stay with Margie,' he added. "'You'd just gone out when I arrived.' "'The loss was obviously mine,' said Smith gravely. "'I say, you're a bit rummy about the top, aren't you?' "'I'm beginning seriously to suspect it.' was the reply, as he struck a match and proceeded to light his pipe. The boy continued to regard him, his face once more screwed up interrogatingly. "'Bit of a rabbit, aren't you?' he inquired, regarding Smith quizzically. "'We can't all be guns.' "'I say, that's jolly good, you know. I'll tell Margie. She likes things like that. You'll play for us against the Upper Sexton Blighters?' "'Willingly.' "'We shall get licked again.' he said with conviction. We always do get licked. We lack guts, you see, and it's rotten. It must be inconvenient, agreed Smith, almost Promethean. I wonder how you'll get on with Marsh, he continued, regarding Smith with his head slightly on one side, as if the answer were written somewhere upon his person. He got me first ball last year, and he went on to explain that Marsh was the demon bowler of the enemy combination, there was a short silence, during which Smith smoked meditatively, whilst young Stannard continued to eye him with the unembarrassed stare of youth. "'I say,' he said at last, "'if I tell you my other name, you won't rot me.' "'I should scorn to take so unfair an advantage,' Smith assured him. "'Honest Inge?' "'Honest Inge,' smiled Smith. He was getting to like this frank and inconsequent youngster. "'Well,' "'It's Eric,' said the boy, and he stood as if expecting some manifestation of surprise or disapproval. "'Eric,' repeated Smith. "'It seems quite a nice name, economical in syllables. You don't require a Pelman course to remember it.' "'I see you don't know,' he said with a sigh, "'or else you've forgotten. Years ago some old blighter wrote a book called Eric or Little by Little, and everyone calls me Little by Little.' "'I see. It's rotten.' "'And a sheer waste of three syllables,' agreed Smith. "'By the way, you haven't told me why you championed me at the—' He paused. "'The jelleries,' said Eric. "'The Miss Gels, you know. Tame cats, stiff as muslin, and all that silly rot, but quite these.' "'I see,' was the dry retort. "'But why the championing?' "'I don't know.' he cried, shaking his head. "'That's just like me. I suppose I get it from the pater. We're always on the other side.' "'The shady side?' suggested Smith. "'I hate to hear a chap sliced up when—when—oh, you know,' he said, missing the illusion. Smith nodded. "'Of course,' he continued. "'I know you've got into somebody's herself. "'Into somebody's what?' "'Sorry, esophagus.' he grinned. Rotten habit I've gone into. Margie hates it. But I stuck up for you, and now I know you. I don't care. 
If we beat those upper sexton blighters, I shan't care a damn. I observe the distinction, said Smith, knocking his pipe against the heel of his boot. If you knock up a few runs, you know, continued Eric, especially off Marsh, you'll have every fellow in the place on your side. The vicar's a rare old sport. He played for Oxford donkeys years ago. But how about the Miss Gels? The Gels? Oh, they're all right. Frightfully respect and all that sort of tosh. "'But you just keep it up.' "'I most undoubtedly will,' said Smith. "'By the way, what is it I'm supposed to be keeping up?' "'The wang, of course.' "'Excellent, my dear Watson,' murmured Smith. "'Eh?' "'I'm sorry. For the moment I thought I was a great investigator, endeavouring to arrive at your meaning via the wang.' "'I get you,' laughed Eric, displaying a strong but uneven set of teeth set in pale gums. "'The wangle, you know.' Just keep it up. That, I take it, is your considered advice? Eric agreed with a grin. You'll find Margie a regular old water jump, he added confidentially. I plumped right in the mid in the paper chase, he added inconsequently. I thought there was something unusual about her. She's a ripper, but she's a bit... a bit... He hesitated. Anyhow, I'll do what I can to break her perch he added. "'I shall take it as a favour if you will,' said Smith gravely. During the next quarter of an hour, Eric Stannard told Smith much about Little Bilstead and its inhabitants, and not a little about his sister, who, in his phraseology, was absolutely top-hole. "'Now I'm afraid I must slith,' said Smith, when the stream of Eric's information showed signs of drying up. "'What's that?' he queried with puzzled eyes. I gathered that was the local contraction for taking one's departure. "'I say, I'm glad you came,' cried Eric heartily, as he extended a big, grubby hand. "'And that you're going to play. Where do you go in?' "'Mostly in the soup these days,' replied Smith, whereat Stannard developed a veritable Roosevelt smile. A moment later Smith was swinging along the road in the direction of the vicarage, whilst Eric watched him from the middle of the road until he was out of sight and then reluctantly turned and made his way towards the Grange. 2. "'I've seen the prod, Margie.' "'I didn't hear you knock, Eric,' said Marjorie, as she turned from her dressing-table, at the corners of her mouth the faint smile with which she always greeted her brother. "'Rats!' "'Rats agreed, still. "'More rats! I've seen the prod, and he's going to help us whack those Upper Saxon blighters.' "'About that knock I didn't hear, Eric,' she persisted. "'Don't be an ass, Margie,' he cried, as he threw himself full length upon the bed. "'I'm tired.' Marjorie advanced upon him with a hat-pin. Rolling across the bed, he slipped off the other side. Marjorie replaced the hat-pin upon the dressing-table, determining in future to lock her door against the incursions of this young Visigoth. "'I like the prod,' he volunteered. "'What makes you think that Mr. Warren will help us to win?' she inquired, dropping into a chair, and keeping a wary eye on her brother, in case of further manifestations of her bustiousness. "'He said he would. Play, I mean. I believe he can, too,' he added with conviction. "'Did he tell you that he was a good player?' "'Oh, don't talk rot, Margie. Fellows don't say things like that to each other.' "'Then how?' "'It was what he said about what I said to him that made me—' He paused, as if conscious of the crudeness of his construction. "'I see,' she said dryly. A moment later a red head seemed to hurl itself violently towards her, the wicker chair in which she sat was thrown over backwards, and a wild Malay ensued, in which there were occasional glimpses of a pair of shapely silk-stockinged legs, a red head, and a freckled face. Presently the silk-stockinged legs were firmly planted upon the chest belonging to the freckled face. "'Now, Eric!' cried Marjorie, flushed and panting. "'I want to talk to you.' "'Well, get off my stomach, then,' he cried indignantly. "'I am kneeling on your chest.' "'My chest's not down there. It's up here.' "'Our views on anatomy differ, Eric. I'm not going to get up until you promise to remember that I am grown up, and you must not—' She paused, at a loss exactly how to describe the assault. "'All right, Margie. Get off my—' chest she interrupted well chest then you promise 
Honest Inge. Marjorie rose to her feet and, going over to the looking-glass, proceeded to tuck her disordered hair into some semblance of tidiness. Now sit down, she said at length, as she turned from the mirror. I want to talk to you. Eric edged towards the door. There was that about his sister's tone that warned him to be ready for flight. His life seemed to be one long endeavour to avoid people who wanted to talk to him. Such misguided efforts always crystallised into the same things, warning, advice, or condemnation, mostly all three together. Eric, she continued, I don't want you to see much of Mr. Warren while you're staying here. Why? he challenged. She hesitated a moment before replying. Because, well, because I don't. But why? he persisted. He's frightfully dece. "'Eric, dear, please be good and do as I ask,' she pleaded. "'I can't explain, but Mr. Warren has—has has done things that—' "'You don't like, I suppose,' he concluded scornfully. "'That's like a girl. They're always prej. Look at them this afternoon in the jelleries. They sliced him up into frags. Old End was like her head when we lost the footer cup.' Marjorie looked startled. She was uncertain how much Eric understood of what he may have heard at the Cedars. She regarded him speculatively. The situation was fraught with difficulties. "'Very well, Eric,' she said at length, with an air of reluctant decision. "'I shall have to speak to father.' "'He daren't,' he grinned. "'Why daren't I?' she challenged weakly. "'Because I should never speak to you again. And besides,' he added, "'you couldn't sneak.' For a moment she stood regarding him, a faint smile curving her lips. She and Eric had always been great friends. "'Even if you did,' he continued, "'it wouldn't make any diff. Father's as keen on prods as I am on getting into the second eleven next term. He's always on the side of the underdog.' Marjorie knew it, and a soft look came into her eyes. Ever since she was quite a tiny girl, she had mothered the gentle-natured father, who, since the death of his wife, had lived the life of a recluse, happy only when surrounded by his books. "'That's why they booted him off the bench,' continued Eric. Marjorie smiled at the recollection of what had ensued as a result of Miles Stannard being made a justice of the peace. His conviction that crime was a subject for therapeutical treatment had at first bewildered his colleagues. Subsequently it angered them, particularly in cases of poaching. At length they had made it clear that they could not continue to sit on the same bench with a man who held such fantastical ideas upon crime and punishment. "'Won't you do it to please me?' she pleaded. "'Do what?' he demanded. "'See as little as possible of Mr. Warren.' "'He's Lady Warren's son,' parried Eric, an obstinate look in his eyes. "'He's quite respect.' With a sigh, Marjorie picked up a book and dropped into a chair by the window, and Eric, taking it as a sign of dismissal, walked towards the door. "'Wait until he's helped us to whack Upper Saxton,' he threw over his shoulder as he went out. "'Then you'll want to lick his boots.' And with that he was gone. Marjorie dropped the book upon her lap. If Alfred Warren really did bring about the defeat of the rival village, upon which she was as keen as the vicar himself, it would certainly complicate matters. She had always heard that the heir to the Grange hated all forms of sport that did not involve the carrying of a gun— and that he had only played in the cricket match because pressure was brought to bear upon him. As she sat gazing out of the window, her thoughts drifted back to the days when, as a schoolgirl, her entry into the little Bilstead drawing-room had so often been followed by a sudden hush. In time she had come to realise the significance of such episodes. They meant that Alfred Warren was the subject of conversation. The servants, however, had been less discreet, and she had heard many stories of his excesses. Some she failed to understand, others had made her feel afraid. In time the name of Alfred Warren had become associated in her mind with wrong, and she had instinctively avoided him. When by chance he had come into a room where she was with Lady Warren, he would sometimes give her a little nod and smile of recognition. At other times he would ignore her altogether, as if she were a stranger. To him she was obviously nothing more than a child. She recalled how puzzled she had been that Lady Warren, Willis, Mrs. Higgs, and the other servants could make such a fuss of any one who had been so wicked. 
Once she had seen him staggering through the village, singing to himself. It was her first experience of intoxication. She remembered how she had run all the way back to the Grange, where she had locked herself in a her room and refused to go down to dinner. Now Alfred Warren had returned. But try as she might, the old sensations refused to be aroused. Why was it? Why had the old fear of him vanished? Had she become more tolerant? No, it could not be that, for she had on more than one occasion deliberately set to work to recall the things she had heard about him, and they awakened in her now an even greater dislike than when she had first heard them. She understood better. Then Eric liked him, and Eric was a creature of instinct. Could he like a really bad man? Would Nero like him too? She had never known Nero like anyone whom she disliked. Hitherto she had thought that badness always left its mark. Yet she had sat at luncheon with him, and, no, she certainly had not minded. The meal had seemed very short. Could she have sat alone at the same table with him before he... She shuddered. What had changed things? Why was it, then, that his presence no longer seemed to inspire her with dislike? Why did she have to keep reminding herself of what he had done? Why was she... With a swift movement, she picked up the book that lay neglected upon her lap, and, opening it at random, proceeded to read. She would not think of Alfred Warren. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of The Return of Alfred by Herbert George Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter Nine. Miss Lipscomb decides on neutrality. As he dressed for dinner that evening, Smith realized the absurdity of the doctrine of free will. Here was he, as free as subject as ever raised his glass to the toast of the King, God bless him, continuing in a false position deliberately aiding and abetting, well, perhaps not a fraud, but at least a misunderstanding, what would his uncle say? What would his Aunt Charlotte not say? And it was always the things that Mrs. Compton Stacy refrained from saying that constituted her a power in the family councils. Above all, what would Peter's look? And Peter's look had been known to pierce the epidermis of a profiteer, if they could see the heir to the Hildred baronetcy and estates deliberately taking advantage of his likeness to another man. Why was he doing it? Confound the stud! For the next minute his whole attention was occupied in retrieving the collar stud that had disappeared somewhere inside his shirt. Having dug it out, he picked up the thread of his previous preoccupation. Why was he staying on? He could hire a car to take him to Norwich, and so reach Cromer the destination he had planned. No, he preferred to remain on and reap the whirlwind of another man's sowing. Why? Across his mind's eye there flashed the memory of a suddenly illuminated window at which stood a girl in a green frock looking out into the rain-drenched night, apparently at him. With an impatient tug he adjusted his black tie to the correct angle and proceeded to thrust an arm into his waistcoat his thoughts switching on to the scene at the Grange an hour before, when he had announced his impending departure. The wails of Mrs. Higgs, the scarcely restrained tears of Willis, the grin of young Nudd in the background, all had conspired to make his departure almost as dramatic as his arrival. The two old servants had pleaded and protested, Mrs. Higgs in particular, against his going to the vicarage. What would her ladyship do? What would the county think? what would the villagers say, had been the burden of their exhortation. At one period it had seemed that nothing short of physical force would detach the tearful and loudly protesting Mrs. Higgs from his coat-sleeve. But a miracle had happened in the sudden appearance of Marjorie. In a few words, accompanied by a little smile, which both Willis and Mrs. Higgs had taken as a purely personal affair, she had soothed the one and detached the other from his coat-sleeve, and he had been permitted to leave, accompanied by young Nudd carrying his bag. The sound of the dinner gong brought Smith back with a jerk to the present. Hastily slipping into his dinner jacket, he made his way downstairs, to find Miss Lipscomb waiting for him in the hall. "'I thought you might lose yourself in this ramshackle old place,' she explained, as she led the way to the dining-room. 
"'We are six hundred years old,' she added. During the meal that followed, Smith discovered that, conversationally, the vicar scarcely existed. A direct remark would bring him from the world of his own thoughts with a sudden start. But he slipped back again as soon as the attention of the others was diverted. Several times during the evening Smith found himself speculating as to what it was that monopolized the vicar's thoughts, and it was not until Miss Lipscombe explained that he was a minister of the gospel preoccupied with paganism that he realized the true significance of the momentary look of bewilderment that came into the old man's eyes when he was directly addressed. Smith longed to inquire of Miss Lipscombe what it actually was that had caused Alfred Warren's sudden disappearance from Little Bilstead but the question was one that seemed incapable of framing itself. After all, it was Warren's secret, and there was something almost indecent in probing into the unsavoury past of another man. As she talked, Smith was conscious that Miss Lipscombe was studying him, weighing him up, it seemed. Her grave, grey eyes appeared to be searching him through and through. Her conversation dealt for the most part with generalities and the news of the day. When she had occasion to refer to the parish or to anyone living in the neighbourhood, it was in an entirely impersonal manner, just as if she were addressing one who was an entire stranger to the neighbourhood. After the meal, the vicar retired to his study, there to lave himself in the classics he so loved, whilst Smith accompanied Miss Lipscombe to the drawing-room. At first he thought she would select this as the occasion of a more intimate talk, but no she maintained the same impersonal plane of small talk as at dinner. He learned much about Little Bilstead. There was a dryness about Miss Lipscombe's descriptions that suggested both humour and humanity lurking behind her words. Among other things, he learned that the forthcoming cricket match was the old fresco event of the year. As far as he could gather, it was the Little Bilstead something between a football cup final and Oxford and Cambridge at Lord's. It appealed alike to the proletariat and the patrician, he discovered that he was expected to play, as it seemed to have become a time-honoured custom that Alfred Warren should form part of the little Bilstead tale, which, according to Miss Limpscombe, existed primarily for the improvement of the bowling averages of the enemy. He gathered that Alfred Warren had disliked field sports, although he was a tolerable shot, and hunted in spasmodic fashion. His playing in the cricket match was his sop to the Cerberus of public opinion. He learned a great deal about the social life of Little Bilstead, more from Miss Lipscombe's expression and the inflection of her voice than from her actual words. Miss Jell was a prig, he decided, whereas Miss Mary was sweet and lovable, and very popular in the village. Dr. Crane was a married bachelor, it was her way of conveying his intense selfishness, and Mrs. Crane was a doormat. Of Marjorie, Miss Lipscombe said little but that little suggested to his eager ears that she was the most popular being in the parish. Her brother was a young scapegrace, Smith was assured, but there was a flicker about the corners of Miss Lipscombe's mouth when she gave the assurance, which convinced him that in the abundance of her charity there was a special place for scapegraces, and possibly even a little affection. The vicar was of the world unworldly. The only thing that ever brought him from the back blocks of atticism was cricket, the annual encounter between Little Bilstead and Upper Sexton always excited him to such a degree that Miss Lipscombe had to insist that the sermons for the Sunday to follow should be written before the event, no matter on what day the match were played. If they were left until after, they would either be forgotten altogether, or would so smack of cricket as to become a direct invitation for a rebuke from the bishop. He would rather meet a sinner with a century to his name than a saint who had failed to score was Miss Lipscombe's definition of her brother's character, but it was given in such a tone that conveyed to Smith the conviction that she was not so very far from sharing his view. There were many stories in Little Bilstead of the vicar's absent-mindedness. On one occasion, at a christening, he had turned from the font, the baby still in his arms, and walked slowly towards the vestry, forgetful that the infant had to be returned to its parent. On the night of the armistice, he had gone down to the village, where he had drunk a cup of cider outside the pigeons. Then, inspired by the excitement of the moment, he had offered up a prayer, not, as he had intended, for the guidance of those at the national helm, but for rain. In the middle of the night he had realized his lapse, and had sought counsel with his sister. She had promptly ordered him back to bed, at the same time easing his conscience by telling him that, in any case, 
Rain was badly needed. In speaking of her brother, Smith noticed that Miss Lipscombe's whole manner underwent a change. The tendency of her features towards severity of expression vanished. The humorous lines at the corners of her mouth sprang into prominence, and her voice softened to the tone of a mother speaking of a much-loved child. Marjorie, he gathered, spent much of her time at the Grange. She had always been a great favourite with Lady Warren, and during the last few years had been almost a daughter to her. It was only the claims of her own father and brother that had prevented her from accompanying Lady Warren upon her voyage to South Africa. She was a fine horsewoman, and invariably rode cross-country. Her horse, Nero, had been a present from Lady Warren, and he was permanently stabled at the Grange. "'He is utterly spoiled,' was Miss Lipscombe's verdict upon Nero. "'And I wonder he doesn't get diabetes from the amount of sugar he eats,' she added. But again there was nothing but good-natured tolerance in her voice. Smith shrewdly suspected that Miss Lipscombe was among those who pandered to Nero's weakness. Presently they touched upon the cause of his being there. "'Have you gone over to the enemy?' he queried, a smile disguising his anxiety. She shook her head with the air of one who is uncertain. "'You are very much like him, but still there is something different,' she said, still regarding Smith attentively. "'From what I have heard, I should hope there is a great deal that is different,' he said dryly. "'Although it may smack of the Pharisee,' he added. "'But is it possible for two men to be so much alike as—' She paused. "'You remember Adolf Beck,' said Smith. "'He was twice convicted of another man's crime, and that man, a criminal, whose every physical peculiarity was chronicled at Scotland Yard under the Bertillon system. There have been other cases just as remarkable,' he added. She nodded absently, as if pondering something that puzzled her. "'Well,' she said at length, I suppose those who live longest will see most, as my old grandmother used to say. In the meantime, it's ten o'clock, and we are early to bed, folk. Again, there was that fluttering at the corners of her mouth that did duty for a smile. With a feeling of disappointment he was unable to account for, Smith rose and followed her into the hall. "'Even if we agree that you are not Alfred Warren,' she said, as she struck a match and proceeded to light the candles on the hall table, there remains another problem to be solved. Another? he cried, startled in spite of himself. Surely this is enough to be going on with, he added, with a whimsical smile. If you are not Alfred Warren, she continued gravely, looking up and fixing him with her keen grey eyes, what sort of a man is James Smith? He had felt all along that she did not regard him as Alfred Warren, but her disconcerting question merely shifted the centre of responsibility. It was no longer a question of proving to her that he was not Alfred Warren, but of justifying James Smith, and of the two the newer problem seemed the more difficult. "'In any case, you can't do any harm to Alfred Warren's memory,' she remarked dryly as she handed him his candlestick. "'In all probability you'll sweeten it.' And with that she turned and preceded him upstairs." "'Good night,' she said at the top of the stairs, as she extended her hand. "'You'll find me a bland old woman who speaks her thoughts,' she added. This time there was no doubt about the fluttering at the corners of her mouth. That night, as he sat smoking at his bedroom window, Smith found his thoughts revolving round Miss Lipscombe's remark about sweetening the memory of the absent Alfred Warren. "'What if he had done his bit? Hundreds of failures had made good out there.' Strange stories had been told in the trenches. He recalled that of a man in his own company, who had been shot whilst bringing in a wounded comrade from no man's land. As he lay dying, he had confessed to the padre to having murdered a girl. He had done it in a fit of mad jealousy. Yet no one had shrunk from him, least of all the padre. On the contrary, he had comforted the poor fellow with the assurance that he had expiated his crime by giving up his own life for another. In any case, there could be no harm done to Alfred Warren if he stayed on, at least for a time. It might sweeten his memory, as Miss Lipscombe had suggested. Was the remark intended as a hint? What would be Marjorie's view, he wondered? Would she be sympathetic, or just coldly indifferent? Somehow or other, 
her scarcely veiled antagonism had set him thinking. What had he done outside his war service? There had been precious little that would come under the heading of usefulness. The world was not exactly the better for a century made at Lord's, or a winning try scored just on time at Queen's Club. Nor did the fact of being a good shot with a gun, the wrong sort of gun, make for the betterment of mankind. St. George had not slain the dragon with a double-barreled ejector sporting rifle, with luncheon and the ladies at one-thirty and dinner at eight. Washington had not freed America in football boots. Garibaldi would most likely have proved the various rabbit in the cricket field, whilst Cromwell, in all probability, could no more cast a fly than stroke an eight. Why had he never thought of all this before? Why had he just accepted things, just as his uncle had accepted Peter's shaven upper lip, and flown into a passion when it vanished beneath a cascade of auburn hair? It was all very puzzling. War was certainly the very devil for shifting values and destroying age-old ideals. The world seemed to him to have become one almighty why. It was so easy for the King Alfreds, the Joan of Arcs, and the Luthers of the world. Their destinies seemed obvious and preordained. But for the rest? Well, it was a bit difficult. Stevenson had said that life might be interpreted as having a good time and enriching the world with a few good things. It was not a bad philosophy, better than hunting for motes in another fellow's eye. There was the vicar, for instance. He would sweeten the memory of the devil himself, and, what was more, he appeared to do it without effort. It was nearly one o'clock when he finally decided to lay the problems and his head upon the white pillow that looked so inviting. Still, it really was the very devil. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 Smith acquires reach me downs 1. In Little Bilstead, life passed decorously from sunrise to sundown and from sundown to sunrise. Few events disturbed the studied calm of its atmosphere. A new hat or an indiscretion on the part of a domestic, were equally topics of absorbing interest. Nothing ever happened, that is, nothing had happened for the last seven years. Sometimes Miss Small, who eked out an insignificant pension by doing dressmaking, would sigh for the days when the village had seethed with scandal. It lent an added spice to existence. The morning knew not what the evening would bring forth, during the next forty-eight hours Smith learned something of the dramatic excitements with which life in Little Bilstead had been fraught some six years previously. The village then had seethed with scandal, and the people went about on the tiptoe of excitement. John Postle, the village constable, would rub the right-hand side of his chin with his thumb and say, "'Well, boh, what do you think on it?' And there would be a shaking of heads, and probably an "'I'll be danged or two from his hearers. In the Senate Bar of the Pigeons there had been great discussions, and the wildness of the rumours that were retailed would have appalled any but the most omnivorous scandal-monger. At the conclusion of some particularly piquant narration there would be a shuffling of feet, a general murmuring of voices, and a draining of earthenware mugs. It appeared that Alfred Warren had been not only of a convivial turn of mind, but intensely gregarious. He had attracted to himself some strange companions, including most of the undesirables, male and female, for miles around. No one had ever quite known when some influx of disreputables would turn little Bilstead topsy-turvy, cause the villagers to lock their doors at night, and sometimes even pile furniture against them. At first the pigeons had been used as a sort of headquarters by the revellers but a little stray talking from the chairman at the licensing sessions had caused host nut some anxiety as to the renewal of his license and his caution had grievously constricted the flow of liquor after that tom simmons had become the source from which supplies were obtained and many a case had been delivered at his cottage by the local carrier accompanied by a knowing wink this accounted for his reference to the whisky 
In those days Simmons was rarely, if ever, quite sober, but he was too cunning to neglect his work upon the roads. That would have meant disaster. Besides, he had a head like a hunting squire. The telling of the escapades of Alfred Warren seemed to have lost nothing with the passage of years. Many of the stories about him were clearly apocryphal, but even allowing a wide margin for imagination, there was enough left over to establish the fact that, whatever life in Little Bilstead had been during the residence of Alfred Warren, it had not lacked incident. There were stories of strange midnight orgies, suggestive of chapters from the lives of film stars in Los Angeles, and there were pranks and rags, such as the screwing up of the village constable's doors and windows, followed by an avalanche of lighted crackers down his chimney or the serenading of the Miss Jells with instruments composed of household utensils and motor-hooters, which had lasted the greater part of one summer night, to the accompaniment of much raucous song. Colonel Enderby's open antagonism Smith traced to an episode of a few months before Alfred Warren had disappeared from Little Bilstead. The gallant colonel lived alone, a woman from the village doing for him during the day. One morning he had discovered a clothes-line stretched across his front garden, in full view of the main road, from which dainty and intimate feminine garments sported in the breeze. As Colonel Enderby was a late riser, the whole of Little Bilstead made the discovery before he had even awakened. Furthermore, he had been forced to remove the offending garments himself, which he did by cutting down the line, Mrs. Warren's not being at her post at the customary hour. As a matter of fact, she had been, seen, and retired, horrified at the spectacle presented by the colonel's front garden. Miss Warnes was a woman who hung her marriage lines in a black Oxford frame over the parlour mantelpiece. On another occasion, Alfred Warren and half a dozen of his companions had doped Tom Bassingthwaite, the postman, as he was starting out upon his morning round. Then they had proceeded to steam open the letters and insert picture postcards of a character never permitted to circulate in this country. It had taken Little Bilstead months to recover from this outrage, and only lack of definite proof had saved the perpetrators from prosecution. Beneath all these stories there was an undercurrent of suggestive rumour, which never found expression in actual words. It was this which convinced Smith that Alfred Warren was what the village of Little Bilstead said he was, a rare wrongen. But all that was long ago, and for the past seven years Little Bilstead had made its own drama, just as, for the most part, it made its own clothes. Realization of its loss had come slowly to Little Bilstead. The sight of Bob Thurkettle glooming along the highways, a gun under his arm and a scowl on his lowering brow, had contained a suggestion that at any time drama might return, arm in arm with tragedy. That was a time when Little Bilstead scarcely dared to breathe. Then there had come the time when Bob Thurkettle had left his gun at home, and the village had sighed its resignation and possibly its regrets, for even an English village has its proper pride, and appreciates to the full the distinction of being referred to in London papers as the centre of a great crime. Now the black sheep was back again, and the old times would return. There would be no lack of excitement, Little Bilstead decided, as soon as things got going. It wanted only Bob Thurkettle, and then— In the meantime the black sheep was idling away the summer hours. It was all very comfortable, and he was quite content, but for the fact of Marjorie's frank avoidance of him. However, there was no ointment without its accompanying fly. Perhaps that was where flies went in the— How absurd! He realized that the vicar was striving to carry out his sister's orders and discharge fittingly his duties as host. He would propose some undertaking, such as a visit to the church, or the exploration of the vegetable garden, and, as a preparation, go in search of his pipe. That was the last Smith would see of him until he was routed out from his study for the next meal. Still, life at the vicarage was very pleasant, and Janet generally had some piquant item of gossip to retail when he grew drowsy with the drone of the bees or the cooing of the doves. In all probability it was only a lull before the storm he told himself. 2. Whilst little Bilstead was busy speculating as to the nature of the entertainment that the cricket match was likely to produce, Smith was busy considering the important question of suitable clothing in which to appear as one of the protagonists. 
an appeal to Willis, followed by a thorough and a systematic examination of Alfred Warren's wardrobe, failed to produce anything in the way of cricketing gear. Smith did not quite fancy playing in a tweed suit. His kit bag had been in the guard's van, and he had forgotten it. Apparently the guard had done the same. Somewhere on the Great Eastern Railway system were his flannels and buckskin boots. But just where he was not in a position to say. In any case, there was no time to make inquiries. "'You never liked cricket, Mr. Alfred,' Willis explained, to account for the absence of appropriate clothing. Willis seemed capable of defending every shortcoming of the sun and air as it presented itself. "'It didn't agree with you, sir,' he added. Probably Lady Warren had not thought it necessary to renew that particular portion of her son's wardrobe. "'Well, anyhow, I'm going to play,' said Smith. "'So what's to be done?' "'Miss Marjorie's taking the car into Norwich this afternoon,' began Willis tentatively. "'Perhaps you could—' "'Willis,' said Smith gravely, "'there are moments when you reach Napoleonic heights of inspiration. If Miss Marjorie will run me into Norwich, I can get fixed up with reach-me-downs that will probably be overlong and too narrow, or too broad and not long enough.' That afternoon Marjorie drove Smith into Norwich, with Eric in a tonneau, armed with a good supply of chocolate, a pea-shooter, a catapult, and ammunition sufficient for an extended offensive. The pea-shooter was for use upon the inhabitants of the villages they passed through, whereas the catapult he kept for the fauna. During the early part of the outward journey he became confused in the matter of weapons, and that was in the case of a ditcher, bent and busy, who presented a target upon which a pea-shooter would have been wasted. The man's yell, as he straightened himself, caused both Marjorie and Smith to look around, but all they saw was an innocent, freckled face behind a bar of chocolate, whilst in the distance a man was shaking his clenched hand at the disappearing car, the other hand being engaged elsewhere. Smith had offered to drive, but Marjorie declined, and he settled down contentedly to watch the dexterous way in which she handled the car. She was careful, but she lost no opportunity of picking up speed on safe bits of road. Smith ventured a few general remarks, but he was conscious once more of the barrier the girl seemed determined should exist between them. She had a reasonable excuse for not being conversational, and, after a few unsuccessful efforts, Smith gave up the struggle. He soon, however, found a new source of interest in the activities of Eric. By moving his position slightly, he was able to obtain a view of the tonneau. Eric's success with the ditcher had caused him permanently to lay aside the pea-shooter as a weapon of offence and devote himself to the catapult. Kneeling on the back seat, he proceeded to let fly at anything that moved. Smith could not judge with what effect, but in one or two instances the markmanship must have been good, noticeably when a terrified pig gave tongue, its squeal rising clear-cut above the hum of the car. Smith was not surprised when later he heard Eric endeavouring to persuade Marjorie to return by another route, and he earned Eric's lifelong devotion by supporting the suggestion. Smith's object was a purely selfish one. He had no desire to be stopped every hundred yards or so by those who had suffered from Eric's dexterity with the catapult. At the Maid's Head Hotel they parted, Marjorie to do her shopping, Eric to replenish his supply of ammunition, and Smith to search for boots and flannel trousers. Marjorie had left no doubt as to her intentions when she informed him that they would be starting back at five o'clock, so as to be home well in time for dinner. With a final word of warning to Eric, who had point-blank refused to accompany her, she walked out of the hotel, leaving Smith and Eric to follow. For reasons best known to himself, Eric apparently desired to be alone, but he could not quite discover the right way to shake off Smith, as he would have expressed it. He solved the problem by suddenly darting down a side street with an exclamation to the effect that, "'There's a fellow I know,' as Smith was permitted to pursue his way alone. Having secured flannels that seemed close enough a fit to stay on him, and at the same time not too close a fit to part where they should not part, Smith next proceeded to search for a pair of boots. These secured and ordered to be sent to the maid's head, he decided to take a stroll through the city until it was time to keep the rendezvous at the hotel. "'If it isn't little Alfie Warren!' 
he turned swiftly on his heel from an examination of a fine old mezzotent of Sir Robert Peel to find himself gazing into a pair of bold dark eyes, above which was perched a large straw hat laden with artificial flowers and fruit, more suggestive of a Harvard festival than a hat covering. "'I thought it was you,' said the owner of the eyes. "'Fancy meeting you after all these years!' That one swift look had thoroughly unnerved Smith. The green jumper over a short tweed skirt of a loud pattern, the coarse features heavily smothered with powder, the red lips, and, above all, the dead gold hair, dark at the roots, caused him involuntarily to shudder. "'I'm afraid you've made a mistake,' he said coldly, as he formally lifted his head. "'My name is not Warren.' "'Oh, ring off!' she cried with a laugh. "'I should have known you anywhere. You look as if you'd been on a water-wagon, though. I heard you were back.' "'I assure you,' said Smith quietly, "'that you have made the mistake. My name is not Alfred Warren, but James Smith.' "'Alias Bill Jones, or Henry Robinson?' She laughed shrilly, and several passers-by looked curiously at the pair. He made a movement to pass on, but the woman suddenly thrust her arm through his. "'Come and let us have a barley-water, Alfie. I'm as dry as a Yankee.' For a moment he hesitated, gazing about him as if meditating flight. "'I—' he began. Then he stopped suddenly. There, standing a few yards away, was Marjorie. Apparently she had just come out of a shop. For the space of a second her eyes met his. Then she turned and walked off in the opposite direction, with a studied indifference that maddened him. "'I assure you that you are mistaken,' he said, in a voice loud enough, he hoped, for Marjorie to hear. Turning on his heel, he walked quickly in the opposite direction from that she had taken. "'Oity, toity!' cried the woman. "'Getting too proud to know our old pals, are we? You've got a fat lot to be proud of, Alfie Warren.' Smith's instinct was to take to his heels and run. He was conscious of the heads turned in his direction, whilst in his heart was a great terror lest the woman should pursue him. Never had Alfred Warren been so thoroughly and comprehensively cursed in the whole of his existence as he was during the next few minutes. For half an hour Smith wandered about the city, and at a pace that drew to him many curious glances. He was brought back to realities again by Eric hailing him from the other side of the road. "'Got your bags?' he inquired, one halfway across. "'Bags?' repeated Smith vaguely. "'Uh, yes, of course,' he added, a moment later, realizing the purport of the question. "'Quite all right, thanks.' For a moment all thought of cricket had vanished from his mind. He could remember only the look Marjorie had directed towards him. "'Damn!' he muttered. "'Eh?' Eric looked at him inquiringly. "'I remarked, damn,' said Smith quietly. "'Why?' queried the boy. "'I was wondering what I am going to say when we pass that ditcher on the way home, and also the owner of the pig.' Whereat Eric's face flamed, and a moment later he disappeared, without even the intimation that he had seen a fellow he knew. With an hour still to spare, Smith was struck with the idea of calling upon Lady Warren's solicitor. Recognition by Alfred Warren's erstwhile friends seemed likely to prove not the least embarrassing feature of the adventure and this had inspired him to inquire of Willis the name and address of the family lawyer. The process of psychologizing the real Alfred was proving both swift and startling, and it might be advisable to make the acquaintance of Lady Warren's solicitor as a measure of precaution. At least he could be depended upon to approach the problem without emotion. End of chapter 10《he was quite prepared to be hailed once more as a returned prodigal. It was with relief that he saw behind a small counter a dark-haired youth, 
whose dislike of water was manifested by a dark rim that began above his collar and rose gradually on either side until it finally disappeared behind his large red ears is mr tessel in smith inquired what name sir asked the lad declining to commit himself say a gentleman wishes to see him on important business yes sir what name repeated the youth without show of emotion give him that message please said smith realizing for the first time in his life the importance of labels as applied to human beings for a moment the lad stood gazing at him out of a pair of pink-rimmed eyes then reluctantly lifting the flap of the counter he motioned smith to pass through a moment later he threw open a door on which appeared in white letters the words waiting room without requesting the caller to take a seat the lad closed the door leaving smith to listen to the tick-tack of the clock or as an alternative to gaze at a much foxed mezzotint of lord ellenborough he was speculating as to what would be the psychological effect upon his clients of a bowl of roses upon a lawyer's waiting-room table when the door opened and the lad reappeared mr tassel can't see you sir unless you send in your name he said with the air of one who entirely concurs with the terms of an ultimatum then tell mr tassel with my compliments said smith that i'll wait here until he can see me by the way if you've got any lighter reading than a treatise on evidence you might let me have it the lad gazed up at smith a new respect in his eyes it was not usual for the decrees of the senior partner to be flouted in this way and with the true instinct of the briton he determined that smith must be somebody of importance you might add that i come from one of mr tassel's oldest clients added smith who had no desire to spend longer than was absolutely necessary in the uninspiring atmosphere of the lawyer's waiting-room two minutes later the lad returned with a request that smith would follow him proceeding along a corridor the boy opened another ground-glass door on which it was announced that mr tassel was private the gentleman sir said the lad thus labelled smith stepped into the room and the door closed behind him he was conscious of an expanse of bald head surrounded on three sides by a fringe of grey hair a moment later a movement of the expanse of baldness brought into his range of vision a pair of keen grey eyes looking at him through gold-rimmed spectacles for a second there was sternness in those eyes then a look of bewilderment and surprise followed by a quick movement backward of the revolving chair as mr tassel struggled to his feet mr warren he cried then he plumped down into the chair again and sat looking at smith as if he had been an apparition his hands gripping the arms of his chair until the knuckles stood out hard and white from the surrounding yellowness with an effort he appeared to regain control of himself and motioned smith to a chair mr tassel seemed to have been conceived in neutral tints the prevailing shade being a soft yellow there was nowhere about him any suggestion of blood the lips of his large mouth were grey his voice woolly and his general appearance that of a man who had stepped out of a picture some forty or fifty years old i was afraid you would said smith wearily as he dropped into the chair indicated everybody seems to crumple the moment i appear at least in this county he added it's positively monotonous mr tassel swallowed noisily his adam's apple leaping upwards and then reappearing again with startling suddenness in as few words as possible smith proceeded to relate the events that led up to his appearance in mr tassel's office by the time he had finished mr tassel had entirely recovered his self-possession mainly by the process of polishing and repolishing his spectacles reinforced by several mighty swallows three times he took them off and three times he replaced them first subjecting the lenses to a vigorous rubbing with a maroon silk pocket handkerchief as he did so he gazed across at smith a strange and inscrutable look in his eyes then as if suddenly realizing that the interview was of a professional nature he replaced his spectacles pursed his lips leaned back in his chair and placing the points of his fingers together proceeded to regard the tips as if they held the solution of the riddle that smith had propounded so you see i am not alfred warren smith concluded but just plain james smith one of the tens of thousands of smiths who avoid confusion with other smiths by sheer personality i understand said mr tassel in his best county court manner 
that you climbed the gates of the Grange? I did. May I ask why? Because I was wet. Mr. Tassel removed his glasses and became absorbed in polishing them. I always climb gates when I'm wet. Mr. Tassel looked up, still continuing to polish his glasses, but Smith's face was as grave as that of a judge. You knew the gates were there, queried Mr. Tassel. Well, I suspected it, Smith admitted, still with the utmost gravity. When a thing has almost torn off your trousers, you do, he added dryly. Even Einstein could not avoid it. The night was very dark. Intensely. Still, you saw the gates of the Grange, persisted Mr. Tassel, as he reassumed his glasses. I ran into them. And climbed them. With infinite difficulty. And yet you say you are not Mr. Alfred Warren, but Mr. James Smith. Mr. Tassel raised his eyes from his fingertips and looked at his visitor over the top of his spectacles. There was something of sternness in his gaze. "'I did, and I am,' said Smith evenly. Mr. Tassel nodded gravely, as if the answer in no way surprised him. He returned to a minute examination of his fingertips, then, raising his eyes again, he proceeded once more to regard Smith over the top of his spectacles. "'The likeness is certainly remarkable,' he said a little dryly, Smith thought. After another pause, he continued. "'I take it that you are not prepared to acquaint me with your actual identity. In the strictest confidence, of course,' he added. "'I have already done so,' was the smiling rejoinder. "'I am James Smith.' "'Of?' interrogated the lawyer. "'Of nowhere in particular.' "'Hmm,' murmured Mr. Tassel, as he sucked in his lips. "'I would advise,' he continued, with great deliberation, "'that you produce evidence of, um, uh, an uncontrovertible nature "'that will, um, establish definitely your identity.' "'In that I entirely agree,' said Smith quietly. "'Only it happens to be the one thing that I am not prepared to do.' Why? The interrogation came like a pistol shot. Family reasons, was the quiet rejoinder. You say that the servants have identified you as well, he queried. They have, said Smith. I might even add with enthusiasm. Mr. Tassel proceeded to make further mysterious noises, somewhere behind the region of his Adam's apple, which bobbed about like an eggshell on the water jet of a shooting gallery. You have insisted that they are mistaken he queried my dear sir said smith patiently i might swear it on the apocrypha or the koran they wouldn't believe me you might disappear said mr tessel tentatively i might he agreed but you have decided not to i have with pursed up lips and a roving adam's apple mr tessel proceeded to grapple with this new aspect of the situation you realize, of course, there may be difficulties, even embarrassments, he said. Great Gulliver, cried Smith, there are scores of them in Little Bilstead, and no doubt others will present themselves with the passage of time. One got me by the arm in this very city only half an hour ago, smelling vilely of patchouli, and he proceeded to tell of the girl in the jumper and the harvest festival hat. Mr. Tassel looked grave. "'There may even be legal complications,' he said, without, however, raising his eyes from their absorbed contemplation of his fingertips. "'There will be legal complications,' he added. "'That's why I came to you,' Smith stifled a yawn. "'When you—' "'When Mr. Warren,' Mr. Tassel corrected himself, "'disappeared seven years ago,' There were some extremely difficult matters requiring adjustment. I gathered as much. I see. 
This time there was no mistaking the dry tone in which the words were uttered, and Smith found himself gazing into a pair of keen, shrewd eyes which, he decided, were not over-friendly. "'You are a very bold man, Mr. Um, Smith?' "'You mean?' queried Smith. "'Had my advice been sought, I should unhesitatingly have opposed your—' "'Being identified as Alfred Warren,' suggested Smith quietly. Mr. Tassel's keen eyes were once more sought Smith. "'I cannot help being like this blighter Warren, can I? I know he was a bit of an outsider.' How? Again the interrogation came like the click of a trigger. When the family butler follows the prodigal about with a decanter of whisky and a siphon, it is not exactly indicative of previous pussyfoot tendencies, is it? But that may imply only weakness, said the lawyer. You used a term. Blighter, agreed Smith. A man doesn't leave home because he takes whisky and soda. Very little soda, by the way. At breakfast, "'True,' said Mr. Tassel, once more operating upon his spectacles with a maroon silk handkerchief. "'I feel it my duty, Mr. Warren.' "'Smith, please.' "'Mr. Smith, I feel it my duty to warn you that, um, certain matters were kept from Lady Warren six years ago, when you, um, when Mr. Warren disappeared. Mr. Tassel cleared his throat with a portentous solemnity he usually reserved for inquests, and fixed Smith with a keen, steely gaze, as if he would read his innermost thoughts. "'It certainly looks as if I'm in for something exciting,' said Smith easily. "'After all, when you assume a prodigal's responsibilities, you cannot expect altogether to avoid the husks, and encounter only commonplace butlers in a land flowing with whisky and soda.' To Mr. Tassel such obvious cheerfulness appeared in the light of flippancy. He had never liked Alfred Warren. Now he positively disliked him. He regarded it as an insult to his professional amour propre to expect a lawyer to be taken in by so obvious a subterfuge as this pretense of being another man, so that he might inherit the earth without reaping the whirlwind. "'I understand that others in Little Bilstead are convinced that you are—' "'Mr. Alfred Warren,' said Mr. Tassel. "'May I inquire if they are friendly?' "'About as friendly as fowls are to a fox,' said Smith. There was something about Mr. Tassel's whole manner that irritated him. He seemed bloodless, devoid of all humanity. "'If I am Alfred Warren, why should I want to deny it?' he demanded. "'There might be reasons,' there was an ominous note in Mr. Tassel's woolly tones, "'What reasons?' "'I said there might be reasons,' said Mr. Tassel quietly. Lady Warren was one of his oldest clients. "'You speak in parables,' said Smith, "'and this prodigal business has wearied me of the very thought of a parable.' "'Then I will speak plainly,' was the rejoinder. "'By staying on at Little Bilstead, you place yourself in very grave danger.' I fear I can in no way associate myself with your action without Lady Warren's explicit instructions. I shall cable. If you do, it will most probably be murder, said Smith, and he proceeded to explain what Dr. Crane had told him. Then I will write, continued the lawyer, as Smith rose. You are not very helpful, he said, with a smile. Good morning, and he passed out of the room. In the main office he found the pale-faced lad with a perpetual high-water mark, but before he had time to detach his attention from an evil-smelling pear-drop and the bendance of the air, over which he was pouring, Smith had passed out of the door. "'Rummin,' said the lad, as he returned to the bendance of the air. When he had walked some hundred yards or so, Smith suddenly stopped dead, much to the embarrassment of a little man who was close behind him and who had some difficulty in avoiding a collision. The full significance of Mr. Tassel's words had suddenly dawned upon him. The lawyer regarded him as the real prodigal, who, by denying his identity, hoped to escape from the consequences of some deed or deeds he had committed. "'Pleasant for the understudy,' he muttered, as he drew a cigarette case from his pocket and resumed his walk. 2. 
the return journey was a miserable affair. On arriving at the maid's head, Smith had found Marjorie and Eric in the midst of a heated argument, which arose from Marjorie's statement that Eric was to occupy the front seat beside her, so that she could see he did not get into mischief. Eric point-blank refused, but a compromise was effected by Smith volunteering to sit with Eric in the tonneau, ostensibly to look after him, but he had no illusions as to the real reason. For the first half of the journey this arrangement quite spoiled Eric's enjoyment. Later he discovered that Smith was so absorbed in his own thoughts as to be oblivious as to what was going on around him, after which big-game shooting by catapult continued apace. The memory of the success he had achieved with the ditcher inspired in Eric the hope that some other specimen of roadside biped might be found bent to a suitable angle. As the car hummed along, devouring the white road that ribboned out before it, Eric began to despair. So far the bag for the homeward journey consisted of two farm labourers caught, alas, in an upright position, one pig, three fowls, and a dog, but the recollection of the anguished yell of the ditcher still rang musically in his ears. He had almost given up hope of further sport that day, when a turn in the road disclosed the unbelievable. There, just ahead, was a man in a suit of checks as vivid as the ditcher's language had been, and he was bending over a motorcycle. As the car purred past him, the owner of the checks, a man of generous build, glanced up momentarily, revealing a luxuriant auburn moustache. But he was obviously absorbed in some baffling problem his engine had presented to him, for he resumed his bent position immediately. Eric almost whooped with joy. The target offered by the ditcher was as nothing to that presented by the man in the brown and white checks. It was so good that Eric double-charged his catapult. Taking careful aim over the back of the car, he let fly. He bobbed down instantly, but a shout, half yell, half roar, caused him to raise an incautious head that he might view the extent of the casualty. He saw his victim dancing in the middle of the road, either with rage or pain, Eric could not be sure which, but from the fact that the man's hands were behind him, he drew his own conclusions. As Eric's red head rose above the hood of the car, a brown and white check arm appeared, terminating in a fist, in the motion of which there was menace. A moment later, that same fist was holding a notebook. Then another bend in the road hit both motorcycle and owner from view, and Eric, with a sigh of contentment and a side glance at Smith, who sat moodily wrapped in his own thoughts, sank down on the seat beside him. They were getting too near home for further sport. The significance of the notebook Eric did not properly realize until Little Bilstead was reached, when he found that the mud he had carefully plastered over two of the figures of the number plate had been jolted off during the journey. "'You've been awake all the time?' he queried of Smith, as he stood for a moment at the hall door of the Grange. "'Awake?' repeated Smith vaguely. "'Certainly.' "'If you hadn't been, I might have had some fun,' was the rejoinder, and he dashed away to forage for a meal, leaving Smith wondering. That night Eric Stannard slept soundly conscious that by his master's strategy he would be able to confute the evidence of the man who owned the brown and white tweeds and the auburn moustache should he present himself the catapult itself he had taken the precaution of burying in all great undertakings foresight ensures both the success of the operation and immunity from the consequences end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of *The Return of Alfred* by Herbert George Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter Twelve. Little Bilsett goes to church. Never, within the memory of the oldest inhabitant, had Little Bilsett shown itself so devout as on the Sunday morning following the return of Miss Alfred. It had awakened with a delightful feeling of expectancy. Instinctively, its thoughts gravitated towards church for was not Miss Alfred staying at the vicarage? The return of Miss Alfred had been regarded by every man and woman in Little Bilstead as a godsend. The women gossiped about it for hour after neglectful hour, and the men yearned for the leaden minutes to pass until they could foregather at the pigeons and inquire of one another, "'Well, boar, what do you think on it?' The prodigal's denial that he was the prodigal they seemed to take as a matter of course, they knew Alfred Warren to be a craven, and what more natural than that he should deny sowing the wind 
lest the whirlwind engulf him. Their conversation turned largely upon what would happen when Bob Thurkettle should return, as all knew he inevitably would. As a matter of fact, several had taken the precaution of writing to tell him that Alfred Warren was back. If they had keener eyes than Nemesis, it was but friendly to lend her a helping hand. Never in its history had rumour run through Little Bilstead as it did during the days that followed the return of its own pet black sheep. The wildest stories were circulated and credited. The prodigal had returned armed to the teeth. He had aroused the inmates of the Grange by shooting through the upper windows. He wore a shirt of chainmail under his clothes in view of a possible encounter with Bob Thurkettle. He had obtained the keys of the wine cellar from Willis at the point of the pistol, and the old man had fainted. He had extracted a large sum of money from Miss Marjorie by threatening to burn down the house, whereat she had fainted and Dr. Crane had been sent for. The doctor, in turn, had forbidden him to leave the neighbourhood under penalty of prosecution for threats of violence. It was alleged that Alfred Warren had spent his first night at the vicarage in carousing, drinking neat whisky, and shouting ribald songs. Everything was credited, repeated with embellishments and additions, and duly recredited. The one thing that no one thought of believing was that the alleged Alfred Warren was not Alfred Warren at all. That would have strangled the newborn drama at its birth, which to Little Bilstead would have been emotional suicide. Every man, woman, and child in the village vied with one another to catch as many glimpses as possible of the man who had brought into their lives a new and piquant interest. Host Nudd of the Pigeons sucked a hollow tooth as he laboriously wrote out special orders to the brewer and spirit merchant. Not even in the palmiest days of Alfred Warren's scandalous doings had he done such business. Men from outlying villages tramped into Little Bilstead after the day's work to hear the latest news, and the thirst for Little Bilstead itself had increased threefold. On the night it became known that Miss Alfred was to play in the cricket match, the takings of the pigeons had reached record proportions. "'Well, what do you think on it, together?' Nudd had inquired at an early stage of the discussion, and it was obvious from the comments that ensued during the next two hours that no one knew exactly what to think of it. Right up to closing time they had dilated upon this new and mysterious aspect of an old scandal. "'Dick Marshall give him cosh, that's sure moral,' growled Jack Bean who knew that the advent of Alfred Warren would lose him his place in the team, and he seemed to have echoed the general opinion. No one doubted that, in agreeing to play, Miss Alfred was making a bid for popularity and rehabilitation. The possibilities of the cricket match were discussed and rediscussed. Two things were accepted as certain, that the demon bowling of Marsh, the captain of the opposing team, would produce the tragedy whereas Miss Alfred's notorious inexperience in field sports would supply the comedy. "'It'll be a fair, Barney,' cried one enthusiast, as he rose to go. "'I'm going to get there early,' he added, as he made towards the door, and, with a "'Fare you well,' departed. On the Saturday night, little Bilset had gone to bed, praying for a fine day on the morrow. In spite of the memory that in the past— the fine old early English church at Little Bilsett had seldom seen the sun and air of the Grange, it was argued that, as the vicar's guest, he could not very well fail to put in an appearance at least once during the day. The lads of the village arrived early and in force, taking up their position on the top of the grey lichen covered wall surrounding the church. They amused themselves by calling one another's attention to the outstanding features, both sartorial and physical, of all who passed, particularly the girls. Never had Little Bilstead manifested such devotion as upon that summer Sunday morning. Even old Jacob Gooch, who had not moved outside his house for eighteen months, was seen hobbling along, supported on one side by a stick and on the other by his son, Thomas. The church itself was suggestive of a wedding, as for the most part the worshippers manifested a marked reluctance to enter until the last moment, hopeful of catching a glimpse of Mr. Alfred's on his way from the vicarage. They lined the path that led from the porch to the gate, and they collected in a knot at the gate itself. There was but one topic of conversation, the return of the wanderer. Those who were old enough to remember narrated to those who were not some of the more hectic episodes in the life of the prodigal, and the stories lost nothing in the telling. Girls giggled and pretended to be shocked, but they made no effort to remove themselves out of earshot of those who were excavating in Alfred Warren's past. 
Whilst Little Bilstead was awaiting the arrival of the man who had brought so much colour into its life, Miss Lipscombe was occupied with her usual Sunday morning efforts to counter the vicar's absent-mindedness. She handed him the manuscript of his sermon, gave him a handkerchief, supplied him with a list of hymns, lessons, and psalms, in short, provided him with all he was likely to require. The fact that he now made very few mistakes in the conduct of divine service was entirely due to his fear of Miss Lipscombe. She had read through the sermon very carefully to see that there was nothing in it suggestive of the return of prodigals. The vicar's original idea had been to preach a sermon upon the parable itself, but this Miss Lipscombe had resolutely vetoed. There had been sufficient scandal about Alfred Warren, without adding to it from the pulpit, had been her view, and her brother reluctantly relinquished the idea. The vicar went on first, as was his wont, followed a few minutes later by Miss Lipscombe and Smith. As they were seen approaching the gate, a hush fell upon the crowd of expectant villagers. As the two passed between the double line of eager eyes, there was much cap-touching and nodding to Miss Lipscombe, with an occasional, "'Morning, Mr. Alfred,' for the prodigal. As they entered the church, the crowd followed, and that morning many little Bustellian listened to the sonorous English of King Edward the Sixth prayer-book for the first time for years. When the vicar ascended the pulpit steps, there was a hush of expectancy. Everyone thought that his sermon would refer to the return of the wanderer, and when he announced this text as the parable of the widow's cruise, it was obvious that all were disappointed. Prodigals had nothing to do with widows' cruises. At least, they ought not to, thought little Bilstead. In spite of the careful coaching he had undergone at the hands of his sister, the vicar managed to link up the widows' cruise of plenty with the sinner that repenteth, and went on to make a passing reference to the dear friend who is back in our midst, after years of wandering, to be welcomed as a brother and loved as a dutiful son. Smith felt every eye turned upon him, and he could see from the lines of Miss Lipscombe's mouth that she was annoyed. During the offertory there was a general gathering together of possessions. As one being, the congregation had made up its mind to slip out quietly directly the service was over, in the hope of getting another glimpse of Alfred Warren as he left the church. The Amen, which followed the vicar's benediction, pronounced from the altar, might have been an alarm of fire from the affected head upon the congregation. The slipping out quietly degenerated into something bordering on a stampede. Each discovered that his or her own particular little scheme for getting into the churchyard quickly was not so original as had been thought, and a feeling of irritation seemed to spread over the whole congregation. Toes were trodden on, elbows were thrust into sensitive parts of anatomies, and there was much pushing and crushing. "'They seem to be in a hurry to get out,' murmured Smith to Miss Lipscombe. "'It's you,' she said, and there was a grimness in the words which caused him to glance at her curiously. "'Wait until they've gone,' and she resumed her seat. That morning the casualties were widespread. Miss Jell had the stick of her parasol broken. Colonel Enderby had said damn in the centre ale because somebody had momentarily taken rest upon his most sensitive corn. Mrs. Crane had her black and white poplin skirt torn out of the garters whilst Mrs. Trespit Green had swallowed a small acid drop. With her, acid drops were indissolubly associated with religion. She always joined in the singing. Miss Marshall lost her glasses, and Mr. Marshall lost his temper because, in stooping to recover them, he had detached from a certain garment two buttons upon which much responsibility rested. A worse fate befell Mrs. Spellman. A careless toe had caught her on the calf of her left leg, and laddered her stocking in a way that seemed almost indelicate. During most of the way home her head was over her left shoulder as she endeavoured to obtain a glimpse of what a wag who knew her had once described as the fatted calf. In the churchyard the conversation was fairly equally divided between Alfred Warren and the ill manners of those who pushed and crushed to escape from God's edifice, as Mrs. Trespert Green expressed it. She was wondering if acid drops, inadvertently swallowed, caused appendicitis. As neither Miss Lipscombe nor Smith put in an appearance, the various units reluctantly drifted away. They had, in fact, left by the vestry door with the vicar, and had taken another road to the vicarage. It was not, however, until an hour later that the churchyard was entirely clear. That day many of the inhabitants of Little Bilstead had a half-cold Sunday dinner. 
but that was to them as nothing. They had seen a real prodigal, and it was worth it. During the afternoon the memory of Alfred Warren was yet in the minds of many. Locked in her bedroom, Miss Jell, with the aid of a tube of secotine, was endeavouring to mend the handle of her parasol. Mr. Marshall was standing in an awkward position whilst his daughter brought up to their full complement the number of his buttons. Colonel Enderby was bathing his left foot in warm water and Hindustani oaths, whilst Mrs. Crane was regathering her skirt, and all were looking forward to the morrow, which they instinctively felt would be productive of dramatic developments. The next two days Smith spent in keen enjoyment of the almost cloistral quiet of life at the vicarage. The vicar he found conversationally insolvent, except upon the subject nearest to his heart, the life of the ancients. Having no desire to expose the holes and patches in his own classical toga, Smith avoided any effort to open up an obvious avenue to the scholarly cleric's heart. Whilst Smith was absorbing the atmosphere of peace that pervaded the vicarage garden, the village was seething with excitement. The cricket match was only hours away, and Little Bilstead's own particular black sheep was to play. The farmers swore that there was nothing being done. As a matter of fact, there was a great deal being done in the way of scandal and reminiscence. Never had the gregarious instinct been more manifest in Little Bilstead. It was not to be expected that, in the face of such dramatic happenings, men or women could be expected to work apart when they were almost bursting to convey to one another some wave of recollection that had just undulated into their sluggish brains. Phyllis, whose place was in the dairy, dang her, would be found by her master in the stables, where Thomas was attending to the horses, or that their job Dale, who by right should have been carting turnips, would be discovered in the kitchen, telling Mary what they do say in the village, and what they did say the night before at the pigeons. Tom Bassingthwaite, the postman, carried from house to house the latest rumours, picking up additional titbits as he went. By the time he reached the end of his round, his voice had become a mere croak. He was also, as he confessed to himself, inclined to squiffiness, for the news was good and was well paid for, and more than one homestead in the neighbourhood was noted for the strength and potency of its home brew. In the meantime, his sister, Martha Bessingthwaite, who officially was the postmistress, sold stamps as she had never sold stamps before. She was deaf and placid, her deafness being exaggerated that it might serve officially for defensive purposes. No armour, however, could resist the penetrating power of the events of the past few days, and Martha Bessingthwaite surprised many of her customers by the amount she knew and the quickness with which she picked up each new detail of importance. In Little Bilstead, the post office was the centre of information. What Tom Bussingthwaite did not know about local affairs need worry no one. His lateness in returning from his morning round on the Monday following the return of Alfred Warren constituted a serious grievance to the village. Colonel Enderby, who had made three separate visits to the post office at a cost of three separate tuppenny stamps, announced his intention of reporting the circumstance to the postmaster general. Miss Jell had called twice once for a packet of postcards, which she really required, and once to refer to the post-office guide for information about the South American mails, which she did not require. Mr. Marshall had loitered about the village since an unusually early breakfast, but even he had been anticipated by Mrs. Spellman, whom nothing could keep away, not even another accident to Prinny's tale. All were hoping for a further glimpse of the prodigal himself, but Smith, found the vicarage garden infinitely more to his taste than supplying material for the village gossips. Several times he strolled the short distance to the Grange gates in the hope of catching a glimpse of Marjorie, but without success. On one occasion he encountered the choleric Colonel Enderby, whom he recognized from Eric's description. The Colonel approached like a motor-car, burning bad petrol, puffing and snorting, and producing strange noises from within. As he passed, he glared at Smith, as if he expected him to wither away under the intensity of his hate. Ten minutes later, Old End, as Eric called him, was back in the village, with the latest news but little breath, and promptly became the centre of an excited group of scandal-seekers. That afternoon, social little Bilstead found it impossible to take its tea alone, and repeated the episode of Taffy's house, with however this difference that there was no discoverable larceny. The Miss Jells called upon Mrs. Trusbert Green, who had just gone to call upon Mrs. Spellman, who was underway to see Mrs. Crane. 
The doctor's wife, however, was halfway to the Cedars before she encountered the marshals, who were bound for Colonel Enderby's, who was actually ringing the marshal's bell at the moment of the encounter. Everybody had selected a cross-country route, so as not to be seen by prying eyes. The result was that those who took tea at all that afternoon took it late and in their own homes. In consequence, there was a general wave of acute disappointment, and the prodigal's stock fell several more points. At the pigeons, John Nudd rubbed his hands. Each night the discussion seemed to wax hotter, and in consequence thirsts became greater. The cricket match was dwarfed by the greater event of Miss Alfred's return. As the night progressed, however, the fierceness of the discussion subsided somewhat, and when the time came for the final shuffling of feet, preluding the closing of John Nutt's hospitable doors for the night, some rustic philosopher would announce that, when Bob Thurkettle returned, the prodigal would cop it a rummin, and, with a chorus of acquiescing grunts or growls, each would go his way, trusting that, when the epic encounter took place, fate would so arrange it that he should be somewhere in the vicinity. Eric had constituted himself a sort of mercury. He ran back and forth to the vicarage like a puppy on the first day of spring. He was invariably in a hurry, and always brought the latest account of what was taking place in the village. He did not, however, make any mention of an encounter he had with Postle, the ensuing cross-examination, or of the fact that he had striven to convince the village constable that the fatal shot which had caught the check-suited stranger whilst in a stooping position had been fired by Smith. On the Tuesday, Smith decided to take a stroll towards the village to see how things were shaping. He had not proceeded more than a few hundred yards down the road when he came suddenly upon Miss Mary Jell. At the sight of him, she turned and literally ran for the shelter of Mrs. Bellman's garden gate. Undaunted by this rather startling manifestation of his unpopularity, Smith had continued on his way. The hour, however, was just before social little bills had lunged, and all had returned to the seclusion of their own roofs. The antagonism of the villagers themselves, however, was marked by a bold, expressionless stare from the few women he encountered, a scowl from the still fewer men, and by three stones and two cries about Bob Thurkettle's mother from the children. Returning to the vicarage, Smith told Miss Lipscomb of his experience. Grim-lipped and steely of eye, she had advised him to keep away from the village, at least for a day or two. He knew the advice had less connection with the recent demonstration than the dramatic possibilities likely to result from the return of Bob Thurkettle. "'I'm afraid,' she said at dinner that evening, "'I shall have to hold you prisoner for a few days.' And there was a smile in her eyes, and that queer little fluttering at the corners of her firm mouth as she spoke. "'I'm an old woman,' she continued, "'and I like young society.' and Smith had assured her that he asked nothing better than the hospitality of the vicarage. For James Smith, he had concluded, and not Alfred Warren. "'Thank you, Mr. James Smith,' was Miss Lipscomb's dry retort. End of chapter 12《ヒロシュミッツリッチェルの夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜だアルフレッド・ウォーンは、デモクラティックな人たちです。この手紙は、ウィルス・リリジュスに送り出したヴィカリッジ、そして、スミス・リリジュスに送り出したのは、もしかしたら、メッセンジャー、が、もしかしたら、ヴィカリッジ。それは、スミスは、スミスは、アルフレッド・ウォーンは、それは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、スミスは、Return of the Wanderer was no doubt responsible for these epistolary attentions. The ancients adjured one another to speak no evil of the dead. The Norfolk Post went a step further by including the recently returned. The article, a column in length, dealt mostly with the late Sir Joseph Warren's well-known charities, the subject of the prodigal's disappearance and return being dismissed in a few lines. 
"'We understand,' it concluded, "'that for the last few years Mr. Warren has been travelling abroad for the benefit of his health.' Whether this was irony or good nature, Smith could not decide, but that there was no question about the accuracy of the statement was proved, a few days later, by an incident that occurred one afternoon as he was setting out for a walk. He was halfway down the drive of the vicarage when he became aware that, coming towards him, was a puffy little man wearing a loud check suit and a vile tie. Himself he was extremely sensitive about neckwear. At the sight of Smith, the little man increased his pace to a strange movement, half bounce, half trot. His hands were outstretched, his face beaming. It was obvious that he was extremely pleased about something. "'My dear fellow!' he cried, when within a few yards of Smith. "'After many years!' And he made an effort to clutch Smith's hands. Smith gazed at him curiously. His moist, fat face radiated goodwill, just as his teeth blazed with alien gold. "'Welcome home!' cried the little man, with the air of one trying his second barrel upon a bird he has missed with his first. "'Welcome home!' he repeated. "'That's very kind of you,' said Smith, smiling in spite of himself at this little creature, who seemed to exude good will. "'But who's welcome, and to what home?' This question seemed to stagger at the little man. For nearly a minute he stood gazing at Smith. Then, removing his Panama, which was garnished by a narrow ribbon of red and black stripes, two red and one black, he mopped his thinly thatched head with his white silk handkerchief that gave off a strong odour of eau de cologne. "'You've not forgotten Jonathan Bluggs,' he cried at length. "'The one and only, no limit, pays on the tin tack. You haven't forgotten Bluggy, surely?' There was a note in his voice suggestive of anxiety, and Mr. Bluggs' right hand moved towards his left breast pocket a sinister hardness beginning to manifest itself at the corners of his mouth. "'No, I haven't forgotten you,' said Smith, on whom light was beginning to dawn. "'I knew it, old warrior,' cried Mr. Bluggs, with garish heartiness, his hand dropping from his breast pocket. "'I knew that Alfred the Greatest would remember the old horse that carried him over many a nasty water-jump.' "'I've not forgotten you,' continued Smith quietly. "'because I'm afraid I never knew you.' And he smiled with engaging simplicity. Mr. Bluggs stared at him in sheer bewilderment. Gradually the smile vanished from his face, the hardness at the corners of his mouth became emphasized, and his hand wandered once more in the direction of his breast-pocket. "'Here, come off of it,' Smith's eyes widened slightly. "'I heard that was the lay,' he continued aggressively, the sunshine of his smile vanishing leaving only a pasty complexion, a pair of little slit-like eyes, destitute of lashes, and a nose several sizes too large for the mouth it tried to peer into. "'I've heard all about that stunt, but it's not good enough for Johnny Bluggs.' "'Otherwise Bluggy,' murmured Smith. "'Bluggy be damned!' "'Let us take things in their correct chronological order,' smiled Smith. He was both interested and amused. Mr. Bluggs seemed nonplussed. Then, as if suddenly remembering something, he dived into his breast-pocket. Drawing out a letter-case, he selected a paper and thrust it towards Smith. "'What do you make of that?' he demanded. Smith took the paper and examined it curiously. "'It looks like a promissory note for four hundred and thirty-one pounds, six shillings and tuppence.' "'It's a copy. The original's at my banker's,' snapped Mr. Bluggs. "'I ain't a mug,' Smith raised his eyes from the note. "'No?' he queried. "'No, Mr. Bloomin' Alfred Warren. Haven't you got anything else to say?' he demanded, snatching back the note and replacing it in his letter-case. "'Nothing beyond the fact that I am not Mr. Alfred Warren, but Mr. James Smith. Incidentally, the note is, I believe, what is known in legal circles as statute barred.' Mr. Bluggs displayed more gold-filled teeth, but they were not the teeth of effusive welcome. It is dated February, seven years ago, continued Smith, and this is July. I— He was interrupted by a torrent of abuse from Mr. Bluggs. His face seemed even more puffy in its flushed than in its normal state of yellow. For a small man, his lung power was really remarkable, Smith decided, and the way in which his eyelids opened and shut fascinated him. 
In Mr. Bluck's oration there was much about what he had done for Alfred Warren, putting him on sure things on tick, and then to be served like this. He hinted darkly that it was in his power to contrive Alfred Warren's criminal prosecution for crimes that would rock the county with scandal for years to come. Not once did Mr. Bluggs repeat himself in his volume of denunciation, nor did he grow hoarse. Little points of foam gathered at the corners of his mouth, as if desirous of softening the hardness of the lines. Smith decided that Mr. Bluggs must be a practised speaker, probably to race-course crowds. "'Now I'm afraid I must be going,' said Smith, at length, just as Mr. Bluggs was telling how, only last month, he had got a man seven years." "'Not till you pay up, my beauty,' announced Mr. Bluggs, placing himself directly in Smith's path. "'Mr. Bluggs,' said Smith quietly, "'do you see that holly-bush?' He gazed towards a large clump of prickliness. Mr. Bluggs' eyes followed Smith's gaze, but he said nothing. "'If you don't go at once, I shall drop you right on the top of it, and holly hurts.' "'You wouldn't!' Mr. Bluggs was arrested in the midst of his defiance by something he saw in Smith's eyes. For several seconds he looked, then, turning on his heel, he walked down the drive, muttering curses and threats of what would happen when he saw his solicitor. "'I am beginning to feel a respect for Alfred Warren,' murmured Smith, as he followed the departing bookmaker. He probably realized the full the pitfalls of the prodigal who indiscreetly returns— Having seen Mr. Bluggs safely enter a two-seater, in which sat one whom Smith instinctively felt was not Mrs. Bluggs, and drive away, he turned in the opposite direction. After three cars had dashed past, leaving him to inhale the dust they raised and the exhausts they left, he decided that cross-country would be pleasanter walking. He had crossed two fields when suddenly he saw something that dismissed from his mind all thought of Mr. Jonathan Bluggs and Alfred Warren. Seated on a gate just ahead of him was Marjorie, her horse Nero standing beside her, his head resting against her arm. She was gazing over her shoulder in the opposite direction from that of Smith's approach. "'Good morning,' he said, lifting his cap and throwing away his cigarette. Marjorie started and nearly overbalanced. Recovering herself, she returned his greeting. At the sound of approaching footsteps, Nero had turned and stood regarding Smith with grave, speculative eyes. "'Well, old fellow,' said Smith, "'you look pretty fit.' As if gratified by the remark, Nero took a step towards him, arching his neck in a way that clearly invited the caress he most appreciated. "'He looks as if he could take anything there is,' remarked Smith, running a critical eye over Nero's delicate lines. "'Do you always ride cross-country?' he queried of Marjorie. "'Nero doesn't like the roads,' she replied, an almost imperceptible frown quivering about her eyebrows. "'He hates motors,' she added. Smith reached down to his nearest foreleg, Nero lifting it slightly as if in acknowledgment of a compliment, at the same time whinnying softly as if to himself. "'Nero!' she cried, as he endeavoured to insert his muzzle into the right-hand pocket of Smith's coat. He had already made Nero's acquaintance in his sumptuous loose-box, where he had ministered to his passion for sugar." I've just been having a little discussion with a gentleman known to his intimates as Bluggy, who insists that I owe him four hundred and thirty-one pounds, six shillings and tuppence, said Smith, as he stroked Nero's glossy neck. When I said that, like the village blacksmith, I owed not any man, he became melodramatic, and I had to threaten to toss him into a clump of holly before he realized the physical advantages of reticence. A look of interest sprang into Marjorie's eyes. Smith was encouraged. "'Nero, come here,' she called, as he proceeded to make further search for the bonanza he knew to be somewhere secreted about this sugar-man. "'Life in Little Bilstead seems rich in incident,' he said, smiling up at her. He was determined to ignore her coldness and indifference. "'It has not generally that reputation,' she said gravely. "'Possibly places are like people. We get from them what we most look for,' he suggested." "'And you look for incident?' The question seemed to spring to her lips in spite of herself. "'Don't you think I have reason?' he queried. She did not reply. She was angry with herself for asking the question. It was a direct encouragement to conversation. Why had she done it? She had decided time after time not to, 
and now she had deliberately promoted discussion. Personally, I should say that life here is intensely episodic, he continued. I think that is why I decided to stay on. Yes, she interrogated politely. Certainly she was the most puzzling girl to talk to. She slew each topic of conversation as it was born. That, and the vicarage hospitality, he continued. I'm rather like Bulldog Drummond. I require excitement. Another gap of silence followed, which Smith filled in by producing two more lumps of sugar. Nero fastened upon them in a flash. "'Eric seems to be looking forward to the cricket match,' he said presently, as he struggled to lift Nero's inquisitive nose from his left-hand pocket. Eric, he decided, was his last trench. "'Poor Eric,' she said softly, a slight smile fluttering the corners of her mouth. "'This is his third match, and he hasn't made a run yet.' "'But he will,' said Smith, determined to seize what really looked like a promising conversational opening. She shook her head with conviction. "'But haven't you anybody?' he asked, determined to keep to this promising subject. "'What about Dr. Crane?' "'He holds a bet as if it were a hockey-stick,' she said, and once more a seemingly fruitful topic lay slain. Feverishly he cast about him for someone or something to throw into the breach. Mentally he reviewed Willis, Mrs. Hicks, the vicar, young Nudd, and old Simmons. All seemed destitute of those qualities upon which ideas are exchanged. Furthermore, they were so intimately associated with what he was anxious to avoid, the departure or the return of Alfred Warren. The breach was due to Marjorie having suddenly realized that she was engaged in doing the very thing she had vowed never to do, not even to please Lady Warren. She was talking as a friend might talk to the man whose life outraged all her ideals of what a man should be. Twice in the space of a few minutes she had broken faith with herself. Yet she had asked Eric to see as little as possible of the very person she was "'I think Nero has had as much sugar as is good for him,' she said, with an iciness that would have chilled the garrulousness of Pepys himself. Smith realized that it was the closure, the guillotine. Even Nero lifted an inquiring head from the investigation of Smith's pockets, as if struck by something strange in his beloved mistress's voice. A small brown hand stretched out and caressed the burnished arch of his neck, and he knew that he was not the cause. It must be the sugar man, he decided. Smith realized that he had no alternative but to lift his cap and pass on. Nero, however, did not share his mistress' views upon this newcomer's undesirability. He knew nothing of prodigals, although he possessed a vast knowledge of men. Those, for instance, who carried in either pocket of their coats a handful of what to Nero were white cubes of unalloyed bliss, he knew to be in every way desirable, whilst those who did not, well, they didn't count. As Smith strode off, Nero took a hesitating step after him. "'Nero!' she cried sharply. "'Come here!' And Nero turned on a reluctant hoof. "'I'm ashamed of you!' Nero turned his large, expressive eyes upon his mistress. There was in her tone something that caused him concern. After all, it was he who had done it, apparently, and not the sugar man. Yet he stretched out his head towards her, but she drew back. His worst forebodings were confirmed. He took a half-step in her direction, for, with good oats and kind words, she constituted his world. With sugar, of course. "'No, Nero, I'm not going to forgive you,' she said, leaning her body away from him and emphasizing the supple lines of her young figure. "'You know he isn't nice,' she continued presently. "'Yet—' she broke off. Nero gazed at her with large, liquid eyes full of anxious concern. The arch of his glossy neck became less marked, and his head drooped. He recognized that the trouble was serious, and he was a master of subtlety and tact. "'You know as well as I do,' continued Marjorie, "'that he isn't nice. Now don't you?' There was challenge in her look, and Nero's large, sad eyes became larger and sadder, and his head drooped still further. "'Yet,' she continued, "'you behave as if he were a great friend, as if I liked him.' She gazed away towards where a pine-wood seemed to rear its delicate crests 
into the white-flecked summer sky. "'Now don't you?' Her eyes were still on the pine wood, and a dreamy look had crept into them. For some minutes she continued gazing, apparently at the wood, Nero watching her with speculative and mournful brown eyes. Presently he raised a tentative hoof. Then he waited. Without a sound the hoof came to earth again, a good eight inches nearer Marjorie. Another hoof followed, and another. He was determined not to hasten matters. He had known such crises before, and they required handling with the utmost delicacy and tact. He understood the art of sympathetic self-effacement. Marjorie continued to gaze into the wonderland of her own thoughts. Presently something soft as velvet touched her cheek, and a moment later a humble muzzle was resting lightly on her shoulder. The small brown hand was raised, and, as Nero felt its gentle touch, he knew that, however heinous his crime, he was forgiven, and the proud arch returned to his silky neck. "'Can people really change like that, Nero?' she murmured musingly continuing to fondle the head resting upon her shoulder. He turned his eyes towards her, so that the whites became visible, and nuzzled against her cheek. "'Of course they can't,' she cried a moment later. "'You know very well they can't, Nero. Only being a man you won't say so.' And she laughed lightly. The dreamy look had gone from her eyes, and the determined little chin had once more resumed its customary tilt of decision. "'Now for a real old gallop,' she cried gaily. Hell for leather! Nero whinnied his relief. Hush, Nero, she murmured a moment later. You mustn't say such things. And Nero bravely assumed the responsibility with another whinny of joy as she slipped into the saddle. A few minutes later, Smith saw them careering over the countryside, taking everything that came, and taking it well. End of chapter 13《ラプトフォーティーン》of the Return of Alfred by Herbert George Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter fourteen. Smith becomes a popular hero. You're sure you finished both your sermons for Sunday, John? Quite sure, Hannah," replied the vicar meekly. And there's nothing about cricket in them," inquired Miss Lipscombe, the lines at the corners of her mouth deepening. "'Nothing at all, Hannah,' he replied with the air of a child being put through its catechism. "'Then I think you may go,' she said, and the vicar passed down the drive, overtaking Smith at the gate. The vicar's first thought that morning had been the weather and its probable effect upon the wicket. He had thought of little else than cricket for the past week, and it was with a sigh of content that he had seen, from his bedroom window, the sun climbing a cloudless sky." As they walked towards the cricket field, Smith was acutely conscious of his newly acquired gent's superfine unshrinkable flans, as his trousers had been officially labelled. He had carefully preserved the ticket in his pocket-book. It was obviously a document for the family muniment chest. He was engaged in speculating as to where reach-me-down outfitters recruited their models of British manhood, when a turn in the road brought them in sight of the field of play. Already it was deeply fringed with spectators. The vicar quickened his steps, as if eager that his body should be where his heart obviously was. Greeted right and left, they passed through the gate. Everybody was light-hearted and prepared for enjoyment. Festivity was in the air, and laughter sprang readily to lips already curved to its call. The shrill cries of the girls and the hoarse shouts of the men testified to the roughness of the jests whilst the mellow crack of bat hitting ball was heard from all parts of the field as the players strove feverishly to get themselves into form there flashed into the vicar's eyes a look that was new to smith it was suggestive of a war-horse that once more sends battle as they made their way across the field smith was conscious of many curious glances and whisperings from the groups they passed the words mr alfred being clearly identifiable Vehicles were still arriving, accommodation having been provided for them in a neighbouring meadow, where the horses were turned loose to graze. They, too, would enjoy the day. Late arrivals hurried through the gates, laden with baskets and hampers. There was much good-humoured badinage. 
Little Bilstead and Upper Sexton were out to enjoy themselves. Round the scorer's tent had been roped off a sort of enclosure. Here, in little groups, the society of the neighbourhood exchanged ideas and talked scandal. "'I regard it as infamous,' were the first words that greeted Smith's ears as he followed the vicar past the guardian of the social holy of holies. "'I've told Postle what I think, and I shall—' Suddenly the voice stopped. Colonel Enderby had caught sight of Smith and the vicar. An atmosphere of gala was indelibly stamped upon the gallant colonel's clothing. Above a pair of flannel trousers, yellow with age, was a shrunken Zingari blazer made for a much shorter man, and above this, again, was an ancient Panama hat. As the vicar exchanged greetings with those about him, he seemed to have been metamorphosed. His habitual air of absent-mindedness had vanished, and in his heart was the enthusiasm of a keen cricketer. "'They've only got two new fellows, both sloggers,' cried Eric, dashing up to them. "'We've jolly well got to lick them to a frass, haven't we, sir?' He appealed to the vicar, who shook his head doubtfully. "'I fear I have been in remiss in not—in not—' He paused. It was habitual with the Reverend John Lipscomb to settle himself with responsibilities that were not rightly his. He and Eric soon became involved in a technical discussion upon the relative merits of Little Bilstead batting and Upper Saxton bowling. As they did not seem to require his assistance, Smith continued to look about him. He caught a glimpse of Miss Jell rising out of a pyramid of lavender flounces, whilst Miss Mary Jell looked like an anachronism in a white muslin frock sprinkled with yellow daisies and small green leaves. As they became aware of Smith's gaze, Miss Mary dropped her eyes whilst her sister bowed stiffly and opened her parasol, also flounced, as if Smith were a bull. Mr. Marshall and his daughter were talking to Mrs. Crane. The Marshalls were always early arrivals. For Mr. Marshall the cricket match was a field day. Everybody brought something in the way of food and drink, even those whose homes were near the field of play, whilst those who lived at a distance brought luncheon hampers, which to him were veritable cornucopias. Mr. Marshall had been known to pick up as many as two luncheons and three teas at one cricket match, to say nothing of oddments in between, such as fruit, cake, and lemonade. On such occasions the evening meal of the Marshalls was a comparatively trifling affair. Smith noticed that Mr. Marshall wore a pair of white drill trousers with a large brown stain above the right knee. Where these ancient garments had first seen light, or how Mr. Marshall had acquired them, was a matter of speculation in Little Bilstead, but all agreed that they were not English, and in consequence to be regarded with suspicion. The brown stain above the right knee, however, was known to belong exclusively to Mr. Marshall who had chosen the night of one of the annual cricket matches to upset the inkstand. Mrs. Spellman had created a mild sensation by appearing with a new tock, from the folds of which coyly peeped out a small white tip, for as far back as the best memory could carry, Mrs. Spellman had gone through life with two tips. The addition of a third was something in the nature of a sartorial event. All knew that as the years rolled on, this tip would be cleaned a few times, then it would pass through the whole rainbow of colours, deepening in tint with each plunge into the dye-tub, until at length it would, in all probability, emerge black, that is to say, if Mrs. Spellman were blessed with sufficient length of years. Mrs. Truspitt Green had disinterred a white lace frock of another historical period which clung to her as if shy of an age in which it knew it had no right to exist. A black lace hat flopped over her eyes, rendering necessary a continual tossing of her head as if she were some high-spirited charger. Smith was recalled from his contemplation of the pomp and fashion of Little Bilstead by Eric offering to bowl if he would care to have a knock. He shook his head. He was far too interested in what was going on about him apart from which he did not wish to disillusion Eric, who, by his patronizing manner, made it clear that, whatever he may have said to Marjorie, he was convinced that the prod was a rabbit. As Eric was in second wicket down, he decided that without further practice, he had already had two lengthy periods that morning, he was in danger of growing stale, and, with a nod, he buzzed off, as he phrased it. 
Smith saw Willis and Mrs. Higgs talking to Marjorie, and, fearful of Mrs. Higgs's demonstrativeness and of her nursery recollections, he took up a strategical position behind the vicar. Presently he became aware that Marjorie was approaching, accompanied by Miss Lipscombe. She greeted the vicar cordially, but when she turned to Smith, the studied calm and self-possession which he found so irritating reasserted itself. "'Have you come to see little Bilsett win?' he inquired. "'Oh, do you think we shall?' In a flash her whole expression changed. Her eyes shone with excitement, and she clasped her hands together in her eagerness. For the space of a second Smith saw the real Marjorie. Then once more the mask descended, and she became the girl in whom dislike was veiled by good breeding. "'We'll have a jolly good try, anyway,' he said grimly. A new idea had just taken possession of him. If he could materially assist little Bilsett in vanquishing their hated rivals, there might be a chance of earning at least her toleration for himself, quite apart from the sweetening process to which he was committed. Furthermore, it should go a long way to disprove the claim that he was Alfred Warren. A man could not learn cricket by means of a pelment course. "'I hope you will win,' she said. "'Eric is very keen on it.' And with that she turned to the vicar. Suddenly a hush fell upon the field, and Smith saw the two captains tossing for innings. He observed a look of relief on the home captain's features as the two men straightened themselves from gazing at the penny lying on the ground. "'That means that they take first knock,' murmured the vicar. In local cricket circles there were two traditions that dominated all others. The first was that whoever won the toss should put his opponent in first, irrespective of the state of the wicket. The other was that to be deputed as long-stop was to suffer unthinkable humiliation. To have suggested to Yardley, the little Bilstead captain, that he should take first innings would have surprised him no less than a proposal that he should play in a fur-lined overcoat. The news that Dick Yardley had won the toss spread round the ground like a flash. Little Bilstead was delighted. Cries of, "'Well done, boy!' and Good old Dick! rang across the turf, as if the winning of the toss were due to skill rather than chance. Slowly the members of the home team dribbled into the field. First of all came the bowlers, who, taking a stump from either wicket, placed them some two yards off the pitch, and proceeded to send down practice balls. Smith watched this ritual with interest. In the matter of dress, the little Bilstead team presented a motley appearance. Some wore dark trousers and white flannel shirts, others white trousers and dark shirts, some sported collars and waistcoats, others waistcoats without collars. In headgear they were as nondescript as in other articles of attire, soft hats and cloth caps being mostly in evidence, whilst a little man with a heavy moustache sported a bowler. One man seemed to have combined the seasons in his person, for above his white flannel trousers he wore a blue and orange football shirt, and the heavy wintriness of his boots was mitigated by the summer lightness of his straw hat. Several of the players had their trousers suspended by braces instead of belts, and one had elected to do battle in white running shorts. With misgiving, Smith watched the little bilstead bowlers as they sent down ball after ball. It was poor stuff of dubious length, although fairly accurate in direction. At the sight of the white-clothed umpires walking slowly towards the centre of the field, the two stumps were replaced, and Yardley began distributing his men to their appointed positions, a thing that required much shouting and waving of his right hand. The umpires placed the bales upon the wickets, took up their positions, and waited. All eyes were now turned expectantly towards the scoring tent, round which were grouped the upper sexton players. Presently, two detached themselves from the remainder and walked slowly towards the centre of the field. "'Man in!' was the cry, repeated by half a dozen voices. The hour of drama was at hand. Looking painfully nervous and self-conscious, the two batsmen walked slowly towards the wickets. One, a tall, cadaverous man with unshaven chin, who wore a brown pad on his left leg, the other a short, burly fellow with two white skeleton pads over black trousers. Amidst the hush of excitement, the man with the skeleton pads took guard, and then, assuming an attitude entirely devoid of ease or grace, gazed straight in front of him. The umpire gave the word, the bowler took a run, the spectators ceased to breathe, and the first ball of the match was bowled, 
a half volley, six inches outside the off-stump. It was, however, the first ball of the match, and as such had to be treated with respect. The batsman played it stiffly, and returned to his original position. At the end of three overs, each man appeared satisfied that he had played himself in, thus paying tribute to convention, and the strained and awkward set of their bodies relaxed. The man with the skeleton pads opened the scoring by pulling a woefully short ball to the boundary, this to the intense joy of the upper Saxtonians. When he repeated the stroke off the next ball, the yells of delight were deafening, but when he treated yet another ball in the same way, upper Saxton became almost hysterical with joy. For them the match was already as good as won. With the score at twenty, Brown Pad skied a ball behind the wicket-keeper. Smith ran in from long leg, and P.C. Postle ran back, hesitated, then, with a roar of, "'I've got her!' he lunged forward. The next the crowd saw was P.C. Postle sitting on the grass, rubbing an injured shoulder and abusing Smith roundly for spoiling his catch. The crowd roared, Upper Saxton with delight, Little Bilsett with anger. Later they joined together in derision of Mr. Alfred, whom they held responsible for the collision. From then on Smith became the butt of every would-be humorist. Each time he fielded the ball he was the recipient of loud and ironical cheers. If it was skied, no matter in what direction, Little Bilsett players were exhorted to, "'Let Mr. Alfred have it!' Little Bilsett remembered it against Alfred Warren that in the past he had never sought to dissimulate his contempt for field sports. They saw in his turning out with the home team a deliberate effort to curry public favour, and they made no effort to disguise their contempt. The score mounted rapidly, and the man with the brown pad quickly getting going. His specialty was leg hits. He waited patiently until the ball came on the leg side, then he promptly whacked it round to the boundary. The little bilsted bowling grew erratic, and the wicket-keeper became demoralised and loudly reproached the bowlers. By after by was scored, until, after a whispered conversation with Yardley, Smith displaced Longstop, with the result that one source of revenue was cut off from the Upper Saxton scoring sheet. The crowd regarded Smith's new position as a rebuke, and said so. Fifty was hoisted without the loss of a wicket, and pandemonium broke out. At sixty-three, Brown Pet skied a ball directly over the wicket-keeper's head, and was caught. He returned to the enclosure with the proud knowledge that he had scored twenty-three towards victory. The next man in was the Upper Saxton doctor, who possessed several distinct strokes. He was a man of care and caution, as befitted his calling, but skeleton pads continued to pull merrily, playing every unacademic stroke he possessed. Change after change was tried in the bowling, which appeared to be tied in a very ugly knot. The sentry was signalled, and Upper Saxton drank more beer and shouted more hoarsely. From all round the ground cheers and advice were offered to the little Bilsett players. There was neither silence nor dignity about Upper Saxton in the hour of victory. If the wicket-keeper missed a ball, he was told to get a bag, or offered the loan of a hat. There was, among the Upper Saxon supporters, one man possessed of a voice of great power and volume. He was evidently regarded as the supreme wit of the assembly. Time after time he boomed his sarcasms, or mock sympathy, and he was particularly severe upon Mr. Alfred. "'I say, Bor," he cried at last to Yardley, "'why don't you put Mr. Alfred on?' A yell of joyous laughter burst from the Upper Saxon supporters. They remembered the missed catch although the memory was dimmed somewhat by the excellent ground-fielding of Smith at Longstop. Yells from Mr. Alfred came from all over the field. The suggestion had gripped hold of the general imagination. For a moment Yardley seemed to hesitate, his brow corrugated with the worry of impending defeat. The advice had come just as the last ball of the over was being bowled. When the umpire called, Over! Smith walked across to Yardley. They exchanged a few words, and then, to the surprise of everyone, they were seen making for the bowler's wicket. Here, with hand and voice, Yardley began to rearrange the field as directed by Smith. In their astonishment at what was taking place, the spectators forgot to shout and jeer. Man after man was placed behind the batsman wicket, short slip, long slip, cover slip, third man, extra third man, and, most amazing of all, Yardley himself went long stop, and Yardley, as everybody knew, was the best field in Little Bilstead. When eventually it was seen that only two men besides the bowler were in front of the batsman, the cries of derision burst out again with redoubled force. 
"'They're all going the same way home,' cried one. "'They've given up trying,' said another. "'He's going to bowl for catches,' ventured the third. Never before had Miss Alfred bowled in the annual cricket match, and all were prepared for comedy, if not absolute farce. They watched eagerly for the conventional ball to be bowled to the wicket-keeper at the side of the pitch. With something akin to astonishment, they realized that Miss Alfred intended to dispense with this preliminary, and the Upper Saxton supporters were reassured, knowing that no bowler worthy of his salt could afford to dispense with this time-honored precaution against an erratic first ball. Had not Armstrong himself hallowed the custom, and in a test match, too? In the enclosure the excitement was no less great than around the ground, although less energetically expressed. In the centre of the vicar's pale cheeks were two carmine spots, giving him the appearance of having been rouged. He was breathing in little sobs, and Miss Lipscombe was watching him anxiously. He read Smith's placing of the field, as Belshazzar of old had read the writing on the wall. Marjorie's lower lip had disappeared, gripped by a row of very small and very white teeth. Miss Mary Jell wanted to cry, whereas Mrs. Spellman felt she must shriek. Three times Miss Jell opened and closed her sunshade, the third time tipping Colonel Enderby's Panama over his eyes and an exclamation from his lips. Miss Marshall felt sick. It was a weakness which, as a child, had caused her to receive few invitations to parties, and never twice to the same house. Never had Little Bilstead society found self-control so difficult to preserve. An uncanny silence descended upon the crowd. Slowly Smith walked some eight paces beyond the wicket, whilst the spectators held their breath. Then something seemed to happen. Without a pause he span round and appeared to shoot towards the wicket. There was a sharp click. P.C. Postle fell over backwards, and the man with the skeleton pads stood regarding his middle stump, where no middle stump should be, some nine yards from its fellows, whilst Smith was walking slowly back to the bowler's wicket. For a moment the crowd seemed to have lost the power of speech. Into the vicar's throat there sprang something that caused him to swallow hurriedly. The Miss Gels looked at one another, interrogation in their eyes. Colonel Enderby swore, whilst Mr. Marshall, who had paused in the act of biting an egg and cress sandwich, gazed at the broken wicket, a fringe of green threads dangling from his lower lip. Then pandemonium broke out. Yells, cries, and catcalls sounded from all over the field. Yardley smiled for the first time during the last hour. "'You're out!' cried the umpire to the man with the skeleton pads, as if to remove from his mind any lingering doubt that might lurk there. Having apparently concluded his contemplation of the errant middle stump, skeleton pads slowly turned and walked towards the scoring tent, whilst members of the little Bilstead team grouped themselves round Smith. "'Well done, Mr. Alfred.' "'Well done, Boar. "'Has anyone seen the middle stump?' Cries echoed and re-echoed from all parts of the field. Little Bilstead was coming into its own. The man with the booming voice, who had advised the putting on of Mr. Alfred to bowl, now became the centre of virulent reproach from the supporters of Upper Saxton. From the direction of the scoring tent, the new batsman moved reluctantly towards the wicket, which had been bestowed. It was easy to see that he was a beaten man even before he reached the field of battle. Cries of, "'Man in!' were raised, and, amid booms of derision and counter-hoots of delight, the little Bilstead team resumed their positions. The umpire gave guard to a quaking little batsman who seemed to wish himself anywhere but where he was. Smith again walked his eight slow, deliberate steps beyond the wicket, span round, and hurled towards the terrified batsman. At the sight of Smith tearing towards him, the little man shut his eyes and withdrew his body as much as possible from the bat. Click! This time the wicket-keeper did not fall over. He dodged. Without so much as a glance at his demolished stumps, the new batsman trotted placidly towards the scoring tent, thankful that his limbs were intact. Once more little Bilstead gave full voice to its enthusiasm. Men laughed and shouted. Girls shrilled and capered, whilst anyone who was fortunate to possess an instrument capable of producing a noise either blew, struck, or rattled it to the stretch of his powers. One man with a bugle went almost purple in the face through striving to combine the more potent qualities of the reveille with the last post. In the enclosure the excitement was almost as great, 
although continuing to manifest itself with more restraint and decorum, for social Little Bilstead was social Little Bilstead through and through. Miss Jell clapped her lace-gloved hands several times with Victorian refinement, whilst Miss Mary, with flushed cheeks and eyes unusually bright, struck her palms together until they ached. Mrs. Spellman's new talk had taken a pronounced list to starboard as a result of her enthusiasm, and even Mrs. Truspitt Green had softened in the hour of what all regarded as an approaching triumph for little Bilstead, for she had compromised with fashion by tilting back her hat to the extent of enabling her to obtain an uninterrupted view of the game without those constant tossings which made her head ache. Marjorie sat with hands clasped and shining eyes, her lips slightly parted. The dramatic change in the fortunes of little Bilstead had thrilled her. At that moment, with all the casuistry of a woman, she had either forgotten or forgiven the delinquencies of the man in the triumph of the cricketer. Splendid! Splendid! murmured the vicar, as he sat with his delicate blue-veined hands clasped above his walking-stick. I suspected it, he murmured. I suspected it. Colonel Enderby scowled and muttered to himself. He had endeavoured to engage Mr. Marshall in an anti-hero-worship campaign, but Mr. Marshall was in the process of realising that in supreme moments human nature is incapable of realising more than one sense at a time. Everywhere about him lay eatables and drink that were good to the palate, but there were none to ask him to partake. All eyes were riveted upon the cricket pitch, all eyes, that is, except those of Mr. Marshall, which roved from basket to neglected basket. Eric Stannard could not resist the hand-wave to Marjorie, followed by a little caper of ecstasy. There are emotional flaws even in the social armour of the public schoolboy. The incoming batsman managed to put off the evil moment by keeping his bat rigidly in the hole he had dug for it, but the next ball seemed to get round the bat. In any case, his off-stump was sent somersaulting out of the ground. When the over was completed, Smith's analysis read three wickets for no runs. So demoralised had the upper Saxton batting become that only two runs were scored from the bowler at the other end, who had hitherto been unmercifully punished. In his next three overs, Smith concluded the upper Saxton innings, the total being 126. As the last wicket fell, the excitement of the little Bilstead supporters could not be restrained. Like a football crowd dissatisfied with the umpire's decision, they streamed across the field, shouting and yelling, whilst from all sides came the cry, "'Good on you, Mr. Alfred! Give him kosh!' With difficulty, Smith made his way through the crowd, receiving congratulations in the form of handshakes, blows upon the back, and shouts in his ear. Little Bilstead was pleased with itself and its hero. At length he forced a passage through the cheering mass, and sought shelter in the neighbourhood of the scorer's tent. Here he found Marjorie, the vicar, and Eric. "'Here he is!' cried Eric. Smith was startled at the change in Marjorie. Her cheeks were slightly flushed, and her eyes were dancing with excitement. If she had been beautiful before, he decided, she was ravishing now in her white frock and the large straw hat that shaded her face. For the first time she smiled up at him, and that smile definitely sealed the fate of Upper Sexton. "'Splendid!' murmured the vicar, in a husky voice, as he gripped Smith's hand. "'Splendid! I've never seen finer bowling in my life. What do you think of it, Yardley?' he inquired, as he beamed upon the captain of Little Bilstead, who had approached the group. "'Wouldn't Miss Alfred captain the team, sir?' he inquired, looking anxiously towards Smith. "'No, no, Yardley,' said Smith. "'You've done very well, and you're going to show us how to beat them.' Yardley shook his head despondently. He knew the strength of the upper Saxon bowling. "'Will you go in first, sir?' he inquired. "'No, put me down third or fourth wicket down, Yardley. That'll do,' said Smith. "'Wouldn't it be better to go in a little earlier?' suggested the vicar, as Yardley made his way through the throng. "'We've got a very bad tale,' he added. "'So I hear,' smiled Smith, "'like an English test team. "'No, leave me where I said.' Luncheon was taken at the conclusion of the Upper Saxon innings. All round the ground people seated themselves in little groups, and proceeded to unpack parcels and hampers, which mostly took the form of cardboard boxes, string bags, or small Japanese baskets. 
From Miss Lipscombe, Smith had learned that the luncheon was looked upon by the players as by no means the least important item in the day's proceedings. The match had originated as a half-day affair, but the vicar had thought it would be more pleasant to make a whole-day match of it, and when played at Little Bilsett, he had undertaken to entertain the rival teams at luncheon, which was served in a marquee erected on the field. The first whole-day match had been fraught with disastrous results as far as sport was concerned. The vicar had generously provided wine and beer at luncheon, with the result that the subsequent cricket deteriorated to such a degree that the match had ended in a draw, from the sheer inability of the players to continue. For one thing, the umpires, mellowed by some extremely good port, had refused to give any one out, exhorting the fielding side to give him another chance together, a circumstance which had seriously compromised the interest of the game. From that day on, only temperance drinks were provided. Miss Lipscombe had seen to that, and care was taken that the vines should be light in character, lest the umpires be tempted to sleep at their posts. For the next hour, the crowd, unconstrained by any such responsibility as that resting on the players, feasted joyously, pledging one another in beer and cider, and, above all, pledging the return of the prodigal, Miss Alfred. There was some wonder at this sudden transformation of one who had always been something of a joke in the matter of sport. But there was no time for analysis. A few of the more thoughtful, however, were inclined to accept Smith's statement that he was not Alfred Warren, and the few were those who knew that cricketers are not made. When at length a movement was observed at the entrance of the tent, a murmur of, "'Here they come!' ran from mouth to mouth. Baskets and bags were repacked, bottles thrown over hatches, crumbs dusted from clothes, and all prepared themselves for what they were convinced would be an afternoon of intense excitement. The same preliminaries were gone through as had heralded the Upper Saxton innings. Smith stood by the vicar, watching the Upper Saxtonians getting themselves into form at the ball. "'That,' said the vicar, pointing out a man with black leather boots, white flannel trousers, a waistcoat, and a collar and tie, is Marsh. He is a grievous thorn in our flesh.' At that moment Marsh delivered a ball which lifted the single stump out of the ground to the obvious delight of the Upper Saxton supporters. "'Good length,' remarked Smith. "'Yes,' murmured the vicar despondently, as if recalling past tragedies. "'A determined man, but easily flurried. Resistance seems to excite him, and he gets woefully short.' Smith made a mental note of Marsh's limitations. The opening of the little Bilstead innings was almost as sensational as the close of that of Upper Saxton. With his first ball, Marsh made a sorry mess of the wicket of Herbert Painter, the steadiest bet in the little Bilstead team. Three balls later he caught and bowled P.C. Possel. With the last ball of the over, Marsh spread-eagled Eric's wicket. Thus three wickets were down and no runs. From the other end, Yardley, who had gone in first, viewed with consternation the downfall of his stalwarts. The upper Saxton portion of the crowd had entirely regained its good humour and high spirits. Victory, they now felt, was assured. The man with the booming voice once more gave tongue with comment and criticism. The ecstasy of the little Bilstead faction had died down to murmurs of apprehension. Some saw the certainty of a single innings defeat. Others wondered if it would be possible to play out time. "'Why don't you send Mr. Alfred in?' boomed the upper Saxton critic and, as if in answer to the suggestion, Smith was seen walking slowly towards the wicket. As if by magic, the spirits of the little Bilstead supporters rose, and they cheered their champion to the echo. As he approached the wicket, adjusting his gloves, Yardley came to meet him. For a moment the two walked side by side in conversation, then they parted to take up their respective positions. As Yardley took guard, a breathless hush seemed to descend upon the field, Every movement of the players was watched with feverish anxiety. The vicar found it impossible to keep his hands still. Colonel Enderby played with the bottom button of his Zingari blazer until Miss Jell felt that she must grip his hand to keep him quiet. Marjorie gazed at the nondescript group of men with strained and shining eyes. In the hearts of all there was a dread of disaster. The bowler walked from the wicket and took a short run, there was a mellow sound of leather hitting wood, and little Bilstead drew its breath again. 
Yardley had played the ball with a straight and determined bat. The second and third he treated in the same manner, the fourth he placed between cover point and mid-off, opening the score with a two. The little Bilstead supporters opened their throats with encouraging shouts, convinced that the rot had been stopped. Yardley played the last two balls of the over in steady and confident style. The dramatic moment of the match had arrived. How would Miss Alfred shape before Dick Marsh? was the question all were asking themselves. Very deliberately, Smith glanced round to see how the field was placed. Walking some three yards up the pitch, he removed a small piece of turf that had been kicked up by Yardley's heavy heel. "'Don't you worry, Mr. Alfred,' boomed the voice of the upper sexton critic. "'You won't be there long, Bor.' As Marsh took his run, there was a quick indrawing of breath among the spectators. The ball left the bowler's hand and, a moment later, passed low on the ground to the right of cover point. "'Run!' yelled the crowd, but Smith's warning left hand was raised, and Yardley returned to his crease. Smith was not going to take the risk of putting Yardley up against Marsh. The second and third balls he placed in exactly the same position as the first. Marsh altered the position of cover point, with the result that the next ball passed over the spot from which cover point had been removed. Marsh motioned cover point back to his original position. The fifth ball Smith treated as he had treated the first three. The crowd began to laugh. A frown settled upon Marsh's features. The last ball of the over also passed to the right of cover point, and Smith's hand beckoned the expected Yardley. A shout of laughter broke from the little Bilstead spectators. Miss Alfred's strategy had become clear to all. They were too excited to marvel at what was taking place. "'Another over like that,' murmured the vicar, unsteadily, to Marjorie. "'And Marsh will go to pieces. Beautiful placing,' he murmured. Marjorie gave him a swift little smile, and her eyes returned to the players. Smith took guard at the other end, and once more looked deliberately round the field. The new bowler appeared uncomfortable. Mentally he was arguing that if the batsman could do what he liked with Marsh, what was to happen to him? Smith soon removed any doubt from his mind by driving him hard to the off-boundary, just past cover point. Marsh brought mid-on over to extra cover point. The next ball was sent at express speed directly over the spot that mid-on had vacated, and two runs were scored. The little Bilstead crowd roared its delight. The comedy taking place before them they appreciated to its full extent. When Marsh motioned mid-on back to his original position, they shouted their derision. The bowler became nervous. As if to complete his demoralization, Smith lifted his next ball clean out of the field, amidst a perfect tornado of applause. From the last ball of the over he scored a single. Again the spectators held their breath. Once more the champions were opposed. Four times Smith drove the ball just out of cover point's reach, but refused to run. The fifth ball of the over was short. He drove it hard to the boundary. From the sixth he took a single. The score had now reached twenty for three wickets. "'I think that settles Marsh,' said the vicar, with a sigh of content. To Yardley's face there had returned the good-humoured smile it habitually wore. He felt that little Bilsett still possessed a sporting chance. From the next over Smith gathered sixteen runs, and from Marsh's third over nine. The hopes of the home supporters ran high. Slowly the score mounted. Fifty, sixty, seventy. Yardley was doing his share now, and the two men were running every short run they could possibly gather, demoralizing the fielding side into wild returns and consequent overthrows. Change after change was tried in the bowling. Marsh crossed to the other end, but still the score mounted. At eighty-five, Yardley failed properly to get hold of a ball and was caught by mid-off, having played a patient and valuable innings of fourteen. As he returned to the scoring tent, many of the spectators streamed out to meet him, and with much patting on the back and congratulation he was escorted back to where the other members of the team were grouped. Forty-two to win,' muttered the vicar, and a tale like nothing in wisdom. "'We shall do it,' cried Marjorie. "'I know we shall. We must!' but the vicar shook a doubtful head. Throwing down his bat, Yardley proceeded to give careful and elaborate instructions to the ingoing batsman, with the result that he reduced him to a pathetic state of nervousness. He was a man on whose shoulders the fate of empires was never intended to rest. After one ball from Marsh he returned with a silly grin upon his face, 
and in his ears the shouts of jubilation of Upper Saxton. With successive balls, Marsh dismissed two more of his opponents, thus performing the hat-trick and disproving the vicar's prophecy. Dr. Crane was one of his victims. Smith decided that he handled a bat less like a hockey-stick than a scythe. Eighty-five for seven. Shouts echoed from all parts of the field. He of the booming voice seemed to awaken as from a long slumber. Upper Saxton had taken heart. Victory seemed once more within its grasp. "'If you get bowl first ball, I'll punch your head!' cried Yardley tensely to Tom Bassingthwaite, the postman. Thus fortified, Tom Bassingthwaite made his way to the field of glory. He was not of a bellicose disposition, but there had been in his skipper's voice that which carried conviction. He proceeded to the wicket at an ambling trot, as if anxious to get through the ordeal as quickly as possible. Having taken guard, he gazed before him as one hypnotized. He saw Dick Marsh turn away and walk from him. A moment later the ball seemed to be hurtling through the air towards him, as if bent on his destruction. With Yardley's threat still ringing in his ears, Tom Bassingthwaite kept his bat rigidly pressed to the ground. The ball hit the outer edge and went off at a tangent well out of reach of short slip. The batsman stood looking stupidly in the direction taken by the ball. He was awakened to realities by a yell from Smith, bidding him run. He ran. It was not until he was back at his own crease that he realized he had scored two. Over! Little Bilstead breathed again, now that Smith had the bowling. The first ball, a half volley, he lifted clean out of the ground. The second he placed round to leg for four. The third he drove for a like number. The fourth he lifted over the bowler's head to the boundary. The fifth ball he left alone, and the sixth he drove to the on for an easy one. For some reason best known to himself, Bassingthwaite hesitated. Then, starting to run, he crossed Smith, turned, and doubled back to his own crease like a frightened rabbit. "'Get back, you silly ass!' roared Smith. But nothing could persuade the little man to forsake his own crease, for was not the ball on its way to the other wicket? A roar of triumph went up as the wicket-keeper whipped off the bales, many thinking that it was Smith who had been run out. The cheers subsided when they saw Bassingthwaite walking dejectedly towards the scoring tent, to be met halfway by Yardley, who, with passionate and intimidating movement, was conveying to the unhappy man his views upon fools and numbskulls. "'One hundred and five for eight wickets! We shall never do it!' murmured the vicar. The two last men can never stand six balls from Marsh. Smith walked towards the incoming batsman. Now listen, he murmured, on reaching his side. When I beckon, you run. Don't stop to think, but run like hell. If you don't, I'll... I'll kill you. And with that, he turned on his heel and walked back to his own wicket. The new man, Charlie Jackson, an inoffensive little man who acted as odd man to any and everybody in Little Bilstead, had watched with admiration Bassingthwaite's strategy, and had determined to emulate it. With figure braced and bat held firmly to the ground, he waited the onset of the first ball. It struck the bat full in the centre, and rebounded halfway up the pitch. From his self-gratulation he was roused by a terrific yell to run. He ran, blindly and madly. Marsh and the wicket-keeper also ran, likewise point, cover-point, and mid-on. Suddenly, in the middle of the pitch, there seemed to be a crowd of players, but Jackson had scored a run, and Smith had got the bowling. A roar passed round the ground like a cyclone. For one short moment, Charlie Jackson had become a hero. Smith's face had lost the tenseness that had characterized it during the previous few minutes, and he proceeded to prove conclusively that, if the game were won, it would be through that single scored by Charlie Jackson. Three fours and a one brought the score up to 119. As the players changed over, the excitement became almost intolerable. Marsh was again the bowler. He was very white, and the perspiration stood out in little beads upon his forehead. "'Give him cosh, boar! boomed the Upper Saxon supporter with a megaphone voice as Marsh walked from the wicket. Ball after ball Smith played with care and respect. The fourth, however, was short, and he drove it to the on for two, bringing the score to 121. The spectators held their breath. The next ball also yielded two. Marsh gathered himself together for a final effort. If he could prevent Smith from scoring, there was still a chance for Upper Saxton to win. 
In an endeavour to get additional pace on the ball, he added a yard to his run. The ball pitched short. There was a sharp crack, a terrific yell, and Marsh knew that Smith had scored a boundary and won the match. Then the crowd seemed to go mad. Men yelled, girls danced, fights broke out. The next over accounted for the two remaining batsmen. Little Bilstead had won by a single run. At the click which told of the fall of the last wicket, the crowd surged across the field. Smith felt himself seized by many hands that endeavoured to hoist him upon as many different shoulders. He was deafened by the noise, bruised by the rough handling he was receiving, and he was very thirsty. Eventually, in a position of extreme discomfort, he was carried towards the scoring tent, where he learned that his individual score was ninety-nine not out. Out from the surge of many impressions, people wringing his hands, hitting him on the back, commiserating with him on not having reached a century, a perfect babel of nothingnesses, came the picture of Marjorie clapping her hands, her hair disordered, her face flushed. He experienced a strange sensation, as if all his muscles had suddenly relaxed. Everybody was talking at once, and every word in praise of Smith's play. Such cricket had never been seen, in either Little Bilsett or Upper Sexton. It was a match that would go down to posterity as the greatest in the history of the county. Every one strove to get a closer view of the hero of the hour. The girls told one another how handsome he was, with his curly fair hair and bronzed features, whilst the men, remembering what he had done, refrained from criticism, which, in reality, would have been self-defence. The vicar was mopping his eyes with a coloured handkerchief, pretending a fly was the cause of the unusual moisture. Miss Jell was actually cordial, whilst Miss Mary never afterwards was able to explain how it came about that her sister found her clutching Smith's left shin, as he struggled to preserve a position that would at least ensure his head being not lower than his feet. Mrs. Spellman's talk was resting on her right shoulder. Mrs. Trusbert Green's millinery now sat on her head like the straw hat of a stage jack tar, whilst Mrs. Crane was crying softly to herself. Mrs. Crane always cried on occasions of great emotional tension. Colonel Enderby had gone home, and at that moment was mixing a whisky and soda with Hindustani oaths, whilst Mr. Marshall had seized the moment of excitement to do a little scavenging on his own account, with the result that he succeeded in acquiring a cheesecake minus one bite, an apple, a piece of cake, two tomatoes, and three sandwiches, a little curled at the edges. Later he had to confess to himself that he had seldom done so well at a cricket match. Apart from the discomfort of having each limb in the charge of a different section of the crowd, Smith was gravely concerned as to the probable effect of such robustiousness upon Jen's superfine unshrinkable flans. When at length he managed to free himself from the embarrassing attentions of cheering little Bilsteadians, and assume an upright position upon his feet, it was to find himself gazing down at Eric's flushed face. "'I say, you're the giddy limit!' he cried. Smith, however, did not hear. He was looking about for Marjorie, but she had gone. At that moment she was sitting at her bedroom window, gazing out at the gently swaying trees, wondering why she had come away so suddenly, and what people would think. She had experienced the sensations of the hosts of Tuscany, and had fled from the temptation to cheer the enemy. End of chapter 14《ハッタフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフフ went over to Smith in a body. Little Bilstead society, however, showed a nicer discrimination between the relative claims of match-winning and morals. Colonel Enderby was not the man to be influenced by mob worship, as he called it, and the sudden popularity of Smith rendered him almost apoplectic with rage. He drank many whiskies and sodas, which reacted upon his liver, and his liver in turn affected his temper. 
there was between colonel enderby and peace with alfred warren a linen line of fluttering filminess he had been known to swear audibly in a crowded thoroughfare at the sight of a shop window dressed for the part of a great white sail and to the astonishment of the passers-by nothing could wipe out the memory of what he regarded as not only an insult to himself but an affront to the army when tom bassingthwaite delivered to the colonel his letters on the morning after smith had made cricket history for little bilstead he had added to his usual greeting of good morning colonel a reference to the victory of the previous afternoon go to hell had been the explosive reply and the door was banged violently in the postman's face can ninety-nine not out and a handful of wickets wipe out the memory of a great scandal that was the question which had exercised the mind of miss jell throughout a sleepless night she knew that in the morning her sister would return to her hero worship of the day before miss jell had noted in the demeanour of her sister when rebuked for her admiration of the prodigal an indication of mutiny it was the merest suggestion but it had caused her some anxiety to her miss mary was a younger sister and as such must be protected from all influences likely to imperil the victorian innocence of her naturally sweet nature something must be done miss jell had told herself time after time as she tossed from side to side on her feather bed it was the flat-footed ellen however who had supplied the rod with which the unfortunate mary jell was to be disciplined miss jell was first down that morning and ellen a woman and therefore a hero worshipper promptly made reference to the cricket match and how the lad who brought the milk from the farm had made reference to miss mary a cling to miss telford's leg having frozen ellen to silence miss jell was conscious of a feeling of relief during the night she had prayed very hard for guidance and providence had sent her smith's left leg wherewith to rebuke her delinquent sister by the time breakfast was over that is to say miss jell's breakfast for her sister consumed nothing but the bitterness of repentance miss mary was reduced to tears and a determination to slip into the church that morning and ask god to forgive her for her unmaidenliness in grasping the shin of a popular hero albeit in a moment of great excitement she was convinced that she would never be able to meet smith again without blushing and the mere sight of a man would recall to her mind that she mary jell had been so forward as to grasp a masculine tibia i i must be brazen she sobbed on her bed that morning and mary jell knew no greater condemnation of a woman than to say that she was brazen in each and every little bilstead home on the morning following smith's sudden jump to fame the talk was exclusively concerned with the great and glorious victory so recently achieved each player in the match recounted his own particular deeds particularly those who had been the greatest failures to listening wives mothers or brothers they explained to their own entire satisfaction that the match had been won by that one particular run which they had either made or prevented an upper sexton player from making all agreed that mr alfred's play had been a revelation and those who possessed some knowledge of the science of the game went over incontinently to the smith heresy during the day little bilstead was inspired with varying emotions and prompted to diverse occupations mrs spelman took her talk to pieces although it had been re-trimmed especially for the cricket match whilst tom simmons got most expensively drunk on old ale the strength of his head rendering indulgence in this direction almost ruinous officially he reported himself as suffering from colic mrs trusbert green spent the whole morning in waving her best auburn wig and composing an invitation to mr alfred warren to take tea with her a week hence if anything happened in the meantime she argued influenza should save her from the embarrassment of an engagement she was undesirous of keeping miss marshall washed her father's linen trousers humming the while onward christian soldiers in honour of the victory of her village whilst her father was engaged in retrospective regrets for the many dainties he had missed which he now saw he might easily have attached without exciting comment either verbal or mental at the grange eric was irrepressible he jazzed mrs higgs across the hall until she collapsed upon the stairs not from want of enthusiasm but from sheer lack of breath he locked willis in his pantry and burst in upon his sister at a time when at least two inches more of silk stocking were exposed to view 
than the public was privileged to see. The result was a fierce combat, in which a table became upset and a vase broken before Marjorie's dainty person was firmly fixed upon what Eric called his stomach, but which she insisted was his chest. "'Isn't it just spiff?' he gasped, when at length permitted to rise, and Marjorie smiled. "'I say, Marjorie,' he burst out, when his sister had assumed the dressing-gown of a rich amber tint. That morning ordinary speech was denied him. He was in mood for bursts like those of a Lewis gun. "'Yes, Eric,' she replied, without looking round from the mirror, in front of which she had taken up her stand and was proceeding to brush her hair. "'Why don't you marry Smith?' There was a tinkling crash as the brush fell from her hand among various toilet requisites. "'Don't be silly, Eric,' she said, as she picked up the brush and proceeded to draw it over the auburn masses of her hair. "'You like him?' "'I don't.' "'You dropped your brush?' "'It slipped from my hand.' "'Why doesn't it slip now?' "'Because I'm holding it more tightly.' "'Rats!' And she continued in long sweeping strokes to reorder her hair. "'Why won't you marry him?' he persisted, as she made no sign of continuing the conversation. "'He'll play for England one of these days.' It seemed to him selfish of any sister to deny a fellow such a brother-in-law. "'But you know he's not that Warren blighter,' he continued. "'What do you mean?' she demanded, turning swiftly from the contemplation of her own reflection to the screwed-up, freckled face of her brother. Eric always screwed up his features when demanding something he saw very little chance of getting. "'A fellow can't learn to play cricket like that. It's in him. You ask the vicar.' Marjorie turned slowly back to the mirror. The movement of the brush was slower, and there was a slight pucker about the delicately penciled eyebrows. "'He's frightfully keen on you,' Eric went on presently. "'He seems—' "'Be quiet, Eric. Don't talk nonsense,' she cried and the mirror reflected a blush that she knew was not hers. "'He was always talking about you,' Eric continued remorselessly, "'or trying to get me to. He thinks I don't see through it, but I do,' he added, with a knowing air. "'I may have a fool name, but—' "'Where do you learn such expressions, Eric?' broke in Marjorie, anxious to divert the conversation from its present embarrassing channel. "'What expression?' "'Fool name.' "'Oh!' "'That's Otis P. Wannabrockers. He's an American, one of Hamley's crowd. Not a bad fellow. He broke Gambrel's nose, and it made him popular.' "'Made him popular?' cried Marjorie, pausing in her brushing. "'Gam's always bullying somebody, and he said Washington was a rebel. So Otis P. went for him, and Gam went about with his nose in a sling. Of course, we all know that old Wash was a rap, but it was rotten bad form to say so,' he added, for his sister's illumination. "'But I say, Margie, it's jolly beastly of you.' "'What is?' she queried weakly. "'You know what I mean,' he retorted sullenly. "'You might. You know how rotten I am with fast bowling, and he would—' "'Don't be ridiculous, Eric,' she retorted, resuming her brushing. "'It's precious little I ever ask,' he grumbled. "'And when I do, you—' "'Here, what the—' She turned swiftly, and before Eric could complete his sentence, or had time to dodge, Her arms were around his neck, and she had kissed him. "'You off your Brazil?' he demanded angrily, as he rubbed the back of his neck. Then, withdrawing his hand, he examined it carefully for signs of blood, but seeing nothing, he resumed the rubbing. "'That brush hurts!' With heightened colour, Marjorie returned to the mirror and recommenced the brushing of her hair. Did her eyes really sparkle as much as the mirror said? "'It was to show I forgive you for bursting into my room when—' "'Well, just now,' she said, with a calmness she was far from feeling. For nearly a minute he continued to regard the rhythmic sweep of the brush and the billow of her hair, as from time to time she threw back her head. Finally, without further remark, he slipped out of the room, his brow puckered in thought, as have been the brows of many other males, at the inexplicability of the female of their own species. It was then that he locked Willis in his pantry. He required dramatic relief— That morning's breakfast at the vicarage was the brightest that either Miss Lipscombe or Janet remembered. For the time being, the vicar seemed to find more in the smallness of little Bilstead than in the glory and the grandeur of the ancients. The cricket match was replayed in its every detail. Each thrill was re-experienced, and every pang was felt anew. 
time after time came from Miss Lipscombe the reminder, "'John, your coffee is getting cold,' or, "'Cricket will keep hot, but eggs and bacon won't,' at which the vicar, ever obedient, would either drink or eat, a moment later returning to the excitements of the previous day's game. Both he and Miss Lipscombe were now entirely convinced that Smith was not Alfred Warren. The vicar had dismissed the matter in a few words. A first-class cricketer himself in his youth, he knew that such skill as Smith had shown was as remote from acquirement as the genius of a Theocritus or a Horace. Janet marvelled at the change in the master, whilst the lines at the corners of Miss Lipscombe's mouth fluttered as she watched the keen, nervous hands of her brother as they emphasised his words. Once he upset his coffee-cup in illustrating a stroke to which he had been addicted nearly half a century before, and he forgot even to apologise to his sister, a thing he invariably did at any mishap due either to his own or another's act. Suddenly there was a whir of wings, followed by shrill pipings of protest, announcing that some forbidden foot was invading the bird's breakfast-table. The flutters disappeared from the corners of Miss Lipscombe's mouth as she turned to rebuke the intruder for an unpardonable act of sacrilege. A moment later the grinning face of Eric appeared at the open French windows. "'Eric! Haven't I told you?' "'Sorry, Miss Lipscombe,' he cried, "'but I couldn't wait to go round. I've just got to talk about it to someone, or I shall explode. I've had a fight with Margie, jazzed Higgy out of breath, and locked Willis in his pantry, but isn't it ripping, sir? he broke off, addressing the vicar. Absolutely top hole. Morning, he nodded to Smith. We were just talking about the match, Eric, said the vicar. I shan't talk of anything else, sir, for a month, cried Eric. It was a wonderful day, said the vicar relapsing somewhat into his customary dreaminess. A wonderful day. I often wonder, Hannah, he continued, addressing his sister, if I ought not to modify the interest I take in sport. For a shepherd. Rubbish, she cried. If a shepherd isn't a sportsman, how is he to know how to keep wolves away from his flock? The vicar's eyes widened slightly as he gazed across at his sister. That savours of the sophists, Hannah he said gently. I must seek the guidance of the bishop when he comes. And Miss Lipscombe made a mental note to have the first word with the bishop. It had become the bishop's custom when visiting his old friend, the vicar of Little Bilstead, first to inquire of Miss Lipscombe for details of what he called the dark patches. Consequently, when the vicar asked for guidance, the bishop was never at a loss how to advise him, and in such a way as to deny him none of the few pleasures he loved but which he thought might be wrong just because he loved them. "'I wish we were playing again to-day,' said Eric, as he seated himself at the table and began work upon a large slice of currant cake. "'Are you collecting eggs, then?' asked Miss Lipscombe dryly. "'I say, that's too bad, Miss Lipscombe,' he protested through a mouthful of cake. "'I know I made a blob, but if I hadn't stopped that boundary we should have been licked.' "'I suppose there are ten different men who think they won,' suggested Miss Lipscombe, who loved to tease Eric. "'No, Miss Lipscombe,' he replied. Nine men and a boy.' And he took another bite of cake, which, to further controversy, was like an editorial. This discussion is now closed. As soon as Colonel Enderby was shaved and dressed that morning, he went down to the village, in the hope of encountering one of his own social set, as he was accustomed to regard those whom he allowed himself to meet on equal terms. As he passed Rose Cottage, he caught a glimpse of Mr. Marshall's white trousers swaying gently in the breeze. Some strange association of ideas caused him to flush darkly and swear fluently under his breath. Outside the post office he encountered Mrs. Trespit Green, who had just posted a letter inviting Smith to tea with her. She had taken the precaution of altering the slope of her handwriting, so that Paul Pryingthwaite, as she called the village postman, should not discover who was writing to the prodigal. She had taken the further precaution of securing the flap with sealing-wax. Mrs. Trusbert Green took no risks. As she had addressed her invitation to Alfred Warren, it was not until months later that it was opened, and Smith became aware of the honour that had been conferred upon him. "'Good morning, ma'am,' cried the Colonel, as he lifted his cap. "'None the worse for yesterday's heat, I hope,' he added gallantly. Mrs. Trusbert Green smiled up at him. 
using the same smile which, forty years ago, had secured her husband. "'What did you think of it, Colonel?' she asked, guardedly, not quite seeing how she could ascribe the defeat of Upper Saxton to heavenly will, she decided it were better to seek earthly guidance. "'A scandal, ma'am!' he cried, in the tone he had been accustomed to use to his officers when informing them that the regiment, and incidentally the British army, was going to the dogs. "'Last night the whole village was intoxicated, ma'am. Intoxicated!' he added, in what was almost a shout. "'You don't say so!' cried Mrs. Trespit Green. All the morning she had been regretting the fact that the previous evening she had allowed herself to be dissuaded from taking a walk with her maid toward the village. It was the maid who had dissuaded her. She had plans of her own, also the back-door key. At breakfast she had told her mistress of the goings-on of the night before, mentioning the milk-boy as her source of information. "'I saw it myself,' he barked. "'The whole village was full of men and women, drinking and fighting and dancing. It's a scandal.' and all through that scoundrel Warren. He ought to be deported. It was true that little Bilsett had held high carnival the previous night, gathering in force outside the pigeons. The local contingent had been reinforced by a good sprinkling of Upper Saxtonians. By nine o'clock the pigeon cellars had been drunk dry of all save a few bottles of spirits and mineral waters, after which strange concoctions were invented and drunk, including cider and rum cherry brandy and stone ginger beer. There had been several faction fights, in all of which Little Bilstead had triumphed, for never had Little Bilstead's tales been so erect as on that dramatic night of unexpected victory. At first the general attitude had been a little uncertain, but after a few rounds of the flowing bowl, as represented by mugs of ale, the name of Miss Alfred was heard again and again, coupled with toasts of vainglory and rodomontade for little Bilsett Ward's newly acquired laurels no more modestly than Upper Saxton had worn theirs in the past. Yardley had been seen hopping about unsteadily on one foot, like an intoxicated robin, moving from group to group, inquiring if any one had seen his boot, which had somehow disappeared when removed in order that a crease in a sock might be readjusted. Roars of laughter had greeted his efforts to discover it. Yardley had been one of the chief victims of the victory. Every one wanted to be his host, and quite a number succeeded, with the result that the little Bilsett captain, who boasted one of the strongest heads in the eastern counties, found it extremely difficult to move about on one leg. "'That fellow Postle was one of the worst,' barked Colonel Enderby. "'I shall report him.' It was true that P.C. Postle had somewhat forgotten the dignity due to the uniform he wore. Colonel Enderby was prepared to report an archangel for making a draught with his wings. There were few of his inferiors in Little Bilstead, male or female, whom at one time or another he had not threatened to report. At that very moment the village policeman himself was engaged in going through his cottage with a tooth-comb in search of his helmet. He was puzzled to account for a red hat adorned with blue poppies which hung from the peg dedicated to his official headgear when not in action. Ha! cried the colonel, as the Miss Jells came out of the post office, and, with a bow and another exposure of his manifest boldness to the blue dome of heaven, he hurriedly left Mrs. Trespit Green. Good morning, he cried, with a sudden stiffening of his frame, followed by a bow and yet a third exposure of the crown that took so high a polish. I hope you were not disturbed by last night's disgraceful scenes. Neither of the Miss Jells had heard of anything disgraceful, although Miss Mary blushed at the sound of a word she heard for the second time that day. Colonel Enderby once more plunged into the story of the scandalous conduct of the little Bilsteadians in the hour of victory. Miss Jell looked shocked, whilst Miss Mary strove not to appear as interested as she felt. "'We shall be the laughing-stock of the whole county,' he cried angrily, in conclusion, "'and all through that young reprobate Warren.' Miss Mary gave a little shudder of fear, for had not she, Mary Jell, clung to the left shin of the very man the colonel was denouncing? She felt almost fast. "'I tried to find Postle,' continued the colonel, and—' He stopped suddenly. Coming towards them was the epitome of the law himself, carrying something done up flimsily in a newspaper. 
at the sight of the Miss Jells and Colonel Enderby, whom he held in considerable dread, Postle hurriedly transferred the parcel to the rear, walking along with an elaborate air of unconcern, which in another would not have deceived even him. Memory had at length come to his aid, and he recalled having exchanged hats the previous night with pretty Millie Marjoram, and he was now on his way to effect a re-exchange. Although wearing his uniform, Postle had on his head a cloth cap, which gave to his appearance the suggestion of a music-hall turn. He was so intent upon the little group of notabilities that he did not see the smiling Millie herself approaching, his helmet on the back of her impudent head. Colonel Enderby, however, saw it, and, being a man of the world and one who had fought for his king and country, as he was fond of expressing it, realized immediately the significance of what he saw. Postle, he cried, in a voice that would have brought a squad of the rawest recruits to attention like a Prussian regiment. There was a scream. A helmet dropped a few feet in front of the astonished Postle, whilst Millie was running towards a red hat with blue poppies lying in the middle of the road. That jaunty air of detachment had been fatal to the fastenings of P.C. Postle's parcel, and the hat had fallen out. "'Catch me changing hats with you again, Bor! cried the outraged Millie, as she proceeded to blow the dust from her precious headgear. "'You gawk!' she added, her eyes still upon the reds and blues of her treasured millinery. Postle continued to stare at the Colonel, whilst Miss Jell turned aside and Miss Mary blushed. Somehow or other the incident reminded her of her own unmaidenly act of the day before. To Miss Jell it seemed almost indelicate that such revelations should be made in the presence of a man. She had always disapproved of Millie Marjoram. She disapproved of all pretty girls on principle, for was not prettiness in a girl merely a trap, and they did not sooner or later invariably lead to scandal. This incident, however, was both flagrant and indelicate. It— "'What have you to say for yourself, Postle? barked the colonel fiercely, his moustache appearing strangely white against the purple of his face. "'She took my helmet,' he grumbled, as he stooped to retrieve his official headgear. "'Blam her!' he muttered under his breath, as he rose once more to an upright position. Then, in what appeared to be one movement, he placed the helmet on his head, saluted, turned, and was walking swiftly away in the direction of his own cottage. "'I won't forget this more,' he hissed, as he passed the now smiling Milly, who promptly put out her tongue at him. Miss Mary, who saw the action, was once more strangely reminded of her own lapse. "'I hope you're not going to receive this young scoundrel,' cried Colonel Enderby, tearing his gaze from the back of the retreating postle to Miss Jell. "'We look to you,' he added, as she appeared to hesitate. "'Certainly not, Colonel Enderby,' was the icy retort, and, with a slight bow, Miss Jell passed on, followed by her sister, who blushed for the third time that morning. "'Now what the devil!' he spluttered, bewildered at the sudden change in Miss Jell's social barometer. "'Damn!' he exploded, as he turned on his heel and stamped off in the direction of his own house, where Mrs. Warnes was engaged in preparing a curry almost as hot as the Colonel's temper. It is not for Colonel Enderby to suggest whom we shall receive and whom we shall not receive, Miss Jell remarked to her sister, as they walked through the village in the direction of the Cedars. His remark is a presumption, she added, and her sister wondered if they were really going to receive the man whose shin she had embraced with such abandon, and again she blushed. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of the Return of Alfred by Herbert George Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter Sixteen. P. C. Postle assumes his uniform. Are you the village constable? I be, sir, replied John Postle, wishing he were in uniform, and that he had selected another day for cleaning out the fowl house. The indications all pointed to a case. I've been assaulted. The speaker was the man in the brown and white check suit, whom Eric had pinked, as he called it, the previous Saturday afternoon on the way back from Norwich. "'Assaulted, sir! You don't mean it!' John Postle's heart leapt with joy. In a flash he saw his portrait in the papers, particularly the London papers. He saw himself arresting dangerous characters. He saw himself promoted. 
he saw— "'Where had you been assaulted, sir?' he heard himself inquiring. "'About three miles from here,' said the stranger, and he went on to say that he had been forced to accept a lift to Norwich from a passing carter, both for himself and his motor-bicycle. This accounted for the delay in lodging his complaint. "'Aye, but what part of the body, sir?' asked Postle eagerly. He was more than ever resentful that the fowls should have claimed him on this of all days. His uniform would have made all the difference in the world. "'I was in a stooping position,' explained the stranger, with great delicacy. Postle rubbed his chin with the pad of his right thumb, which bore marked evidences of his recent occupation. The law required the utmost detail. In his own mind he was quite satisfied that the stranger had been kicked, but he doubted if his superiors would consider assaulted whilst in a stooping position as sufficiently explicit. The impressive appearance of the prosecutor, as in his own mind he already called him, with his luxuriant auburn moustache, seemed to forbid a demand for further particulars. "'I was bending over my motorcycle,' continued the stranger, "'which had developed engine trouble when I was shot.' "'Shot!' The word burst from Don Postle's lips like a shout of thanksgiving. At last his hour had come. Without a word he turned and bolted to the house, leaving the stranger with the auburn moustache gazing into a little room crowded with the village constable's cherished possessions. Before, however, he had time to make up his mind whether or not to enter, Postle reappeared, struggling into his official tunic, his helmet on the back of his head. A few seconds later his calloused hands grasped notebook and pencil. P.C. Postle was prepared for the great moment of his official career. A man had been shot in Little Bilstead. Already he saw the newspapers, full of the sensation. He heard paper-boys shouting the news in the streets of London. He saw himself at the pigeons, a dictator, knowing neither thirst nor interruption. "'You are shot, sir,' he began, the tip of the pencil pressed against his lower lip, his eyes searching the stranger's generous person for bloodstains. "'You come inside, sir,' he added with inspiration, suddenly becoming conscious that a little fringe of juvenile spectators was collecting round the gate. The stranger entered the little room, to which the front door gave direct access, and seated himself at the round table in the centre, whilst Postle worked industriously with his stub of pencil, pausing after every other word to moisten the tip. "'Shot in a stooping position,' he read slowly as he wrote, with— "'What were you shot with, sir? Was it a gun or a pistol?' he inquired, looking up. "'I think it was a catapult.' In a flash, P.C. Postle's house of cards was demolished. "'A catapult! Although it was an irregular and illegal proceeding for one liege subject of His Majesty King George to assault another, even with a catapult, there was something almost grotesque in the view that a catapult was a lethal weapon.' There was about John Postle nothing of the sleuth-hound, with a face that is a mask for the emotions behind. His surprise and disappointment expressed themselves so clearly in his widened eyes and half-open mouth that the stranger felt called upon to say something in justification of his charge. "'If I had been riding my motorcycle instead of standing by it,' he said, "'I might have been killed. Besides, it hurt. It still hurts,' he added and he shifted uneasily in his chair. With flagging and laborious pencil, Postle took down the remaining particulars the stranger had to give. His heart was no longer in his task, he even regretted having donned his official tunic. The absurdity of assuming such a garment to take down details of a man having been shot at by someone with a catapult was obvious even to him, and he was proud of his uniform. And besides, there was no blood. To John Postle, assault without bloodshed was not crime as he understood it. He always thought of the victim as weltering in his own blood. It added colour to the crime. He proceeded to rub his chin with a pad of a dubious thumb. He was a little uncertain as to the next step in the procedure. Had it been murder with a weltering corpse, he would have known exactly what was required of him. But a man assaulted by a catapult whilst in a stooping position, this presented difficulties. "'Did you see the prisoner?' he inquired, anticipating the natural order of events. "'Did I see?' queried the stranger. "'Did you see the man what assaulted you, sir?' inquired Postle, whilst in a stooping position,' he added as an afterthought. 
"'It was the man,' said the stranger irascibly. "'It was a boy, a boy with red hair. He was in a motor-car. I took the number of the car, or at least part of it.' And he dived into his breast-pocket. "'It was—' He drew a notebook from his pocket and gazed at it earnestly. N O seven eight and some other figure I could not quite see. It was partly covered with mud. Postle looked solemn as he still rubbed a bristly chin with his left thumb. The number of the car, even in its incomplete state, coupled with the redness of the hair of the delinquent, constituted clues of the utmost importance. In other words, he had identified the aggressor, and the knowledge embarrassed him. After all, the complainant, or prosecutor, he was not yet quite sure how he ought to classify him, was a stranger, and with him all strangers were suspect. On the other hand, there was Miss Marjorie to be thought of. About Eric he troubled nothing. All boys were young varmen. But the idea of causing Miss Marjorie trouble or worry was alien to his thoughts. There was, however, the official aspect of the case to be considered. "'I have to go on to Norwich now to get a new magneto,' announced the stranger, caressing the auburn luxuriance that cascaded from his upper lip. "'I shall be back in a few days. If you haven't found this boy by then, I shall report the matter at Scotland Yard.' Postle shivered at the mention of Scotland Yard. He was impressed by the stranger's firm demeanour. He might be anybody. "'It's Master Eric, that's a sure moral,' was his unuttered thought. "'I think, sir,' he said, turning to the stranger, "'I got a clue. "'You know this boy?' Postle hesitated. It seemed disloyal to Miss Marjorie to betray Eric. Still, there was duty to be considered. "'I fare to think I can find him, sir, by the time you're back.' "'Then I shall want you to take me to a magistrate and obtain a summons for—' "'Shooting at you with a catapult while in a stooping position,' murmured Postle, as the stranger rose. With a sigh he straightened his tunic and cast a glance at his boots, which still bore traces of the fowl-house. Opening the door, he stood aside for the other to pass out. A moment later he was startled by an exclamation from his visitor, and he had a vision of the burly figure running down the path, shouting to someone to stop. "'That's him!' cried the stranger over his shoulder, pointing at Eric, who had just passed the house and was walking in the direction of the grange. "'That's the young scoundrel!' he cried dramatically. I give him in charge. The recognition had been mutual. One swift glance over his shoulder had been sufficient to enable Eric to identify the man he had pinked. Without hesitation he took to his heels. Postle was fumbling at the tails of his tunic for the notebook he had just returned to its customary place of abode. The situation was not without its embarrassments. "'Why didn't you catch him?' demanded the stranger. Postle rubbed his chin. "'Why hadn't he effected an arrest?' In his own mind, he clung tenaciously to the terminology of the weekly paper he devoured from breakfast time till bedtime each Sunday. I'll, he began, when he stopped suddenly. Coming towards them was Miss Mary Jell. At the sight of the stranger, she paused. Is anything the matter, Postle? she inquired, looking up shyly at the florid figure of the stranger, at a loss to classify him. This be the prosecutor, Miss Mary, was the stammered reply. He say that, master, that he had been shot while he was in a— Shot! repeated Miss Mary in horror. How dreadful! Are you— With a catapult, miss, broke in the stranger, thus assisting in his own classification. The prosecutor said he had engine trouble, explained Postle, and that he was shot while in a stooping position. He stopped suddenly. The stranger was coughing violently. Miss Mary blushed while Postle looked from one to the other uncomprehendingly. "'I'm so sorry,' said Miss Mary, feeling dreadfully adventurous in addressing a stranger who had not been introduced to her. "'I hope it—it it didn't hurt.' It was the stranger's turn to show embarrassment. He flushed a brick red. "'Constable,' he said, to cover his confusion, "'I—I—' I, Then, with a lifting of his cap and a bow to Miss Mary that thrilled her, he turned and made off in the direction taken by the fugitive Eric. For nearly a minute Postle stood regarding the impressive brown-and-white check back of the man who had brought a transitory hope to his official heart. "'Well, I'm danged,' he muttered, 
pushing his helmet still further back and proceeding to scratch a puzzled head. If that ain't a rum un. He turned to Miss Mary for comfort, but she was retreating hurriedly in the opposite direction from that taken by the smitten stranger. Slowly P.C. Postle returned to the fowl house, minus his helmet and tunic, whilst Miss Mary hurried back to the cedars. For the rest of the afternoon she was engaged in a struggle between a sense of delicacy and her feeling for drama. How was she to tell Jane, and at the same time suppress the embarrassing details? When at length she told of her adventure, and the inevitable question presented itself, as she had foreseen it would, she replied with a blush, "'I think he was shot in the arm, Jane.'" End of chapter 16《ハッタセブンティーン・オフ・ザ・レターン・オフ・アルフレッド・バイ・ハーバート・ジョージ・ジャンカンス。ミスター・ガジェット・ペイズ・コール。Just as P.C. Postle emerged from his fowl house to receive the complaint of the stranger with the auburn moustache, Janet entered the vicarage drawing room. A gentleman has called to see you, sir, she announced. To see me? queried Smith, looking up from the writing table, where he was engaged in glancing through the pages of an illustrated paper. Yes, sir. He said Mr. Willis sent him over from the Grange. He wouldn't give his name, sir. Always a suspicious sign, that, murmured Smith. By the way, whom did he happen to ask for? For you, Mr. Warren. That is to say, for Mr. Alfred Warren. Yes, sir. Janet, haven't I told you a thousand times that I am not Mr. Alfred Warren, but Mr. Smith? Yes, Mr. Warren. Show him in, he said warily. When the door once more opened, Smith rose to find himself facing a little ferret faced man, sandy where he was not bald, and with a chin that manifested a marked inclination to retreat down his collar. As he entered, he gave a swift glance round the room. His shifty little eyes blinking craftily. At the sight of Smith, an evil expression passed over his unprepossessing features. Mr. Alfred Warren? he interrogated. Sometimes I almost wish I were, said Smith, who was speculating as to what particular period of Alfred Warren's activities his caller represented. As it is, I am always disappointing people. Won't you sit down, Mr. Gadget, of the firm of Gadget, Grandson, and Gadget? Solicitors of New Court, London, W.C. "'And may I take it that you are the grandson?' inquired Smith gravely. "'I'm the senior partner, Mr. Grimthorpe Gadget,' he replied, with a touch of self-importance. "'Thank you,' said Smith, with the air of one who has settled an important point. "'Am I addressing Mr. Alfred Warren?' "'You are not,' smiled Smith. For a moment Mr. Gadget looked nonplussed. His face assumed an even more ferrety expression. He gazed at Smith, as if trying to read his thoughts. "'Then may I inquire who it is I have the pleasure of addressing?' "'Certainly. My name is James Smith.' Mr. Gadget glanced up at him sharply. It was obvious that the answer was unexpected. "'We are a large family, we Smiths,' said Smith, as he sank back into a chair opposite that taken by Mr. Gadget. In the London telephone directory alone there are fourteen columns of us, including twenty-four gentlemen who frankly confess to the name of James. I look it up myself. It's a terrible inheritance, Mr. Gadget, a name such as mine. Whilst Smith was speaking, Mr. Gadget had opened a small leather attaché case he carried. Taking out a photograph, he gazed at it intently, then across at Smith, and finally back again at the photograph. "'I inquired at the Grange for Mr. Alfred Warren,' he said at length and I was told to come here. That would be Willis, said Smith easily. You never can be sure of what Willis will be up to. If you had inquired for the Grand Lama himself, you would in all probability have been told he was here. Am I to take it that you maintain you are not Mr. Alfred Warren? Mr. Gadget's eyes returned to the photograph. There would be no risk whatever in such an assumption. Then why, may I ask, was I sent here when I inquired for Mr. Warren? He demanded his eyes snapping venomously. "'That involves psychoanalysis and family history,' was the reply. 
the psychoanalysis being necessary to interpret Willis, and the family history to explain the disappearance of Mr. Warren some seven years ago, and the discovery of James Smith a few days since. "'In the village I was given to understand that Mr. Warren had returned after a long absence, and was living here. Is that correct?' "'Which statement do you wish me to verify?' inquired Smith. "'That you are assured of the circumstance, or that the circumstance of which you are assured is an actual fact?' "'We're wasting time, sir,' said Mr. Gadget, with a touch of asperity in his voice. "'The question is, are you or are you not Mr. Alfred Warren?' "'I've just told you that my name is James Smith,' was the reply. "'If I am James Smith, Mr. Gadget, you, as a lawyer, must realise that I cannot be Alfred Warren. May I in turn inquire why it is you are subjecting me to this cross-examination?' "'I must first establish your identity before I can proceed,' said Mr. Gadget. "'Then I fear you are in for a troublesome business,' was the smiling reply. "'For the past week I have been endeavouring to do that self-same thing, but with the most miserable results. I suspect that nothing short of an act of Parliament or direct action can establish my identity, because—' "'Because?' prompted Mr. Gadget. "'Because I don't seem to have an identity. At least—' not one about which there appears to be any unanimity of opinion. I'm a sort of stormy petrel. Wherever I go I seem to excite faction. In this peaceful little village, for instance, I've aroused the devil's own dissensions. Nothing like it has been known since the Wars of the Roses." For nearly a minute Mr. Gadget sat pondering the photograph in his hand, his eyes shifting restlessly, always avoiding Smith's steady gaze. "'Sir,' he said at length, I venture to suggest that you are deliberately adopting an attitude of verbal ambiguity, and it is my duty to warn you that such a line of defence will not in any way benefit you." "'And I, on my part,' said Smith, with a smile that gave no indication of what was to follow, "'warn you, Mr. Gadget, that unless you are reasonably civil, I shall throw you out of that window into Miss Lipscomb's favourite bed of begonias. They're mostly prized plans, by the way.' Mr. Gadget started back in his chair, his little eyes blinking apprehensively. He glanced furtively about him, as if in search of a line of retreat. "'That is a threat of violence, sir,' he blustered. "'An attempt to intimidate.' "'As a matter of fact, it is neither the one nor the other. It is just a prophecy. We Smiths are like that, at least those of us who are not hyphenated. It's no doubt due to our sensitiveness,' he continued, but Mr. Gadget remained silent. The least suggestion of discourtesy, and he paused significantly. I am sorry if began Mr. Gadget. Don't be sorry, said Smith. Just be explicit. He was enjoying Mr. Gadget's embarrassment, so obviously tinctured with fear. He sat blinking his eyes uncertainly, looking more ferret like than ever. It was clear he found some difficulty in deciding his mode of procedure. Smith sat gazing at him, like a good-humoured mastiff at a small dog that has barked a challenge. "'To prevent any misunderstanding, Mr. Gadget,' continued Smith, "'I think it only right to say that I used to be regarded as a light heavy weight of some promise.' "'That, I suggest, is a covert threat of violence,' said Mr. Gadget. "'On the contrary, it is merely a little piece of biographical information that may tend to preserve the peace the king is supposed to value so much. You have rather an unfortunate manner, Mr. Gadget, he added, still smiling. Doubtless it is unintentional. I repeat, said Mr. Gadget at length, that if I have said anything calculated to cause you irritation or annoyance, he paused. You cannot repeat what you have not already stated, said Smith evenly. As a matter of fact, your presence causes me both. "'I'm sorry,' began Mr. Gadget. "'You've just said that,' Smith glanced significantly at the watch on his wrist. "'Don't you think you might take the plunge and tell me why you have called?' "'I came,' said Mr. Gadget, "'to interview the, um, gentleman who is masquer who is known here as Mr. Alfred Warren.' "'I gathered as much from your previous remarks.' was the dry retort. Smith was determined to render him no assistance. As a lawyer, you will realize that the actual expression of other people's opinions does not involve me in any liability. 
if you are not he who is known in this neighbourhood as Mr. Alfred Warren, then where can I find the gentleman in question? Smith shrugged his shoulders with the air of one who acknowledges that the problem is beyond him. Mr. Um, Smith, I have decided, for the purpose of my visit, to assume that you are the gentleman who has been identified in this neighbourhood as Mr. Alfred Warren. Mr. Gadget paused and glanced swiftly at Smith, who, however, evinced no emotion. It is, therefore, he continued, with more assurance in his voice, it is, therefore, my duty to inform you that some years ago, before going um, abroad, the real Mr. Alfred Warren placed his affairs in the hands of my firm, with instructions to take such steps as we may deem necessary to protect his interests and reputation. Do I make myself clear? Abundantly. Have you anything to say? Mr. Gadget's former assurance of manner was returning to him. I was wondering, said Smith quietly, if that little bit about protecting his reputation was your idea or his. You must understand, Mr. Smith, that, presuming I am right in my assumption that you are he who is generally accepted as Mr. Alfred Warren, you are running a very considerable risk. We all run risks, Mr. Gadget, said Smith evenly. The world is full of them. That is why we buy newspapers, to insure against the mere risk of living. Quite recently I played cricket in flannel reach-me-downs. That is not relevant to the matter under discussion. On the contrary, it is peculiarly relevant. You think of my risks, I think of yours. I should hate to see you take a header into that begonia bed. Smith significantly felt the biceps of his left arm. Mr. Gadget rose and performed a strategic movement that placed the chair on which he had been sitting between him and Smith. "'We do not wish to be unduly precipitate in any action we take,' he said over the back of the chair. "'I command your wisdom,' was the dry rejoinder. "'It is that fact which accounts for my presence here to-day,' continued Mr. Gadget. Smith nodded. "'I have it in my power to prove that you are not Mr. Warren,' announced Mr. Gadget with the air of a man who is playing a trump card. "'Mr. Gadget,' said Smith impressively, "'you are the man I have been looking for. If you can do as you say, then the moving of mountains is a mere bagatelle.' "'Have you, Mr. Um, Smith, anything to say before I take my departure?' "'Nothing,' said Smith, glancing once more at his wristwatch. "'Except to thank you for calling,' he added. In the light of anything that may subsequently transpire, continued Mr. Gadget, as he backed towards the door, you will recall that I approached you with a view to hearing any explanation you might have to make, and, um, see if a satisfactory settlement could be arrived at. I most certainly shall. I have sent two letters to Mr. Alfred Warren at the Grange. Did you receive them? Mr. Warren has not authorized me to deal with his correspondence. "'I take it,' began Mr. Gadget. "'Don't,' said Smith. "'It's safer.' "'I'm afraid we're not progressing,' said Mr. Gadget, who had apparently forgotten his intention of terminating the interview. "'I quite agree with you.' "'You will uh, pardon me, Mr. Smith, if I say that you are now faced with a matter requiring the most careful and well-considered judgment. I will add that I apologize for any offence I may unwittingly have caused, and—' He paused. Enough, Mr. Gadget, said Smith. I think you may now safely resume your chair. Acting on the hint, Mr. Gadget slid round the chair with obvious relief. It has come to our knowledge, Mr. Uh, Smith. Smith, without the error, sounds better, said Smith evenly. That you recently threatened a gentleman with violence, continued Mr. Gadget. You mean Mr. Bluggs, suggested Smith. The process of sweetening the memory of the absent Alfred promised to be more interesting than it at first appeared likely. I refer to Mr. Jonathan Bluggs, and I feel I ought to inform you that such threats are calculated to prejudice your case. It was— A holly bush, came the smiling interruption. You see, we were some way from the begonia bed. Besides, he was peculiarly offensive. You realize, of course, that it is within Mr. Bluggs's power to have you bound over— said Mr. Gadget. He gave Smith the impression of one talking to gain time, apparently with a view to deciding his line of action. As Smith made no comment, 
he turned once more to the likeness he still held in his hand. "'The likeness is certainly very remarkable,' he said. "'Physically it is almost uncanny,' remarked Smith dryly. Mr. Gadget winced a little. He was still obviously nervous, and Smith realized that he desired to say something which he found it difficult to frame in words. "'Were you—' he began, then paused. "'Was I—' interrogated Smith with polite indifference. "'You have been at Little Bilstead for—for for several days?' "'This is the eighth, to be exact,' was the rejoinder. "'Have you during that time um, met with any—' He paused again. "'I mean, have you—has your stay been a pleasant one?' "'Eminently,' said Smith with a smile. At first I was regarded a little coldly, except at the Grange, where Willis spent much of his time in following me about with the decanter. "'And outside the Grange?' inquired Mr. Gadget hastily. "'Fair to medium. I made friends with the vicar, have been denounced by a peppery old colonel, managed to invest the dislike of a pretty girl, knocked up one short of the century at cricket, and—well, that's about all so far.' "'Will you permit me to put a few questions to you, Mr. Um, Smith?' "'With pleasure,' said Smith, amused at the change in Mr. Gadget's tone. "'By the way, you've already put two or three. "'Ah, uh, have you any reason to believe?' began Mr. Gadget. He paused. Then, as if deciding upon another course of action, he said, "'I'll be quite frank with you, Mr. Smith.' This time he got the name without the preliminary error. Frankness is always refreshing. There was a short pause. From the ferrety snapping of Mr. Gadget's eyes, Smith realized that he was about to spring his mine. He had clearly been working up to something dramatic. "'Are you aware, Mr. Smith,' he began, emphasizing the name, "'that there is a warrant out for the arrest of Mr. Warren?' "'The deuce there is!' cried Smith, startled in spite of himself, and sitting up straight in his chair." This was an aspect of the sweetening process he had not bargained for. Mr. Gadget displayed the yellowness of two particularly evil-looking canines. His mind was a success. "'It was issued six years ago,' he said, "'and, as I happen to know, it has never been withdrawn.' "'And why do you come to tell me this?' inquired Smith, a stern look coming into his eyes. "'I, uh, we may possibly be of assistance to you.' was the fluid rejoinder. "'In our professional capacity,' he added. "'And why was the warrant issued?' "'In connection with the death of a girl named Thurkettle. Before she died she made a statement,' he added, with a leer. "'I think you have given me sufficient data to be going on with,' said Smith, rising. There was a whiteness at the corners of his set mouth that caused Mr. Gadget some anxiety. "'I think that is all I need trouble you with at present,' he said as he rose, having first stowed away the photograph in his case. "'We do not propose to take action for a week or ten days,' he added. "'I shall not forget.' "'You have our address,' said Mr. Gadget, significantly. "'I have,' said Smith. "'I am glad you came.' "'Thank you, Mr. Smith,' and Mr. Gadget made a repulsive movement with his dust-coloured lips which his intimates would have recognized as a smile. So am I. Because, said Smith quietly, you are the first blackmailer I have ever met. Mr. Gadget's jaw fell. For a moment he gazed at Smith, fear in his eyes. That is, he stopped suddenly and began to back nervously towards the door. There was something in Smith's look that suggested Miss Lipscomb's bed of begonias. "'You know Alfred Warren to be dead.' It was a shot at a venture, but in the apprehensive look in Mr. Gadget's turbid eyes Smith thought he saw a confirmation of his words. The next moment Mr. Gadget had slid round the door and disappeared. "'So that was why A. W. bolted,' murmured Smith, as he stepped out from the French windows onto the lawn. There was something about the moral atmosphere of Mr. Gadget that made fresh air essential." He turned and walked slowly down the drive, his face grave. This process of sweetening the memory of the absent Alfred seemed likely to involve him in serious complications. It was not pleasant to contemplate arrest, but on such a charge it was intolerable. 
he could prove his innocence of the crime and of being Alfred. Still, there was all the unpleasantness and the scandal. It was obvious that the unspeakable gadget was out for blackmail, disguised as some form of professional service. He had heard of such solicitors, but had never believed they really existed. Such forms of animal life ought to be trodden on, he decided. Was Alfred Warren alive or dead? That was the question. The startled look in Gadget's eyes, coupled with the hurried nature of his departure, certainly looked suspicious. But suspicion was not proof. Then how had he got to know about Bluggs? Was he in league with that gold-toothed abomination? Taken all round, he was in the very— He stopped suddenly at the sound of a cry, something between a yelp and a scream, which appeared to come from somewhere in the neighbourhood of the vicarage gates. Hurrying along the drive, he passed out into the road, just as another yelp broke the drowsy stillness of the summer afternoon. This time it developed into a howl. Smith gazed along the road in the direction of the Grange. As far as the eye could reach, there was no spot or blemish upon its ribboned whiteness. Obviously the drama was being enacted in the opposite direction, where the road took a sharp turn towards the village. Running the few steps necessary to gain a view round the bend, Smith was met by a sight and sound that brought him once more to a standstill. There, in the middle of the road, lay Mr. Gadget. At least, he judged it to be Mr. Gadget. The hat and attaché case that lay a few yards off were certainly his. Mr. Gadget himself seemed to be somewhere beneath a body infinitely larger than his own, encased in a startling scheme of brown and white checks. Mr. Gadget appeared to be engaged in screaming for mercy, invoking the aid alike of God and man, whilst his thin legs worked like flails. It was obvious that Mr. Gadget was getting it in the neck. Hastening forward, Smith seized a handful of the checked material and hauled with all his might. There was a gasping sound from the upper part of the mound, and, a moment later, a foxy little figure wriggled from beneath the mountain of checks. It was indeed Mr. Gadget, and a very agile Mr. Gadget. Before Smith quite realized what was happening, he had gathered up his hat and case, and was legging it down the road towards the village, as if the Inquisition itself were after him. Turning to the brown and white checked assailant, whose colour he had been grasping, Smith, by a movement of his wrist, swung him round. "'Peters!' he released his hold, and stood gazing at the man in sheer bewilderment. "'What the devil does this mean?' he demanded his eyes still upon the perspiring face from which an auburn moustache stood out with astonishing suddenness. "'I'm taking a holiday, sir,' was the reply of the man whom Eric had pinked, and Peters proceeded to draw a large bandana handkerchief from his pocket and mop his streaming forehead. He was a big man, and unaccustomed to any form of violent exercise. "'And is this your idea of a holiday?' demanded Smith, "'battering the life out of a man half your own size?' "'That was private gadget, sir,' he said, as calm as if in his own pantry. "'That, Peters,' said Smith severely, "'is Mr. Grimthorpe Gadget, of Gadget Grandson and Gadget, solicitors of New Court, London, W.C., as he has just informed me. What the devil are you doing?' In what appeared to be one movement, Peters had returned the handkerchief to his pocket, produced a notebook, and was apparently engaged in making a note of something. "'I'm taking down the address, sir,' he said, without raising his eyes from the page. "'Why?' "'It will be useful, sir.' "'The devil it will,' cried Smith. "'How?' "'Private Gadget, deserted from our regiment one night, when out on patrol, sir, in the final advance,' continued Peters. "'And the Huns, the Germans, sir,' he corrected himself, "'surprised a working party and killed six men.' "'The swine!' The words broke from between Smith's clenched teeth, and he was not thinking of the Huns. "'My company commander ordered me, if ever I caught him, to—to to smash his face in. I was doing it when you interrupted me, sir,' he added. "'Peters,' said Smith gravely, "'I owe you an apology.' "'Thank you, sir. By the look of what he took away with him, however, you seem to have achieved your mission,' he added dryly. Peters looked doubtful. It was evident that, in his code of ethics, a man with a smashed face ought not to be able to run away. "'But what the devil do you mean by turning up here?' Smith demanded, suddenly recalling the strangeness of the encounter. "'I was in pursuit of a boy, sir.' Smith stared at him. 
"'You don't happen to have turned Bolshevist, I suppose?' he inquired. "'He assaulted me with a catapult,' said Peters, with expressionless face. "'I don't wonder at it, in that get-up,' smiled Smith, venturing a guess at the identity of the boy. "'It's like a musical comedy.' "'The boy escaped, sir,' continued Peters. "'It was then that I saw Private Gadget, and—' "'Proceeded to smash his face,' suggested Smith, as Peters paused. "'But that does not account for your turning up here in this fashion, and in those extraordinary clothes.' "'I developed engine trouble, sir, my motorcycle, sir,' he added. "'You invariably do.' "'I think, sir, I mentioned that I was going to Norfolk because—' "'Your old bus wouldn't climb hills,' broke in Smith with a smile. "'I certainly had a considerable amount of trouble with my motorcycle,' agreed Peters. "'I think it must be the petrol.' "'The avoir du poids, you mean?' "'Sir?' interrogated Peters. "'When you put about fifteen stone on a broken-winded motorbike like yours, Peters, and then expect it to take a hill at a canter, you're asking for trouble.' "'Yes, sir,' said Peters, dutifully. "'Incidentally, Peters, I am in the very deuce of a hole,' Smith continued. "'I've not only been written off as a bad death by my uncle, but I've also been proclaimed the return prodigal of little Bilsett, and it's the very devil.' "'Yes, sir,' said Peters, his face immobile as the Houses of Parliament. "'But I can't tell you now. There isn't time.' "'I feel I ought to inform you, sir, that Sir John has written to me.' "'Written to you?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Then how the devil did he know—' "'Soon after I started, I developed engine—' "'Oh, damn your engine trouble, Peters. Let us take it for granted.' "'Certainly, sir,' said Peters, in his best professional manner. "'I returned to London for certain repairs, and I took the opportunity of calling at the flat, sir, where I found a number of letters.' "'And some bills?' suggested Smith. A large proportion of the correspondence bore evidence of having come from tradesmen, admitted Peters. There was also a letter from Sir John asking for your address, sir. I hope you wrote and told him I'd gone to the devil. No, sir. I informed him that you had entered upon a new life of usefulness. A new life of what? he demanded. I mentioned, sir, that you hoped by industry and application and attention to detail, that you would merit— "'You've been reading some infernal tradesman's circular, Peters. What the deuce do you mean by writing such utter balderdash to Sir John?' "'I thought it would probably appeal to him, sir,' said Peters, as devoid of expression as a barrel piano. "'If I may say so, Sir John is very much attached to you, sir.' "'Peters?' You're indulging what the Americans call sop stuff. You've been reading The Lamplighter, or A Peep Behind the Scenes. In the idiom of the modern flapper, you're getting soppy. I'm sorry, sir. You need not be, Peters. It's an emotional state largely due to films. Did my uncle say what he wanted me for? I think, sir, he found his heart softening. <laughs> like your brains, Peters, smiled Smith. What are your plans now? For the moment, sir, I have no plans. I have to return to Norwich to get a new magneto. I think that is the cause of the trouble I have with the engine. You can do better, said Smith with sudden inspiration. You can go to town and get me some clothes. Yes, sir. You know what you packed. I've wrecked the raincoat in climbing a gate, and the suit I wore has ceased to be a suit and is merely a study in exposure. When you get back, Come up to the vicarage and ask for the keys of the church, then we can arrange to smuggle the things in. Yes, sir, said Peters, as if he were being asked for a whisky and soda. Now you'd better slip off, said Smith. It won't do for us to be seen together. No, sir, said Peters, vaguely. Great Gulliver, Smith cried suddenly. Why, Peters, you're the deus ex machina of this adventure. Am I, sir? "'You most certainly are,' he assured him. "'You'll have to follow up this gadget fellow,' he paused, to see the effect of the announcement. "'That was my intention, sir,' said Peters. "'The deuce it was.' "'Yes, sir.' "'And you'll exert such influence as you possess with ex-private gadget, 
continued Smith, to extract from him full particulars, documentary or otherwise, as to the death or present whereabouts of one Alfred Warren of the Grange, Little Bilstead. That's where we now are. Very good, sir. And Peters once more drew forth his notebook. If he is difficult, suggest the war office, and, failing that, hint at publishing the story of his desertion. Very good, sir, repeated Peters, as he replaced the pencil in the slot at the back of his notebook and returned it to his pocket, a baleful look in his prominent eyes. And Peters? Yes, sir. After you have obtained the information I require, you can then get to work upon his face. Thank you, sir. Will that be all, sir? By the way, how long will it take you to get to German Street and back? He inquired casually. I think, sir, I ought to do it in a week, said Peters gravely, if the engine trouble doesn't get worse, sir. End of chapter 17《Chapter Eighteen of The Return of Alfred by Herbert George Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter Eighteen. Eric plays a part. One. I say, you haven't been. Eric paused and, screwing up his eyebrows, regarded Smith with the air of one who finds it difficult to express what is in his mind. I haven't been. Queried Smith. You know. I told you that you'd find Margie a—' "'A regular old water-jump,' suggested Smith, as the boy paused once more. "'You most certainly did, Eric.' "'You know, she's frightfully dece,' he added hastily, as if in his previous words he'd been guilty of disloyalty. "'But—' again he paused. "'But what?' inquired Smith. "'You see,' Eric continued, after frowning at Smith for several seconds. The sun was in his eyes, and he was puzzled how to proceed. "'You see, I'm afraid she doesn't altogether like you. "'Yet,' he added. "'I, too, had begun to suspect it,' said Smith dryly. "'Well, you see,' cried Eric, his brow clearing, "'we've got to make her.' "'We?' "'Yes, you and me. "'You see,' he continued confidentially, "'women are like that. "'They never like the fellows that they—that they, that they really like.' "'I see. "'You know—' Margie used to be quite all right until—until until she grew up. Eric was finding verbal expression somewhat difficult. Girls are like that. You should have seen her climb trees, he cried with enthusiasm. She would go up like a monkey. But now— His look expressed disgust. Am I to gather that, in your opinion, my learning to climb trees with agility would be a short cut to your sister's favour? inquired Smith. It wouldn't make a bit of diff, he said shaking his head lugubriously. You see, you did paint the place a bit perp, didn't you? Eric gazed at Smith with screwed-up eyes. Loyalty demanded that there should be some excuse for Marjorie's dislike. You mean Warren? Smith suggested. Ah, oh, I forgot the wang, grinned the boy. Anyhow, you can't blame Margie, can you? Far be it for me to blame anyone. You know, I've been thinking things over, and I've come to the— I think you're wrong. Wrong? About the wang, you know, he added hastily. I got the idea in church on Sunday. Smith nodded encouragingly. I don't often take notice of sermons. There was apology in his tone. But as it was about the sinner that repenteth, you know, and all that sort of thing, it reminded me of you. That was very nice of you, said Smith gravely, as he proceeded to fill his pipe. You see, Eric paused. "'I'm afraid I don't,' said Smith, without raising his eyes from his pipe-bowl. "'I say, I hope I don't seem impert. There was anxiety in his voice. "'On the contrary, I'm sure you're going to be extremely helpful,' said Smith, looking up with a smile. "'Carry on.' "'If you were to own up and say you really are A.W.,' he burst out, "'they'd soon forgive you, even if you are Mr. Smith,' he added apologetically. "'You see, there'll be another match next year.' and those blighters will be out for revenge, and I want you to bowl to me for practice," he added ingeniously. "'I see,' said Smith, as he struck a match and became absorbed in lighting his pipe. 
"'You never know just what Margie will do,' Eric continued, with the air of one who has experienced something of the vagaries of a woman's temperament. "'She might be all over you, if she thought you were sorry.' He paused, and gazed at Smith tentatively. "'Sorry for what?' he queried. "'Oh, for—for for everything. Of course, I don't remember much. But you made things pretty hot. I mean, A.W. did,' he added hastily, looking up uncertainly at Smith, as if in doubt as to how his remarks would be received. "'And you think,' said Smith, "'that if I were to own up to being an unspeakable blackguard, I might be forgiven?' "'Oh, I say, I didn't mean that, you know,' protested Eric hurriedly. "'You know, girls are so jolly funny. Margie'll take home any beastly mongrel if it looks miserable. She gets it from the dad. He's a topper.' "'In other words, you suggest that I should stoop, or rather grovel, to conquer?' "'I—' began Eric. Then he stopped. Put like that, somehow, the idea didn't seem quite right. "'I'll tell you something.' he said suddenly, with a hasty glance over his shoulder. "'There used to be a girl in a tuck-shop at Wilchester that I was awfully gone on. She wouldn't look at me, though, just tossed her head and sniffed. I heard afterwards she was engaged to a plumber, an awful cad. One day I cut my finger. Then she was all over me. After that I had to hurt myself once a week, but she always wanted to see the damage.' With difficulty Smith restrained a smile at the man of the worldly air with which Eric made his confession. "'But just where does what you call the wang come in? he inquired. You just own up, said Eric, after a slight hesitation. I always do, when they find out, he added, as an afterthought. I'll think it over, said Smith gravely. I suppose cutting my finger wouldn't do? Eric shook his head. Then, realizing that Smith was pulling his tip, as he was wont to express it, he grinned. You know, Margie's frightfully funny, he continued. Only last month she picked up a dog that had got run over. Covered in mud and blood it was. She spoiled her things. And we're not rich, you know, he added, to give point to the story. Eric, said Smith with the utmost solemnity, I find you most encouraging. For a moment the boy gazed at him doubtfully, but seeing not even the flicker of a smile upon Smith's grave face, he took heart. You just try it he advised. "'I say, you will bowl to me,' he added anxiously. "'I must get used to fast bowling by next year. I mean the goods, not half volleys, and full tosses to leg,' he added. "'A lot will, of course, depend on the wang,' said Smith meditatively. "'You just drop it, and see if I'm not right,' cried Eric, with a sigh of relief at the success of his diplomacy. "'Now I must talk,' and he made a movement to depart. "'By the way,' said Smith, you do not say how I'd best proceed. You see, I scarcely ever see Marjorie. You be at the edge of Buckdale Wood this afternoon, just after four, and I'll tell you then. Near the pond. You know it, don't you? he inquired anxiously. Intimately, said Smith. But why not tell me now? Can't. Frightfully busy. Slong. And with that he was gone. The mercenary young scamp, muttered Smith as he sucked at his pipe to sell a sister for bowling practice. 2. Smith was a few minutes late for his appointment with Eric, due to what seemed an obvious shortcut, but a dyke intervened, and he had been forced to go back. As he came within sight of the wood, he was surprised to see Marjorie sitting on the trunk of a fallen tree, with Nero grazing contentedly beside her. At the sound of Smith's approach, Nero raised an alert head. Recognizing his sugar-man, he gave a little snort of pleasure, and, disregarding his mistress, sharp, "'Come here, Nero!' walked to meet him. A moment later he was nuzzling Smith's pockets for sugar. "'I wish you wouldn't,' she began, and then stopped. "'Wish I wouldn't what?' he smiled. "'You make him so disobedient with—with with sugar,' she replied. "'Your mistress implies that you do not love me for myself alone,' said Smith lifting the horse's muzzle from the region of his pockets and gazing into his large, liquid eyes. Nero stretched forward and nibbled Smith's ear. "'You see?' laughed Smith. "'He denies it.' And he drew three lumps of sugar from his pocket and held them out to Nero, who proceeded to crunch them contentedly. "'Have you seen Eric?' Marjorie inquired, as she rose and glanced at her wrist-watch, a little impatiently, he thought. "'I was to meet him here at four o'clock.' 
I'm afraid he's been getting into mischief again. He was so mysterious about it. In his surprise, Smith was on the point of telling her that he, too, had an appointment with Eric by the edge of Buckdale Wood. Fortunately, he realized in time that Eric had merely taken another step towards ensuring continuous fast bowling practice. "'Eric,' he repeated vaguely, "'I saw him this morning.' He, in turn, glanced at his watch. It was a quarter past four. There was a short silence, which Nero occupied in a further investigation of Smith's pockets. He was by no means sure that the bondanza of sugar had yet been exhausted, and he was right. Marjorie caught the reins and gave them a tug. Nero blew through his lips as if in protest at such selfishness. "'Oh, please make him come away, Mr. Warren,' she pleaded. "'I hate hurting him. Nero, don't be so naughty.' She made another effort to pull his head from the vicinity of Smith's pockets. Then suddenly she laughed. Smith glanced down at her, surprise in his eyes. "'It's so absurd!' she cried. "'Unless you do something, or I hurt Nero, it seems as if we shall both be here for the rest of the day.' Without a word, Smith drew four more lumps of sugar from his pocket, which Nero fastened upon in a flash. "'That's all!' he cried. "'If you see Eric, will you tell him I've gone home?' said Marjorie, as she walked to Nero's side. "'He may have been detained,' suggested Smith, tentatively. She hesitated. "'It's only twenty minutes past four, he added, intent upon following up the advantage he felt he had gained. "'No more,' he cried, as Nero, having eaten the four lumps of sugar he had just received, was preparing for further investigation. Smith turned his coat pockets inside out. With a snort of contempt, Nero turned aside and proceeded to make pretense of grazing. "'Don't you think Nero might be permitted to finish his meal?' he suggested tentatively. "'He eats too much.' she said, with a little smile. As she spoke, she looked across at her favourite, who was moving from spot to spot, taking a nibble here and a nibble there, with the daintiness of a Victorian bell. "'Perhaps grass is an antidote for sugar,' suggested Smith gravely. She glanced at him quickly, to see if he were serious. "'Couldn't you just sit down just for ten minutes?' he said tentatively. "'I rather want to—' He paused. "'Perhaps Eric has been detained,' he added hastily. She turned to the tree-trunk, reseating herself where he had found her. He selected the least uncomfortable spot that the irregularities of the fallen monarch presented, and followed suit. He had longed for an opportunity such as this, and now it had presented itself he was at a loss what to say. In spite of himself, he smiled. Marjorie, too, was wondering why she had so meekly accepted the invitation of the man she had, in her own mind, vowed to avoid. She had found a certain embarrassment in his silence. At his smile she turned on him a look of interrogation. A sudden puck-like instinct prompted him to tell her the truth. "'I was wondering why I asked you to sit down,' he said, keeping his gaze on the pond, upon which no ripple broke the glass-like surface. Her eyes widened slightly. His remark was so unexpected. "'Was it not to wait for Eric?' she inquired, with perfect self-possession. She continued to regard him steadily. He could have sworn that, just for the fraction of a second, there was a flash of mischief in her eyes, but it was gone in an instant. "'It sounded worse than it really was,' he said with a smile, as he drew out his cigarette case and proffered it to her. She made a movement of refusal, and, a moment later, inclined her head slightly to the question in his eyes as he half drew a cigarette from the case. With great deliberation he proceeded to light it. "'I suppose what I really wanted,' he said, throwing away the match, "'was a quiet talk, without the feeling that at any moment you could flick Nero's rein and disappear.' "'But you're not sure?' she queried gravely. "'Emotionally, I'm never sure of anything,' he replied. "'That is the woman in me.' "'You are frank, at least.' The even tone of her voice irritated him. "'Is that a quality or a defect?' he inquired. "'Need we analyse everything?' she countered. "'When I was first misidentified,' he said, ignoring the question, and gazing at the blue spiral that rode through the still air from his cigarette, I asked Willis what he would do if he were suddenly accused of being the Lord High Admiral of Timbuktu, or some such place.' I forget the exact locality. His reply was that he would produce people to prove that he was Lady Warren's butler. He paused, 
but as she showed no inclination to speak, merely sitting with the air of one who is politely interested, he continued. "'That shows Willis to be a man capable of rising to a great occasion,' he continued. The answer was obviously correct. It indicated the only possible course open to him in the light of such a contingency. Her instinct was to ask why he did not profit by such wisdom, particularly as he believed in it, but she remained silent. "'Nero!' she called, as he showed a tendency to explore too large a tract of turf. Obedient to her voice, there being no sugar to lure him from his allegiance, he turned and proceeded to graze towards where they were sitting. "'Do you ever do things for which you can find no reasonable explanation?' he inquired. It was most infernally awkward approaching a difficult subject with one who gave you no help. She started slightly at the question. She could find no reasonable excuse for sitting on a tree trunk within a few feet of a man whom she was pledged cordially to dislike, as she told herself she did a dozen times a day. Sometimes, she conceded, her eyes following the slow and deliberate movements of the contented Nero, who, from time to time, cast an inquiring glance in her direction, as if to assure himself that she were still there. "'That is the case with me at the present moment.' he said quietly. "'I don't know why I'm here.' "'No, I don't mean here on this old tree,' he added hurriedly, as she made a movement as if to rise. "'I mean in Little Bilstead.' For the first time she looked interested, at the same time puzzled by his remark. "'Do you really think,' he continued, "'that any self-respecting man would deliberately endeavour to be taken for Alfred Warren?' He paused, and as she remained silent, he went on. Even Willis found it difficult to camouflage the spots of the family leopard. When I asked him a few leading questions about my alleged past, it was quite a picture to see him struggling between loyalty to the family and a truthful upbringing. Still she made no reply. Then there is that dear old creature of a nurse, who insists on delving into the past with which I am credited, for reminiscences of the most intimate and embarrassing nature concerned with what happened a quarter of a century ago. This time Marjorie smiled. She had bitten her underlip until it was sore. The picture of Mrs. Higgs, as she had appeared the night of Smith's arrival, was too irresistibly funny, even for her present mood of austerity. "'Can you imagine any man,' he persisted, deliberately assuming the rather murky past of another for no conceivable reason? He paused for her to reply. "'Frankly, I cannot,' she said simply. "'And yet?' "'That is what you attribute to me,' he continued. "'According to all I hear, it even involves danger to life and limb.' He flicked the ash from his cigarette with a mechanical fourth finger, a habit he had contracted in the trenches. "'If you are not, Mr. Warren,' she began in a low, even tone, "'don't you think you have been a little cruel?' "'Cruel?' he exclaimed, startled. "'Cruel to whom?' to Lady Warren, was the quiet reply. No doubt half a dozen people have written, telling her, that her son has returned, and— Good Lord! he cried. I hadn't thought of that. He watched her as, with a twig, she picked at a piece of moss on the tree trunk. But they don't know her address, he protested, with the air of one seeking to defend himself against what he knows to be a just charge. That would not prevent certain people writing, she said and he noticed that she stressed the certain ever so slightly. They know she is staying in Cape Town, and a letter addressed to the shipping company on whose boat she travelled would reach her. "'I hadn't thought of that,' said Smith, tossing away his half-smoked cigarette and proceeding to light another. Here was an entirely new factor in a situation that was already rich in embarrassments. "'Do you think I ought to go away at once?' he asked, conscious of the unreasoning eagerness with which he awaited her reply. "'That is not a subject on which I can advise,' she said gravely. "'Why?' "'Because I do not know all there is to know,' she replied simply. He was conscious that she had thought somewhat, that her manner was less unsympathetic. For nearly a minute there was silence, broken at length by Smith. "'I want to ask you a question,' he said. "'Yes?' she turned to him with slightly lifted brows. Do you really think that I am Alfred Warren, knowing what you do about him, and having seen what you have of me? 
he gazed steadily into her eyes. "'Everyone recognizes you as Mr. Warren,' she replied after a short pause. There was a note of hesitation in her voice. "'Yes, but you?' he persisted. "'I... I...' She stopped short. "'It is impossible for me to say.' and her eyes dropped before his intense gaze. "'Does that mean that in your heart you don't?' he asked, in his eagerness leaning slightly towards her. "'Please!' There was genuine distress, both in her tone and her look, as she lifted her eyes once more to his, her red, moist lips slightly parted. "'I thought women always knew such things by intuition,' he said, half to himself. She continued to regard him, a puzzled look in her eyes. It was as if she were seeking to draw something from him without the aid of speech. She was conscious that her reason had never been less in control of the situation. "'If you are not Mr. Warren,' she said at length, speaking slowly and deliberately, "'why do you not say who you are?' "'Because,' he paused, "'because there are reasons why I prefer to be known as James Smith.' he said quietly, conscious that, in spite of his endeavour to keep his tone friendly, there was an implied snub in his words. She rose and called to Nero. "'I must go now,' she said. A few moments later she was in the saddle, Nero impatiently pawing the ground. She hesitated before giving the signal that would take them careering over the countryside. Smith looked up at her curiously. It seemed as if she wished to say something, which she found some difficulty in putting into words. "'I think I ought to tell you,' she said at length. "'Robert Thurkettle is coming back.' In spite of himself, Smith started. The remark was so entirely unexpected. She was gazing down at him, the same look in her eyes that he had noticed before, as if she would penetrate behind the veil of his words. "'When?' he asked at length, conscious that the question might easily be translated into anxiety. "'This week.' "'How do you know?' "'The groom, Nudd, told me in confidence,' she added, flushing slightly. "'His father told him. No one else knows.' "'And why do you tell me?' Smith inquired, conscious that there was a note of sternness in his voice. "'I... I thought you might want to... to...' Her eyes dropped beneath the anger that blazed in his... A moment later Nero was outraged by feeling the touch of the light riding switch she always carried. He plunged forward, angry that his sugar-man should have seen him subjected to so great an indignity. As they disappeared from sight, Smith returned to the fallen tree, where he proceeded to fill his pipe, a stern, uncompromising look in his usually smiling blue eyes. "'Damn Alfred Warren!' he muttered. "'Is it all right?' A red head was poked out from behind a hedge a few yards away. "'If I catch you!' cried Smith angrily, looking about him for the head that had disappeared at the first sign of danger. "'I'll—I'll I'll toss you into the pond!' And he made a dive for a clump of bushes next to the one from which Eric was in a rapid but orderly retreat. "'Margie's given him a chill on the live,' he muttered philosophically a minute later, as he took a potshot at a robin on a hawthorn tree. What price my bowling prack now? End of chapter 18、chapter、19 19 of The Return of Alfred by Herbert George Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter 19 Sir John Hildreth inserts an advertisement. 1. Is this your doing, John? Mrs. Compton Stacy held out to her brother a copy of the Times, folded so as to give prominence to the agony column, at the same time pointing to an advertisement which read, James Smith, wanted news of one calling himself James Smith, known to be an alias, last seen in the neighbourhood of Winchester on June 23rd, with suitcase, kit bag and raincoat, age 28, height 5 feet 10 inches, fair, blue eyes, attractive personality. A reward of twenty-five pounds will be paid for news that will lead to the discovery of the present whereabouts of the said James Smith. Apply to True Love and Murchison, solicitors, 
384, Lincoln's Inn Fields, London, W.C. "'Well, what's the matter with it?' demanded Sir John Hildreth, with the truculence of one who already stands self-condemned. "'Is Mr. Murchison responsible for the literary part?' inquired Mrs. Compton Stacy as she replaced the paper on the table. "'No, he's not,' was the curt reply. "'I'm not a fool that I have to go to my solicitor to draw up an advertisement.' "'You composed it yourself, then?' she queried. "'Of course I did,' he retorted. "'I got it out of a book. At least, I got the idea,' he added. "'A novel?' she queried, with that quiet insistence which always gave her brother the feeling that he was once more a schoolboy sent up before the head. "'It was a story I was reading.' Sir John was an inveterate reader of novels of the more sensational order. "'Of course, I altered it.' Mrs. Compton Stacy rose and walked over to her brother's favourite chair, on which was lying a book. Picking it up, she read aloud the title, The Bloodstained Boot. Opening it at a place where a leaf was turned down, she glanced first at the page before her, then at her brother, who stood with guilt stamped all over him. Finally, she returned to the page. The adaptation is admirable she said a few minutes later, as she returned to her chair, carrying the book with her. "'But the advertisement in the book concerns a man suspected of murder,' she added, as she resumed her seat. "'Unfortunately, you have retained the same atmosphere in your own wording.' "'There's nothing about murder,' he cried, unable to keep out of his voice the apprehension he felt. "'It simply offers a reward for news of—of of Darrell.' "'Well, we shall see,' she said, with the air of one who herself has no doubt whatever about the matter. "'An advertisement like that may make things extremely awkward for the boy.' "'How?' he demanded, now thoroughly disconcerted. "'At Scotland Yard, I believe, they are inveterate readers of newspapers. The implication of the words calling himself and alias is clearly that of fraud.' "'But I didn't say so.' he cried, seizing the times, reading the advertisement again, and finally tossing the paper back upon the table, after which he stood staring blankly at his sister. "'You had better marry Vera Trescombe, John,' she said, nodding her head slightly, which with her always indicated disapproval. "'Better a crinkled nose in a wife than a crinkled brain in a bachelor.' "'I won't be bullied like this, Charlotte,' he blazed. "'You disapprove of everything I do.' You, and who is generally right? She inquired calmly. You or I? Confound it! I refuse to discuss the matter with you. He cried angrily, putting up a barrage of wrath to hide his discomfiture. Why didn't you say all this before I sent off those infernal advertisements? I put it in the Morning Post and the Daily Telegraph too. You always blame me after, after it's done. For one thing. I was not aware that you intended to advertise, she said, rising. Her calmness on such occasions infuriated him. And for another. It was you who told me to do it, he interrupted. And for another, she continued imperturbably. You seldom, if ever, take advice, John. You prefer to allow me to help pick up the pieces afterwards. But didn't you advise me to advertise for him? he demanded, planting himself directly in her path to the door. "'To the best of my recollection,' she said, as she made a detour around him, "'you remarked that you would be damned if you did.' And as she passed, she gave him a little smile, which told him that they were still friends. Without that smile, he would have been wretched for the rest of the day, although he did not know it. "'Damn that fellow Peters!' he grumbled as he closed the door. "'What the devil did he want to grow that that infernal moustache for! If he'd been here—' He did not finish the sentence, but threw himself into his chair, and glared at a bust of Disraeli. Then, suddenly, he recollected that he had not told his sister of his master stroke in writing to Peters. The thought of it soothed his wounded feelings, and, rising, he mixed himself a whisky and soda. 2. Jane! In her excitement, Miss Mary started forward, and, with the edge of the morning post, upset her coffee-cup. Miss Jell slightly lowered the times. 
she always read the times at breakfast, and gazed disapprovingly across at her sister. "'Ring the bell, Mary,' she said, "'and tell the maid to bring a cloth.' Miss Jell prided herself upon her restraint, even in moments of crisis. It annoyed her intensely for any one to soil a tablecloth, but the act once committed, she accepted it with stoical calm, which she considered was due to her self-respect as a gentlewoman. "'But look, Jane!' cried Miss Mary, and she held out the copy of the Morning Post, indicating the agony column with a malmanicured forefinger. "'It's him!' she cried, ungrammatically. Then, her eyes falling on the dark stain which was slowly spreading, she dashed over to the bell-push and pressed it. "'Miss Mary has had an accident,' said Miss Jell, with cold composure, as the maid entered. Miss Jell always referred to her as the maid. For one thing, it was more refined, and for another, she did not approve of the nomenclature of the lower orders. "'Dap it gently, and then put a dinner-mat underneath,' she ordered. Having provided for the crisis which her sister's impetuosity had precipitated, Miss Jell turned to the newspaper that had been thrust into her hands. "'It's in the agony column!' cried Miss Mary, hardly able to control her voice. "'The third down! Isn't it dreadful?' Miss Jell lowered her eyes and read, "'James Smith. Wanted news of one calling himself James Smith, known to be an alias, last seen in the neighbourhood of Winchester on June 23rd with suitcase, kit-bag, and raincoat, age twenty-eight, height five feet ten inches, fair, with blue eyes, attractive personality. A reward of twenty-five pounds will be paid for news that will lead to the discovery of the present whereabouts of the said James Smith. Apply to True Love and Murchison, Solicitors, 384, Lincoln's Inn Fields, London, W.C. Having read the advertisement twice, Miss Jell returned the paper to her sister. Composure was another quality upon which she prided herself. "'What do you think, Jane?' asked Miss Mary, quivering with excitement, which she controlled with difficulty, knowing her sister's prejudice against any expression of emotion. "'I think it most deplorable, Mary. The man is obviously a bad character, whether he is Alfred Warren or not.' "'But, but—' Miss Mary paused, and looked anxiously at her sister. "'Well?' Miss Jell lifted her chin slightly. Miss Mary recognized it as a danger signal. N "'Nothing, Jane,' she stuttered. "'Say what you were going to say, Mary,' ordered Miss Jell. "'I—I I was only going to mention that the—that there is a reward.' The last three words came out with a rush, and Miss Mary held her breath. "'There is a reward for those who choose to claim it,' was the icy rejoinder and the vision of the new dining-room carpet that had floated before Miss Mary's eyes vanished. She sighed, realizing that somebody else in Little Bilstead would inevitably acquire what she had already come to look upon as the property of the Cedars. During the rest of the meal each was unusually preoccupied, Miss Mary in condoling with herself over the loss of a dining-room carpet, Miss Jell in wrestling with her breeding. Just at the moment when she arrived at the conclusion, that it was the duty of every British subject to assist in bringing a criminal to justice. Miss Marshall was engaged in slapping her father vigorously between his shoulder-blades. It was Mr. Marshall's practice at breakfast to prop the Daily Telegraph up in front of him. He generally used the coffee-pot for the purpose. During the whole of the meal his eyes were seldom removed from its columns. Food he conveyed to his mouth mechanically, and he would drink, absorbing the news of the world over the rim of his cup. It was this custom that had brought about disaster, the self-same advertisement that had caused Miss Mary Jell to upset her coffee-cup, had met the eye of Mr. Marshall just as he was swallowing, with the result that a portion of the weak tea with which he washed down his frugal breakfast had, as he explained later to his daughter, gone the wrong way. When Mr. Marshall had acquired a working supply of oxygen, he pointed to the paragraph which had caused all the trouble. His throat was too sore for speech. "'Father!' cried Miss Marshall, having read the advertisement, which she promptly translated into a pair of trousers, a blouse, and a new dinner service, respectively for her father, herself, and the house, with a handsome balance to be allocated later. "'A pen and ink!' gasped Mr. Marshall. The word ink came out like an order from a drill-sergeant as Mr. Marshall trailed off into another paroxysm of coughing. 
and Miss Marshall went to do her parents' bidding. Four other breakfast tables in Little Bilstead were that morning rendered intensely dramatic by the announcement that news of James Smith was so eagerly desired as to be worth the sum of twenty-five pounds to the advertiser. By ten o'clock quite a number of interested people were aware that James Smith was wanted, and, not being overburdened with charity, they assumed the worst. Tom Bassingthwaite heard it from Mrs. Crane's maid, who had noticed that Dr. Crane's attention was divided between the agony column of the Times and removing the bones of a bloater from his mouth with his fingers. She had overheard a remark he had made to Mrs. Crane, in which the word reward had been mentioned. Having a good sight, she had managed to read the advertisement over the doctor's shoulder, and, having no arrière pensée she had confided the news to Tom Bassingthwaite when he brought the letters. That morning, very few people got their due, as the post office understood it, although many received letters to which they were not entitled. Tom Bassingthwaite was doing some deep thinking, instead of devoting his entire attention to His Majesty's mails. It was not until he reached the vicarage, which lay towards the end of his round, that he saw his way clear. Inspiration came in the shape of little Bobby Grieve, who was hastening towards him with a vicar's morning paper. "'You be late, Bobby,' remarked Tom Bassingthwaite pleasantly. "'Slap over myself,' panted the breathless Bobby. "'I'll take it up,' said the postman good-naturedly, relieving the lad of the vicarage copy of the Times. With a suppressed explosion which really meant thanks, Bobby darted off. It was when he was halfway up the drive that Tom Bassingthwaite had his inspiration. He had already realized the danger of this fugitive from justice, as in his own mind he already classified Smith, making a bold of it. If the vicarage received no paper that morning, this danger would be removed, or at least considerably lessened, as it was very unlikely that anyone would warn Smith that a price was upon his head. They would prefer to make an effort to obtain the reward. Tom Bassingthwaite had lived too long in Little Bilstead to be in any doubt as to the characters of its inhabitants. Feeling like a detective in one of the paper-covered stories upon which he fed ravenously, the postman thrust the copy of the Times into his bag. From then on everybody got their proper ration of correspondence. The postman knew that in Little Bilstead they were inveterate readers of newspapers. He foresaw a number of applications for the reward, and it perturbed him. That fact had been responsible for the mistakes in distribution. By three o'clock that afternoon his worst forebodings were realized, as there were no less than nine letters addressed to the Messrs. True Love and Murchison, his own being the tenth. With great deliberation he placed these nine letters under the counter, letting the tenth go forward. There were times, he reasoned, when postal delays were unavoidable. That night of the pigeons it was noticed that Tom Bassingthwaite was in a state of high good humour. He drank two ciders, three old ales, and sang one song, eventually returning home at an hour that augured ill for the punctual delivery of the morrow's letters. When Smith walked through the village that morning, he was conscious that he was arousing more than usual interest. The sporting element was still as cordial in its greetings, whilst the unsporting scowled at him as darkly as ever. Still, he was conscious of an atmosphere of suppressed excitement, and he was puzzled. It was possible, of course, that some hitherto unsuspected misdemeanour of Alfred Warren had been unearthed, in which case the explosion would probably take place later. He noticed, among other things, that Postle was in full uniform, with carefully blackened boots. It was a tradition in Little Bilsett that for John Postle to blacken his boots boded ill for somebody. It was his method of emphasizing the fact that dramatic events were pending. For some days past, Smith had been debating upon the advisability of continuing his journey. The railway strike had ended in a compromise, as such things invariably do, after all the damage has been done. There were many reasons why he would have liked to stay in Little Bilstead, not the least of which was the fact that it provided both comedy and drama, with a special tendency towards the unexpected. As he approached the pigeons, he observed John Nudd, who was standing at the door, suddenly turn and bolt into the inn, as if undesirous of being recognized. As a matter of fact, he had just remembered leaving the newspaper on the counter, and, as he had already written and posted an application for the twenty-five-pound reward, 
he was not taking any chances. Reappearing, as Smith came past the door, he nodded and proceeded to watch him until he was out of sight up the road. Smith finally decided that the secret of Thurkettle's return had leaked out and was responsible for the electricity in the atmosphere. That day Smith was late for luncheon. He had walked on, forgetful of the time, as he pondered Marjorie's words. Had he been cruel in staying on? He had suggested the possibility to Miss Lipscombe the night before at dinner, and she had replied, Rubbish! proceeding to point out that even if he had gone at once, the damage was already done. Marjorie's too young to understand, had been her final comment. He had wondered. End of chapter 19《his face deathly white, the corners of his mouth twitching, and his hands working as if he were unable to control them. "'Is anything the matter, Willis?' he inquired, hastening across to the butler. "'Bob Thurkettle's back, Mr. Alfred,' he stuttered, and the trembling of his hands and the twitching of his mouth seemed to increase. "'I've run all the way from the Grange to warn you, sir.' "'That was very foolish,' said Smith gravely. "'Why should you want to warn me?' "'You mustn't go out, sir,' he quavered huskily. "'He'll kill you, sir!' He swayed slightly, and appeared to be on the point of collapse. "'Sit down, Willis,' said Smith gently, forcing him into a chair. "'You look thoroughly ill.' "'I... I'm all right, Mr. Alfred. Thank you,' he stuttered, giving the lie to his words by the greyness of his features and the beads of perspiration on his brow. "'Ask Miss Lipscomb if she'll come here.' said Smith, turning to Janet, who stood an open-mouthed spectator, and bring some brandy. A minute later, Miss Lipscombe had taken the matter in hand, and was holding a glass of brandy and water to Willis' grey lips. Slowly he drank, with the obedience of a child. Presently he sighed, and the colour returned to his cheeks. He strove to rise, but Miss Lipscombe restrained him. "'Now sit still, Willis,' she said gently, "'and do as you are told.' I will send Janet for Dr. Crane. No, miss, please don't, miss, he expostulated. It's only a passing faintness. I've been hurrying, he gasped, his gaze all the time fixed fearfully upon Smith. Dear me, dear me, murmured the vicar, appearing at the dining-room door, his vague eyes resting upon Willis, sitting limply in the chair. It must be the hot weather. Rubbish! was Miss Lipscombe's comment. "'When a man of Willis' age will run about the countryside as he says he has been doing, what do you expect?' The vicar continued to gaze at the inert form of the butler, mild reproach in his eye. "'Very wrong,' he murmured. "'Very dangerous, too. I was once excellent at the sprint myself. But not now,' he murmured sadly. "'Not now.' "'If you go trotting about like a two-year-old, Willis,' said Smith, "'we shall have you taking to your bed, "'and then what will everybody do at the Grange?' "'It was Mrs. Higgs sent me,' murmured Willis. "'She's having hysterics,' he added, "'with the air of one who announces that another is taking a bath. "'Mrs. Death had a vision last night,' he added gravely. "'So we were—' "'He stopped suddenly, his eyes fixed appealingly upon Smith.' The corners of Miss Lipscombe's mouth twitched, as she made a motion to her brother to return to the dining-room. For a moment the vicar stood regarding her uncertainly, then, having looked behind him, and on either side, to see if there were any one to whom she was signalling, he realised her sign was for him, and turned obediently into the dining-room, followed by his sister and Janet. "'Mr. Alfred,' whispered Willis, having assured himself by a hasty glance that the dining-room door was closed. "'Don't go into the village to-day, sir. 
if you do, Bob Thurkettle will, will, oh, it's terrible, he broke off, moaning. Don't you worry your foolish old head about me, Willis, said Smith, with a reassuring smile, and tell Mrs. Higgs I'll bring her the redoubtable Thurkettle's head on a salver. You won't go, Mr. Alfred, will you? he begged. He, he threatened to kill you, sir. So I understand. And he's so strong, sir. Is he? By the way, Willis, has it ever struck you that two can play at the killing game? But, Mr. Alfred, you wouldn't have a chance with him, he quavered. He, he may have his gun. So you expect me to stay in the grounds and never go out, Willis? Smith queried, smiling down at him. Is that it? Yes, sir, it would be safer, counselled Willis. It would certainly be safer, he agreed, but would it be altogether dignified, do you think? Willis' eyes dropped beneath Smith's gaze. There was about him nothing of the paladin. You won't go out, Mr. Alfred, will you? he implored, rising shakily from his chair. I must get back to Mrs. Higgs, sir. Miss Marjorie's out, and Mrs. Death may have another vision, sir, and there's no one to look after things. He tottered towards the hall door. "'I'll come part of the way with you,' said Smith, taking the old man gently by the arm. A vision-seeing cook was a bit of a responsibility, he decided. At the vicarage gate Willis insisted that he was quite well again, and as he seemed able to get on alone, Smith retraced his steps to the vicarage. He was not feeling so easy in his own mind as his words implied. It was a beastly awkward situation, he decided. If he did not appear in the village, or go about the neighbourhood as usual, people would inevitably say that he was afraid. If, on the other hand, he did appear, there would undoubtedly be a row. Thurkettle might even attempt to shoot him. Quite apart from that, however, the fellow appeared to have a big reputation as a fighter. The worst of it was, Smith found his sympathies entirely with his self-constituted enemy. The man was acting only as a man should act under such provocation as he had received. The unfortunate thing was that the real Alfred was not there to receive the chastisement he so richly deserved. It was obvious that he must go down to the village and show himself, otherwise he would be branded as a craven, and he felt he should be making a poor return for the hospitality he had received at the Grange if he allowed such a stigma to rest upon Lady Warren's reputed son. As he re-entered the dining-room, he heard the vicar say, "'They must shake hands, Hannah.' "'Shake fiddlesticks! You—' She stopped suddenly at the sight of Smith. "'You know,' he queried, as he resumed his seat at the table. She nodded. "'Janet told us,' she said. In her eyes there was a strange expression that puzzled him. It suggested both anxiety and expectation. He was conscious that she was watching him keenly. As for Janet, each time she had occasion to enter the room she fixed on Smith a pair of round, terrified eyes, and her gaze did not leave his face until interrupted by the closing of the door behind her. "'I think,' said Miss Lipscombe, after an almost embarrassing silence, that it would be better to let the vicar see Possel before you go into the village. "'I am going to the village this afternoon, Miss Lipscombe,' he said quietly, replacing his coffee-cup in the saucer. He could have sworn that the look which sprang into Miss Lipscombe's eyes was one of relief. For nearly a minute she continued to regard him steadily. "'This Thurkettle is a big man, Mr. Smith,' she said at length. "'And he has reason—' She hesitated. "'So I understand,' was his calm retort. "'I have made some excellent friends, owing to my likeness to Alfred Warren, and I must not refuse to encounter one of his enemies. It wouldn't be quite cricket,' he smiled. "'Would it now?' "'And you really mean to go?' "'Even with you and the vicar hanging on to my coat-tails,' he smiled. This time there was no doubt about the look in Miss Lipscombe's eyes. It was relief. She had dreaded finding the feet of clay she expected to be there. "'It is very difficult to know what to do,' she murmured, looking across at the vicar, who was dreamily gazing out of the window. "'Very difficult,' she repeated, shaking her head slightly as she rose from the table. 
"'I think I'll finish training that rather self-willed Dorothy Perkins,' said Smith, as he, too, rose. "'Another hour ought to bring her to reason,' he added. He had no intention of placing himself at a disadvantage by joining issue with the local Dempsey immediately after a meal. A little relaxation with Dorothy Perkins would make all the difference in his speed, and from what he had heard it was in speed alone that his chance lay, provided, of course, it came to blows. Dorothy Perkins took rather longer than the hour he had allotted to her. Moreover, she was spiteful and pricked his fingers. It was not until three o'clock that he went to his room to change into an easy jacket and a pair of rubber-soled tennis shoes. There was nothing like being prepared. Slipping out of the back way, he made a detour round the house and struck the drive halfway towards the gate. As he did so, he caught a glimpse of Marjorie disappearing round the bend in the direction of the vicarage. Had she, too, come to warn him against the danger that threatened? His jaw set in a grim line. To inherit another man's sins was bad enough, but to be credited with his cowardice was intolerable. As he strode along the road towards the village, he almost hoped that Bob Thurkettle would show fight. It was his intention to take a stroll through the village for half a mile and return the same way. This would give his man time to appear. Of course, Thurkettle might prefer the infinitely surer way of potting him from behind a friendly hedge, but he must take his chance of that. Still, it was not a pleasant sensation walking along a highway with the knowledge that, somewhere in the near vicinity, was a man thirsting for your blood, a man who at any moment might be gazing along the barrel of a gun preparatory to letting fly. As he walked, his thoughts drifted back to his Oxford days, when Old Plum, an ex-prize fighter, would mix it with any one who made it worth his while. "'Give and take, gentlemen, if you please,' had been the burden of his exhortation, "'and don't be afraid of the ginger.' As Old Plum himself gave considerably more ginger than he took, his clientele was recruited exclusively from the hardiest and the heaviest of the year's boxing men. Suddenly Smith was startled by a small boy darting out from the hedge some fifty yards or so ahead, and scuttling off for all he was worth along the road. "'A jackal,' he murmured. "'Thank the Lord for old Plum.' Two. The news of Bob Thurkettle's return had spread through Little Bilstead with almost incredible rapidity. It had found Mr. Marshall going over the leg-bone of a rabbit with his back teeth, Miss Marshall watching him anxiously, lest it should slip from his grasp. She was always anxious when her father got to the bones, especially fish-bones. Mr. Marshall hurried over the boiled suet-pudding in a way that convinced his daughter he would have indigestion. This would mean a sleepless night for her, for with Mr. Marshall indigestion was a vocal affair of agonized octaves. After a final look round to see that there was nothing further to devour, he hastened down to the village to buy a stamp. To Little Bilstead, Tom Bassingthwaite was what a tape machine is to a London club, the centre of interest in times of crisis. By a strange coincidence, Miss Mary Jell, on hearing the news, also found herself out of stamps, and was promptly forbidden to go near the village until the danger was over. Never had she felt more like rebellion. For the first time in her placid and docile existence she realized the disadvantages of a sheltered life. She knew that her sister would go into the village to see that everything was as it should be. Miss Jell was like that. She would eat plums when they first came in to see if they were ripe, and then forbid her sister to touch one for fear of cholera. How wonderful it must be to be wicked, was Miss Mary's half-expressed thought as she picked up her knitting needles and proceeded with what Miss Jell always referred to as a garment. To Miss Jell all such things were garments, without amplification, except when absolutely necessary. The news caught Colonel Enderby bolting curry, his bald head dotted with moisture. He both took and gave things that were hot. Of social little Bilstead he was first upon the scene, for, being an Anglo-Indian, he ate curry with spoon and fork, which considerably increased the rate of intake. "'What's the meaning of this postle? he barked, as he overtook the constable, with his newly polished boots just outside the village. Postle halted, turned, and gaped, in one and the same movement. The colonel, as he called him, always had the same effect upon the little Bilstead policeman, seeming to petrify him. "'Well, confound you! Can't you answer?' he shouted. The curry had not settled down as it should. 
I see Tom Simmons, I did, Postle spluttered. And he said to me, John, that there Bob Thurkett'll be back, so I— Be damned to you, shouted the colonel, as he strode angrily on, leaving the gaping Postle to follow at his own pace. He had never been able to settle down to the detailed narrative style of the Norfolk rustic. At the sight of his natural enemy stalking towards the post-office, Tom Bassingthwaite scuttled to cover like a frightened rabbit, leaving his sister to bear the brunt of the explosion he knew was coming. The colonel might threaten to report her, but, even if she heard, she would take no notice. The demand for stamps that day, in small numbers and of small denominations, constituted a record, beating by three halfpence the previous highest total, achieved on the morning following the sudden and unexpected appearance of Smith. The fact that Tom Bassingthwaite had gone to earth was as great a disappointment to little Bilstead as it was to him. But the colonel might return at any moment, and the village postman was frankly afraid of his bark. Once in the village, social little Bilstead was rather at a loss what to do. It could not go on buying stamps, for which it had ostensibly come. Miss Jell alone showed any originality. She bought some matches, which she did not want, and a periodical she had no intention of reading. Mrs. Trusbert Green and Mrs. Crane arrived together, but from different ends of the village. Five minutes later, Mrs. Spellman, with a very red face and no breath, was seen making for the post-office at what was practically the double. She had been the last to hear the news, but she had got off with a flying start and odd shoes. She alone of all her set made no pretense of wanting stamps. She came for scandal, bloodshed if possible, but certainly scandal. "'What do you think of it?' she panted, as she rushed up to Miss Jell, who had adopted the tactics of walking slowly through the village and back, as if she'd been a seaside flapper and little Bilstead the front. Miss Jell gazed coldly at Mrs. Spellman's flushed features. Without waiting for a reply or a further supply of breath, Mrs. Spellman plunged on. "'I only heard ten minutes ago. Have you seen them? Isn't it dreadful? I shall scream if you bring the gun. Where's Postle? It will be in all the papers. What a scandal! Have they warned him?' She looked about her at the little group of villagers and at the larger group in front of the pigeons. The air was electrical. People talked in hushed voices and glanced continually in the direction which anyone coming from the vicarage must take. Within five minutes Mrs. Spellman had proved a rallying point. Throwing overboard the postage stamp camouflage, social little Bilstead gathered about her and talked. Colonel Enderby threw out denunciations like squibs. Mr. Marshall, who had now been joined by his daughter, listened with his mouth. Mrs. Trusbert Green ascribed the tragedy they all foresaw to the will of the Almighty. Miss Jell was restrained almost to the point of screaming. Mrs. Crane looked on and, in consequence, saw most of the game, whilst from behind a tree in the distance Miss Mary Jell gazed longingly towards what was to her a land of promise. Everybody wondered what had become of Postle. Colonel Enderby announced his intention of reporting him by telephone to the chief commissioner at Scotland Yard. In the meantime the village constable was drinking a mug of ale in the private parlour of the pigeons. Opposite him sat a big black-bearded man, with lowering brow and sullen, smouldering eye. "'Now, Bob, I can't have no shooting bore,' Postle remarked, as he replaced his empty mug upon the table. "'There won't be no shooting,' growled the bearded man. "'But there may be bloody murder for all that.' And he picked up his mug and drained it at a draught. Three. "'Here he be! Here he be!' A small boy was running down the hill at breakneck speed towards the village, shouting as he ran. A thrill passed through the little groups. Every head was turned in the direction from which the boy was running. There was a movement among the crowd outside the pigeons. A silence fell upon every one. Only the shuffling of feet upon the gritty road was to be heard. Suddenly there was a murmur, a sort of moan of expectancy, such as preludes the cheers with which a boat race is acclaimed. All eyes were directed towards the top of the hill, down which the boy was running. There was a gasp, a catching of many breaths, as Smith appeared, round the bend, smoking a cigarette and walking as if nothing had happened, or was likely to happen. Why he had lighted the cigarette he did not know. Probably for the same reason that the hero in a melodrama falls back upon tobacco, when the villain has him at a disadvantage. 
it emphasized the indifference he was far from feeling. In spite of his apparent unconcern, Smith was a little staggered at the sight the village street presented. It seemed as if the whole population had turned out in his honor. It removed from his mind the last vestige of a doubt that he was on the eve of dramatic developments. As he approached, he noticed a movement among those gathered outside the pigeons. A moment later, a heavily built, dark-whiskered man came out. For a moment he stood looking about him. Then, with a curious, shambling gait like the lope of a bear, he proceeded to walk in the direction from which Smith was approaching. Immediately behind him came Nudd, with Tom Simmons in attendance. The crowd also got in motion. As Smith regarded the huge proportions of the man approaching him, he was thankful that he had taken the precaution of changing his boots for shoes. With such an antagonist, he argued, his feet would be of far more use than his hands. Only by nimble footwork could he hope to avoid the onslaught of some fourteen or fifteen stone of muscle and flesh. If the man were a scientific boxer, then his number was up, he decided. Whatever happened, it would have to be short and sharp, as far as he was concerned. With outward calm and unconcern, he approached the black-bearded man, who walked some four or five yards in front of the crowd. In the excitement of the moment, caste was forgotten. Miss Jell found herself clinging to the coat-sleeve of Tom Bassingthwaite, whose teeth were chattering like castanets. Colonel Enderby was craning forward over the head of Millie Marjoram, whilst Mrs. Truspitt Green, Mrs. Crane, and the Marshalls were wedged in among a group of farmhands. Miss Mary Jell was actually running down the hill towards the scene of the drama. Human frailty had triumphed over her fear of what Jane would say. P.C. Postle was nowhere to be seen. Several intimates had made it clear to him that if he interfered there would be trouble, and he would inevitably be the centre of it. He had therefore wisely decided to leave the pigeons by the back entrance, and at that moment was making a wide detour in the hope of being in at the death. He hated missing the fight, but it was difficult to see how he could stand by and watch what he was paid to prevent from taking place. Smith edged a little to the right, in order to give the man an opportunity of passing him, if he were so inclined. Thurkettle, on the other hand, left no doubt in anybody's mind as to his intentions. At the sight of Smith edging away, he evidently thought that he meditated flight. "'Look out together!' he cried over his shoulder, obviously to friends in the crowd behind. When within a few yards of Thurkettle, Smith stopped, as to continue would have meant running up against him. "'So you've returned, Boer,' said Thurkettle insolently. Smith eyed him with calm deliberation. "'I think you have made a mistake,' he remarked quietly. Thurkettle laughed mirthlessly. "'So that's your lay, is it?' he cried. "'But that can't save you. I suppose you aren't, Alfred Warren.' Then, with a sudden access of rage, he broke out, "'You mucky slink! You know what you've done to my poor mother!' Smith flushed slightly at the insolence of the man's tone. Seeing that an encounter was inevitable, he kept a wary eye for a sudden onslaught. "'As a matter of fact, I am not Mr. Alfred Warren.' He laid a slight stress upon the mister. "'I have never seen you before, and I know nothing about your daughter.' Sir Kettle hesitated a moment. He seemed nonplussed by Smith's quiet and deliberate manner. He had expected fear, protestations, abjectness. He was puzzled. "'You hear him together,' he cried over his shoulder. There was an ominous murmur from some of those grouped behind him. Turning to Smith once more, he said, "'I was going to shoot you, as I should have done seven years ago, but now I'm just going to break every bone in your stinking body.' With that he proceeded to take off his coat, with the studied deliberation of a man who knows that his quarry cannot escape him. This he threw on the ground, his hat following. He then began turning up his shirt-sleeves. "'One moment,' said Smith, quietly. "'I call these people to witness that this dispute has been thrust upon me. Whatever the consequences, the responsibility will lie entirely with you.' He looked straight into Thurkettle's blazing eyes. He had scarcely finished speaking before the fellow made a wild rush at him, head down and arms swinging. Although Smith had been speaking to those behind Thurkettle, his eyes had been fixed upon him. Swiftly sidestepping, he let him blunder past. With a feeling of relief, Smith realized that he was opposed to nothing more than brute strength. 
Stumbling on for three or four paces, before he could stop himself, Thurkettle turned. He appeared surprised that he had not overwhelmed his opponent. Advancing again, more cautiously, he paused for a second. Then, making a sudden dive forward, he swung his right arm with a force that would have stunned an ox, had it landed. Smith ducked, and, before his man could recover, had got home with his left between the eyes. Thurkettle staggered, and up went his guard, letting in a half-armed right full in the mouth. With a grunt, Thurkettle sat down in the road, gazing about him with eyes that blinked their astonishment. Murmurs rose from the crowd, murmurs of surprise and encouragement, coupled with urgings to Bob Thurkettle to give him the cosh he seemed unable to administer, whilst a shrill voice was heard crying, "'Do it again! Oh, do it again!' It was Miss Mary Jell, but no one appeared to take any notice. They were too stunned at what had taken place. "'Go it, Miss Alfred!' roared one. "'Remember Dick Marsh! Don't you be afraid, Bor. Miss Jell was now clasping Tom Bassingthwaite's arm with both hands. Millie Marjoram was gripping Colonel Enderby's hand with moist and trembling fingers. Mrs. Trespit Green was making curious little noises at the back of her throat, whilst Mrs. Spellman had just heard herself shout quite loudly, "'Kill him! Kill him!' Slowly Thurkettle picked himself up and spat the blood from his mouth. From the look in his eyes it was obvious he had received a severe shock, both physical and mental. For the next few minutes he was caution personified. He seemed dazed. Smith early realized two things. First, that it would be useless to attempt body blows on a man with the physique of a bear. Second, that, unless the whole affair were over quickly, the man's superior strength would wear him down. He therefore decided to force the pace, trusting to his signs to make up for the physical disparity. Thurkettle's obvious object was to clinch, and then Smith knew that Queensbury rules would avail him nothing. The man was clearly afraid for his face, his whole scheme of defence being to protect it from another double blow such as he had received. The crowd began to get excited. "'Go it, Bob! Give him cosh! He's afraid! Remember what he did to your mother!' and similar remarks were shouted. For more than a minute the two men moved slowly round, each watching for an opportunity. Thurkettle was endeavouring to manoeuvre Smith into a position where with a mighty rush he could force him into the hedge that bordered the road. Smith recognised that his principal danger lay in the onlookers, who were pressing close upon them. Were he to trip over their friendly or unfriendly limbs, Thurkettle would be upon him in a moment. Suddenly he became aware that the pressure of the crowd had lessened. He heard voices urging the people to stand back. One was shrill and excited, cracking frequently upon the high notes, but he saw nothing. His eyes never left those two smouldering agates of hate, glowering out at him from what looked like a mass of black hair. For nearly two minutes Thurkettle continued his cautious tactics. It was obvious that his slow brain was working to find some explanation of what had happened. Smith realized that his opponent would not be able to continue indefinitely such unaccustomed methods, and he watched him narrowly. Several times Thurkettle made clumsy feints, but as Smith was watching his eyes and not his hands, he appeared to take no notice. Emboldened by this fact, he made another sudden dash, this time with his right forearm held high to shield his face. Smith swiftly sidestepped to the left, but by some uncanny instinct Thurkettle seemed to anticipate the move, and the next Smith knew was that what appeared to be a thunderbolt had caught him on the right shoulder, flooring him as if he had been a skittle. Fortunately, he had been moving from the blow, the force of which swung Thurkettle round in a half-turn, but he was round again in a second. Seeing Smith on the ground, he gave vent to a roar. To him the fight seemed over. Miss Mary screamed, the crowd roared, a shrill voice yelled to Smith to get up. Before Thurkettle realized what was happening, however, Smith was on his feet again, and had got home a stinging blow on the side of the enemy's head. The crowd yelled. Never had little Bilstead known such drama. Smith decided that in forcing the pace with a heavier man it was desirable to be cautious as well as enterprising. Had he been moving towards, instead of away from the blow, he would in all probability have lain long enough on the ground to give Thurkettle the chance he sought. Amid a babel of shouts and exhortations, the man fought on, Smith landing blow after blow, until he began to wonder if it were possible to knock out the mountain of flesh and muscle before him. Suddenly he remembered old Plum's recipe, 
for knocking out an unscientific fighter of a heavier weight. "'Tap at the front door,' he would say. "'Then down you goes to the basement, and ready hard had been his dictum. Leading for the head, Smith got his man on the nose. Up went Thurkettle's guard. It was what Smith was waiting for, the ring at the basement. With a mighty effort, he swung his right full at Thurkettle's solar plexus, with all his weight behind the blow. With a sobbing grunt, Thurkettle's guard dropped. The first blow had arrested a rush, the second seemed to daze him. Before he had time to recover, Smith landed his left between the eyes, and Thurkettle's guard dropped still lower. With a terrific right hook, Smith got his man on the point of the jaw, and Bob Thurkettle went down like a log. And little Bilstead went mad for the second time that month. End of chapter 20《Chapter Twenty One of the Return of Alfred by Herbert George Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter Twenty One. Marjorie hears the news. One. Margie, Margie, where are you? Eric dashed across the lawn of the Grange as if the seven deadly sins were pursuing him. Marjorie appeared at the French windows of the morning room, of which she had taken possession since Lady Warren's departure. Eric made towards her at full tilt. She turned back into the grey room, out of the sun's glare, Eric following. "'Such a fight!' he gasped, as he threw himself down into Lady Warren's favourite chair. "'It—' "'A fight?' she turned suddenly. "'Who? What?' The colour had left her cheeks. She was conscious that she was trembling. "'Smith and Thirk! he panted. "'I've run all the way! I've—' He paused from sheer lack of oxygen. "'Tell me, Eric!' She dropped into the nearest chair, conscious of a curious sensation of weakness in her knees. "'Tell me, Eric,' she repeated, a note of sharpness in her voice. "'All right,' he panted. "'Let a fellow get his wind first. I've run all the way to tell you, and Mrs. Hicks gave me treacle pudding for lunch. "'Is—is is he hurt?' she interrupted, conscious that even to herself her voice sounded strange. "'Hurt?' cried Eric. "'You should have seen him, all blood and grunts!' And his eyes sparkled at the recollection of the Homeric encounter he had been privileged to witness. A lot of them thought he was dead at first. "'Oh!' she cried faintly. "'Where is he? Have they taken him to the vicarage? "'Oh, Eric!' she added, conscious that he was looking at her curiously. Suddenly he grinned. Having realized her mistake, he decided to delay the dramatic revelation. Like a good wine, it would improve with keeping. "'Knocked him clean out, like old Cobb. Oh, Margie, you've missed the—' "'Don't, Eric, please.' She turned her head aside with a shudder. "'They were trying to bring him to with a bucket of water when I left,' he added. "'Is he much hurt?' In her mind's eye she saw a bruised and bleeding face, out of which gazed a pair of reproachful blue eyes. He had remained to show her he was not afraid— if she had urged him to go away, he would have gone. Perhaps he would have gone if she had not said anything at all. It was all her fault. Of course he couldn't hope to. Old End wants Postle to run him in. The words seemed to break through the curtain of her thoughts. You should have seen the vicar, he continued, gloating over the episodes of the afternoon in retrospect. Rare old sport. He and I kept the ring. If we hadn't, he'd have lost, crowding him like a— "'Whatever are you talking about?' cried Marjorie, totally at sea as a result of Eric's scare headline form of conversation. "'The vicar told old End that he was the—what you call it, and—' "'Who? Thurk, of course. You want your brain sprinkling, Margie. I'm telling you, and you keep on saying who and what. I'm jolly well going to get him to teach me.' "'Who? Teach you what?' she stammered. "'There you go again. Who? What?' he mimicked. We're not playing how, when, and where. I tell you, it was the biggest thing that ever was. Knock carp and dump into a tea-fight. My hat! You should have seen old Thurk go down. It— Eric, tell— There you— Marjorie jumped up, and, gripping his arm, shook him impatiently. Who went down? she demanded almost fiercely. Thurk! Let go! You're hurting! he yelled. She released his arm but continued to stand over him. He hadn't a chance. Smith got him on the point, and he went down like a sack. It was spiff. 
Marjorie felt the blood flood to her face, then drain away again. She sank on to the arm of Eric's chair, clutching at the back for support. In a vague way she was conscious that Eric was adding details to what he had already told her. He was filling in the lacunae in his previous story. She seemed able to visualize the village street as if from a height with its dark crowd of pressing, peering humanity. In the centre two men were gasping, panting, moving. One was dark, his face threatening and blood-stained. The other was fair, a determined light in his blue eyes. She even heard the thud of blows. She saw the dark man stagger. She clutched. "'Let go my hair!' In a flash the picture was gone, and she found herself clutching a handful of Eric's fiery-coloured hair. "'What's the matter with you today, Margie?' he demanded as he wrapped his sore scarp. "'You off your crump!' Suddenly she put an arm round his neck and drew his head towards her. He wriggled loose and, jumping up from the chair, made for the door, announcing his intention of conveying the good news to Willis and Mrs. Higgs. He had suddenly realized that someone might anticipate him, and it was almost like another fight, hurling these dramatic bombs about and watching them explode. Marjorie did not tell him that she had just sent Willis down to the village for news. 2. The remainder of the afternoon was spent by little Bilstead in soul-searching and mutual recrimination. When Postle had arrived upon the scene, it was to find the biggest crowd he ever remembered to have seen in little Bilstead. In the centre of it were the vicar and Smith on their knees beside the prostrate form of Bob Thurkettle, bringing him to by chafing his limbs and sponging his face with cold water from a bucket. The sight of Postle seemed to bring to Colonel Enderby a realisation of his responsibilities. He promptly demanded to know the meaning of the policeman's absence at the very hour the little Bilstead had been most in need of his professional services. Postle tilted his helmet on to the back of his head and proceeded to rub his chin with a pad of his right thumb as he gazed at the business-like ministrations of the vicar and Smith upon the inert figure of the redoubtable Thurkettle. "'He's copped it a rummin,' was his thought, his sporting instincts triumphing over his official discretion. It soon became manifest, however, that the colonel had his rag out, as Postle was wont to express it to himself, sometimes in his more expansive moments, even to his intimates. Colonel Enderby let himself go. The curry had digested indifferently well, and he was conscious that he had been shouting encouragements to the vanquished champion. As a result, when Bob Thurkettle at length opened his eyes, it was to find that another battle was being waged over his recumbent form. Colonel Enderby had demanded the arrest of Smith, had threatened to report Postle, and promised little Bilstead dire penalties for its lapse into Bolshevism, as he regarded this open flouting of his views and opinions. Murmurs of, "'Give over, the dazzy fuel, and hold your nose,' were to be heard on all sides. Colonel Enderby looked about him in astonishment. He was an autocrat, getting his first whiff of revolution." That afternoon little Bilstead made it abundantly clear to him that any man who desired the presence of a policeman to spoil the most enjoyable fight of their lives was worthy neither of his position as an officer nor the respect accorded to a gentleman. At length he fled, or, as he regarded it, withdrew with flags flying and drums beating. He even returned the enemy's fire, but his aim was bad and his ammunition defective, as the frequent laughs at his expense testified. As Mrs. Spellman remarked the next day to Mrs. Pelham, who had missed everything, "'It was really most embarrassing. Fortunately, I didn't know the meaning of a lot of the words the Colonel used, but I'm sure they were dreadful.' When Smith saw that there was no longer any doubt about Thurkettle coming round, he rose, and, with a word to Nudd about what to do, linked his arm through that of the vicar, and led him in the direction of the vicarage. He was anxious to get a hot bath conscious that his shoulder was already manifesting an unpleasant tendency to stiffen. It was not until Thurkettle had dropped with a thud in the roadway that he realized that the taller of the two figures that had been so active in keeping the ring was no other than the vicar. He realized that, but for the old man's presence, coupled with his obvious knowledge of the requirements of a quick-footed fighter, it would, in all probability, have been he, and not Thurkettle, who would have taken the count. Several times the vicar murmured something that to Smith was unintelligible. At length, however, he distinguished that it was a repetition of his unvarying refrain when dissatisfied with his own conduct. "'I must really see the bishop.' He realized that the old man was passing through the fire of self-reproach for his part in the afternoon's happenings. 
and as they came opposite the gate of the Grange, Willis was standing just inside by the lodge. Smith paused, the vicar continuing his way, as if unconscious that he were not alone. "'Did you see him, Mr. Alfred?' Willis asked in a hoarse whisper, looking anxiously about lest someone should overhear. "'Did I see whom?' asked Smith, as he lighted his cigarette. "'Bob Thurkettle, sir.' "'I did.' "'Did he?' he paused in his eagerness. "'He did, my good Willis, and instead of killing the fatted calf, he strove to slay the prodigal instead.' "'What did he do, Mr. Alfred? Did he—did he threaten to—' He hesitated. "'I'm afraid I loosened most of his teeth, Willis.' "'You didn't fight him, sir.' His eyes travelled over Smith's face and figure, as if for the signs of defeat he felt must be there. "'I'm afraid I did,' said Smith with a smile. "'And you beat him, sir?' "'That, I think, was the general impression.' He was amused at the old man's eagerness. "'You beat Bob Thurkettle, Mr. Alfred.' There was incredulity in his tone. When I left him he was lying on his back, just coming to, and trying to puzzle out how it had all happened. "'Mr. Alfred! Mr. Alfred!' was all Willis could say. "'When I heard you had gone, I thought—I thought thought he would kill you.' "'And were you coming to save me, Willis?' "'I was just going down to the village, sir,' he said simply. "'I couldn't stay in the house.' Willis was a bad liar, but he realized that he could not say that Miss Marjorie had sent him. "'Well, I'm all right, you see,' Smith smiled. "'Now I must try and catch up with the vicar,' and he passed on up the road, leaving Willis gazing after him, a look in his eyes that plainly spoke the hero-worship in his heart. As he entered the vicarage, he heard the vicar saying, "'But, Hannah, I have a distinct recollection of feeling satisfaction.' when he was knocked out. I even think I said splendid. I must see the bishop, Hannah. I fear I am not worthy to be the shepherd of a flock. Well, she demanded, as Smith approached, the vicar seizing the opportunity to escape to his study. What is this, I hear? There was something almost like a twinkle in her eyes, he thought. I have been carrying the sweetening process to its logical conclusion he replied gravely. At least, I hope it's the conclusion. "'I hope you realize that you have involved the vicar in a parish scandal. I understand he acted as a sort of master of the ceremonies.' She had heard the story from Janet, who learned everything almost as soon as it happened, for Janet was comely, possessed of many admirers, and loved scandals. Without waiting for a reply, Miss Lipscombe turned and led the way into the drawing-room, where she seated herself in the most upright chair it contained, folded her hands before her, and waited. In a few words Smith outlined what had taken place, and how he had been involved in the fight in spite of himself. "'And that is what you call sweetening a man's memory, is it?' she demanded, when he had finished. "'It was part of the process,' he admitted. "'Your methods savour of the Mohammedan,' was the retort. "'May I inquire what is the next step you propose?' she inquired dryly. "'To pursue the analogy,' he said, "'my Hegira. I'm leaving Little Bilston in a day or two. "'Leaving?' There was surprise in her tone. "'Yes. Why? The sweetening process is almost concluded. "'Fiddlesticks!' she cried. "'Just because you've thrashed a bully, you think—' She paused. "'What will Lady Warren say when she returns?' I hope to be able to give her news of her son. Miss Lipscombe's rigid figure seemed to become even more rigid. She continued to regard him, keen inquiry in her eyes. I believe Alfred Warren to be dead, and— He paused. And? She stopped suddenly, her hand raised to her heart. I think I shall be able to prove it, he added quietly, but I would rather say nothing more at present. For some time neither spoke. It was Smith who finally broke the silence. "'We only know the Alfred Warren of up to 1914,' he said, as if to himself. "'Perhaps—' he left the sentence unfinished. "'I've often wondered,' she said, an unusual note of softness in her voice. "'I was fond of him, Mr. Smith,' she added a little huskily. "'You see, I was his godmother.' 
"'Is that why you wanted to see his memory sweetened?' he inquired. "'Perhaps it was,' she admitted. "'I'm a selfish old woman. But it's done you no harm.' Her tone was that of inquiry rather than assertion. He shook his head. It was difficult to express exactly what Alfred Warren had done for him. He now seemed to see quite a lot of things in detail that hitherto had been either outlines or mere blurs. He could no longer contemplate a life such as he had led before the war. There must be action, progression. He must... He was to have married Marjorie. The words seemed to scatter his thoughts like a dog, a lot of hens. He? Who? he asked vaguely, although conscious of who it was she meant. Alfred, she said. At least, that was Lady Warren's wish. And Marjorie? He could not restrain the question. She was too young at the time to know, was the reply. Perhaps she was being reserved for someone else, she added. And now go and get changed out of your fighting clothes. There are soda scones for tea. As he walked slowly upstairs, it was of Marjorie he was thinking, not of Miss Lipscombe's soda scones, although they had been made specially for him as his favourite tea-table dainty. Married to Marjorie, he muttered as he closed his door. Perhaps that was why. End of chapter 21《ラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラ The police must have been a recent idea, John, put in Mrs. Compton Stacy quietly. This is the first I've heard of it. Don't interrupt me, Charlotte, he cried, picking up the thread of his discourse. I've every reason to be annoyed, being led this wild goose chase about the country, when I might have been, uh, he paused, blinking uncertainly. It was annoying not to be able to think of anything else he might have been doing. There was nothing you could have been doing, John. Said Mrs. Compton Stacy placidly, except reading trashy novels or bullying poor. They are not trashy, and I don't bully, he retorted lamely. I, I expostulate occasionally. If it hadn't been for the idea I got out of a novel, we shouldn't have found Darrell, he added with inspiration. And if you hadn't bullied him because his taste in women was not your own, we should not have lost him, she replied calmly. Besides, we haven't found him yet, she added. There was silence for several minutes. Sir John was grappling with his sister's logic. What should we do without the robin? she said presently, as a burst of song broke through the monotonous hum of the car. Damn the robin! he exploded. He disliked irrelevancies. When you get in this mood, John, you condemn everybody and everything except the one person you would like to condemn most myself, she remarked presently. Turning to get a better view of his frowning face. Don't talk a lot of confounded nonsense, he snapped, but the tint of his neck belied the irascibility of his words. With Sir John, anger always flew to his neck. Mrs. Compton Stacy could read the signs with ease. Pews meant ungovernable fury. The ghost of a smile fluttered about the corners of her mouth, and her hand fell lightly upon his. No one else had ever discovered the secret of how to handle John Hildreth. Don't be a fool, Charlotte, he cried, but he did not withdraw his hand. These occasional touches of sentiment meant more to him than he would allow, even to himself. It's all your fault. What is my fault? she inquired calmly. You've always spoiled him, ever since he was a baby. But the tone in which the accusation was made seemed to lack conviction. Mrs. Compton Stacy smiled behind her motoring veil. The few really serious disagreements they had ever had were the outcome of her having been, as her brother expressed it, too hard on the boy. The next mile was covered in silence, Sir John being occupied in going feverishly through his pockets with the air of a man who has lost something of value. What are you looking for, John? she inquired at length. That infernal letter, he muttered. I know I brought it with me. 
"'You gave it to me to mind,' she said, opening her handbag and producing an envelope. "'Then why couldn't you say so?' he cried, instead of letting me search every pocket I've got half a dozen times over. Snatching the envelope from her, he tore out the contents, a single sheet of cheap notepaper, with a grease spot in the right-hand bottom corner, and for the twentieth time that day he read, "'Dear Sirs, I am the postman at Little Bilstead, and seeing your advert for James Smith I hasten to apply. He is here and being watched. Come at once and bring money with you. Ask for Mr. Bessingthwaite at the post-office, and tell no one it is serious, and we have a policeman here, your respectful servant, T. Bessingthwaite. "'Confound the fellow!' was his comment, as he folded the letter and replaced it in the envelope which he handed to his sister. But whether it was the postman or his own nephew he desired confounded was not clear. "'Bessingthwaite!' he muttered. "'Absurd name!' That morning he was prepared to disagree with everybody and criticise everything. It was characteristic of Sir John Hildreth that, when anxious, or if sentiment showed any tendency to obtrude itself, he invariably manifested irritation. He would give a beggar half a crown and tell him to go to the devil, whereas another man would make it tuppence and a suggestion that he should get work. His ideal of an Englishman was even more austere than that of the public schoolboy. No display of emotion, a soft emotion, that is, was permissible, even in thought. He was a Spartan, destitute of the cloak of philosophy. That morning, as Mrs. Compton Stacy was having breakfast on the lawn, she had been interrupted by the sound of a car being driven furiously up the drive, its klaxon horn in continuous action. She had recognized both the horn and her brother's impetuosity behind. If ever he were excited and came over to seek her advice, he invariably arrived with the klaxon horn in full blast, so that she might be ready to receive him. But never had she known anything quite so violent. Rising from her meal, she had gone to the edge of the lawn bordering the drive. A moment later, the car came into view, and amidst sparking tires, Chivers, the chauffeur, had brought it to a standstill opposite her, a sheepish look upon his good-humoured face. He always looked sheepish when arriving with the band, as he called it in the servants' hall, that is, when Sir John told him to keep up a continuous blast upon the horn. "'I found him!' Sir John had shouted at the sight of his sister. Then he had bounced out of the car, shouting to Chivers to tune it up for a long run. He had displayed the letter from the little Bilstead postman, with the air of one who has reason to feel pleased with himself. He informed her that he was motoring over to Norfolk at once, and that she was going with him. Having nothing else particularly to occupy her, she had consented, and within half an hour they were humming along due east, a look of quiet content upon Chivers' face. He had been told to let her out and damn the fines, and that— to Sir John Hildreth's chauffeur meant bliss, although to the roadside fauna it meant syncope or death, sometimes both. With characteristic impulsiveness, Sir John had forgotten that even the best of cars can scarcely go from Wiltshire to Norfolk and back in a day, and he had made no provision for the night. Chivers, however, in collusion with Sir John's man, had corrected the omission. At that moment there reposed on the seat beside the chauffeur a suitcase with all the necessary equipment by which a gentleman can go to sleep at night and perform his toilet in the morning. In spite of his explosive nature, Sir John Hildreth was worshipped by his servants. He was just, generous, and so-called white, and although he damned them all with the utmost impartiality, they knew that their troubles, when they came, would be his troubles, and his purse theirs. It was nearly four o'clock when Chivers put his foot to the break at the top of the hill that dipped into Little Bilstead. As they approached, Sir John began to bob about excitedly in his seat. Repose of manner was as foreign to his nature as the manifestation of sentiment. "'Something the matter,' he murmured, at the sight of the knots of people with which the roadway was dotted. "'Perhaps it's a populous district,' suggested Mrs. Compton Stacy dryly. He grunted something unintelligible as Chivers slowed down. "'Where's the post-office?' he inquired of a tall, ramrod-like figure of a man to whom Chivers had taken an instinctive dislike, and was endeavouring to force into the hedge. It was Colonel Enderby trying to work off the combined effects of undigested curry and sudden unpopularity. "'Be damned to you!' he shouted, meaning Chivers. "'Be damned to you, too!' yelled Sir John over the back of the car, not to be outdone in the amenities of the road. "'Here, 
"'Slow up, Chivers,' he called, as they approached a group in the road. "'Where's the post-office?' he demanded again. Several proceeded to answer the question in unison. Even had they replied separately, it is doubtful if Sir John would have been any the wiser, the Norfolk dialect being a bar to intimate communion with strangers. The sudden grind of brakes, however, together with Chivers' dexter forefinger, which performed an arc from the steering wheel to a spot on the right-hand side of the road, and then to his cap, showed that he had discovered the post-office for himself. At the sight of the car stopping outside his establishment, Tom Bassingthwaite's heart gave a great bound. With a shout of, "'Wanted more!' to his sister, he left old Mrs. Mogridge, who always bought a stamp as if it were a triangular cape, about the genuineness of which she were doubtful, and darted round a little corner, upset a pile of firewood tied in bundles, jumped a box containing a hearthstone, and was beside the car a moment later. "'Are you Meister Trulove?' he stammered hoarsely. "'You Bassingthwaite?' barked Sir John, equally excited. The postman nodded. Words seemed to refuse to come at his brain's bidding. "'Jump in, then,' cried Sir John. "'No, beside the chauffeur,' he added hastily, as Tom Bassingthwaite's trembling hand fumbled with the handle of the door. In a flash he had dodged round the bonnet and was beside Chivers, almost before the chauffeur had time to remove the suitcase from the seat to the floor. "'Straight on!' almost sobbed Bassingthwaite, who seemed instinctively to realize what was required of him. "'I'll show you, Bor." And before anyone had properly realized what was happening, Little Bilstead saw its postman whisked away in a high-powered touring car, apparently with the postman's full acquiescence. "'Well, I'll be danged,' muttered Tom Simmons, "'if that ain't a rummin'. Once clear of the village, Mrs. Compton Stacy signaled to Chivers to stop. "'What the devil are you doing?' demanded Sir John excitedly. "'I want to know why all those people were about, for one thing,' she replied calmly. "'And for another, it is as well that we should know what has happened. "'Is anything the matter?' she inquired of Bassingthwaite. "'From the broad Norfolk of the postman, after he had been urged by Sir John not to go so damn quick.' Mrs. Compton Stacy and her brother pieced together sufficient to acquaint them with the fact that there had been a fight, and that Mr. Alfred had come off victor. Furthermore, they gathered that Mr. Alfred appeared to be a sort of trinity, the other component parts being James Smith and their errant nephew, and that there had been rare goings-on together. "'And you'll give me the twenty-five pounds?' Tom Bassingthwaite had inquired eagerly in conclusion. "'Of course,' was Sir John's curt answer. "'If you conduct us to the Mr. James Smith we want,' added his sister, whereat the little postman flopped down upon the seat again, as the car jerked forward to the realization of what he hoped would be fortune. The car turned into the drive leading up to the vicarage, and the vicar himself was seen walking from them, his hands clasped behind his back, apparently deep in thought. As the car stood up beside him, he started violently, as if suddenly snatched back to life from another world. "'The gentleman be looking for Mr. Alfred, sir,' called out Tom Bassingthwaite, almost apoplectic with excitement, now that the reward seemed within his grasp. "'Smith, you fool, not Alfred,' burst out Sir John. "'That's all right,' began the postman. "'Ouch!' he broke off with a yelp, as Chivers dug him in the ribs with a vigorous elbow. By this time the vicar, hat in hand, had approached Mrs. Compton Stacy's side of the car. "'We are looking for Mr. James Smith.' she said, in her quiet, level tones, and— "'This fellow says he's staying with you,' broke in Sir John, unable to tolerate a walking-on part. "'I advertised for him. He's my nephew, Darrell Hildreth. Confounded young puppy!' Sir John was off like a backfiring motor lorry. The vicar gazed at him in bewilderment, then at Mrs. Compton Stacy, and back again to Sir John. "'Smith?' he murmured, as if exploring the inner recesses of his memory. James Smith. I seem to remember the name. Ah, yes. A wonderful left. Sir John gazed at the vicar with the air of a man who, although he sympathizes with the insane, dislikes intensely to encounter them. Is he here? inquired Mrs. Compton Stacy gently. You must have tea, said the vicar, as if he had not heard the query. Hannah would wish it. I don't think we've had tea yet. He paused thoughtfully. It was to be soda scones, I believe. Or was that yesterday? 
"'I am very absent-minded,' he said, turning to Mrs. Compton Stacy with a wraith of a smile that had the effect of dissipating even the explosive gases that had been accumulating in Sir John. "'If the soda scones were for today, then I'm sure we haven't had tea yet. I couldn't have forgotten Hannah's soda scone so soon.' Having thus expressed himself, as if the interrogation had been exclusively concerned with tea and soda scones, the vicar turned, and, his hands behind him clasping his hat, he proceeded to walk up the drive in the direction of the vicarage. Apparently he had forgotten all about the car and its occupants. Blowing out his cheeks, Sir John glared after the retreating black-coated figure. There was something about the scholarly dignity of the old man that seemed to forbid calling after him. "'What the devil are we to do now, Charlotte?' he cried irritably. "'Go and see if there really are soda scones for tea,' was the placid rejoinder, as Chivers, always the man for a crisis, started the car. "'There he is!' cried Sir John suddenly, as they came within sight of the vicarage. Smith, who was in the act of raising a soda scone to his mouth, seemed suddenly to become petrified, the scone poised in mid-air, his mouth slightly parted to receive it. "'Great Gulliver!' he cried. "'My uncle!' "'You young scamp!' roared Sir John, as he fumbled feverishly with the door of the car. "'What's the meaning of—' He stopped as if shot. He had just caught sight of Miss Lipscomb as she rose into prominence from a low chair on the further side of the table. Covering the few yards to the car in half a dozen strides, Smith had Sir John's hand firmly gripped in his own. There was a genuine light of gladness in his eyes as he gazed upon the apoplectic features of his relative. "'This is splendid of you, sir, and you too, Aunt Charlotte,' he cried, looking into the smiling eyes of his aunt. "'You—you—' began Sir John, but his voice seemed suddenly to have become husky, and with his disengaged hand he tucked a handkerchief from his pocket. The vicar stood watching the scene, a vague, bemused look in his eyes, whilst Tom Bassingthwaite— a silly grin upon his face, stood up in the car, a sort of self-constituted master of the ceremonies. "'Here he be, you see. Didn't I tell you?' he cried. "'There's twenty-five pound. Ouch!' Once more the sphinx-like Chivers had intervened, this time by bringing down his foot upon the postman's corn-infested toes, as if they had been a brake pedal and danger threatened. Slowly, and in little exclamatory sentences, like bursts from a machine-gun, a great dramatic moment was smoothed into a pleasant social gathering. Mrs. Compton Stacy and Sir John alighted from the car, which Trivers started in the direction of the stables, holding the excited postman to the seat with his disengaged hand. Mrs. Compton Stacy and Miss Lipscomb, between them, gradually got the situation in hand. Sir John was sprayed with soothing small talk, the vicar was given a soda scone, and Smith gazed from his aunt to his uncle and back again in a way that told Miss Lipscomb that all was well, or at least would be. Only once was there an echo of the drama that had so recently threatened to shatter the peace of the vicarage lawn, a yell from the direction of the stables. It was Chivers, indicating to the mercenary Bassenthwaite that enough for the day is the evil thereof, and that a Hildreth paid at his own time in his own way. That afternoon the little Bilstead mailbags carried to Mrs. Trulove and Murchison nine communications, each telling that the writers knew sufficient about the whereabouts of one James Smith to ensure the earning of the twenty-five pounds reward offered. End of chapter 22「Chapter 23 of The Return of Alfred by Herbert George Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter Twenty Three, Mister Gadget tells the truth. One, it was absolutely spiff, sir! Cried Eric ecstatically. He simply hit Marsh all over the field. He was describing to Sir John for the third time how his nephew had won for Little Bilstead the annual cricket match against Upper Sexton. Sir John had slept well. Janet's coffee had been devilishly good, as he had told Smith, and he was feeling intensely eupeptic. Immediately after breakfast, Eric had arrived across the bird's breakfast-table, and he had arrived unrebuked. His frank hero-worship of Smith—he persisted in the name—cut
coupled with the fact that he appeared to find nothing in Sir John of which to be afraid, had rendered them friends from the kick-off, as Eric later expressed it to Marjorie. To appear afraid of Sir John was to ensure his dislike. Then, continued Eric, switching on to the previous day's encounter, you should have seen old Thurk go. He stopped suddenly. A moment later there was a flash of orange, and Eric had disappeared behind the holly bush into which Smith had threatened to throw Mr. Bluggs. Sir John looked about him in bewilderment, searching for something to account for the inexplicable disappearance of his companion. Suddenly his gaze became fixed, the veins in his forehead began to swell, and the tint of his complexion deepened to puce. Coming up the vicarage drive was a policeman, accompanied by a portly man in a brown and white check suit. At the sight of the luxuriant auburn moustache adorning the newcomer's upper lip, Sir John's eyes seemed in danger of starting from their sockets. He blew out his cheeks angrily. "'What? What the devil is the meaning of this, Peters?' he exploded. "'I'm taking a holiday, Sir John.' was the self-possessed reply as Peters removed his cap. "'I didn't expect to see you, sir.' "'Taking a holiday!' gasped Sir John. "'Didn't expect to see me. Are—are are you with Mr. Darrell?' he demanded, a sudden thought striking him. "'No, sir. I am alone.' "'Alone?' He turned his fierce gaze upon Postle, who had tipped his helmet on to the back of his head and was meditatively rubbing a bristly chin with the pad of his right thumb. "'And what the deuce do you want?' he demanded. "'This gentleman say he have been assaulted while in a stooping position,' came the sing-song reply. "'And I fear to think that I—' He paused, quelled by the irate baronet's eye. "'What the devil does all this mean?' he demanded of Peters. "'I think, sir, that there has perhaps been a little mistake,' said Peters, suavely. "'Some days back I was—' "'Assaulted when in a stooping position,' broke in Postle. "'I was not then aware that a young gentleman with the catapult was a friend of Mr. Darrell's. The policeman has just told me.' Sir John looked from one to the other, his tongue unable to keep pace with the tint of his neck. "'Look here, Peters,' he cried with sudden inspiration. If it hadn't been for your tomfoolery about growing hair on your face, all this wouldn't have happened. I don't wonder the boy shot at you. Who wouldn't? he added. I'm sorry, Sir John, began Peters with dignity, when, like a tornado, his late master was down upon him. Don't be sorry, he snorted. Get shaved. Remove that disgusting mess from your upper lip. When I found that you objected to my hair suit— Objected to your what? "'My moustache, Sir John. I resigned,' said Peters, with dignity. "'And what is the result? Mr. Darrell lost, me running wild goose chases all over the country, Mr. Darrell nearly killed by some low ruffian.' "'I understand, Sir John,' said Peters, reassuming his cap and endeavouring to adjust it to what he conceived to be the correct angle, "'that it was the, um, ruffian who was hurt.' Sir John opened his mouth to retort, and then, as if thinking better of it, turned suddenly upon Postle, who had been listening intently, with his mouth. "'What the devil are you waiting for?' he demanded. "'This gentleman say you've been assaulted, he say—' "'He's not a gentleman. He's my butler,' was the retort. "'And be damned to you,' he added. Postle turned to Peters. Drama was none too common in Little Bilstead, and he wanted to see this one out. "'You—' he began, when Peters interrupted him with a lordly wave of his hand, with which he was accustomed to dismiss hawkers and other itinerants. "'I have already told you that the charge is withdrawn,' he said. "'Constable,' he added, as a sop to the Cerberus of Postle's vanity. Realizing that as far as he was concerned the drama was ended, Postle turned on a reluctant heel, casting a longing look over his shoulder as he reached the point when another step would blot out what he had hoped would be the most dramatic scene of his career. As Postle's heavy-footed form disappeared from view, Eric's red head reappeared round the corner of the harness-room. "'I say, I'm sorry if I hurt you,' he said to Peters, still keeping at what he regarded as a tactful distance. "'You know, sir,' he added, turning to Sir John, "'I pinked this gentleman.' "'Gentleman,' repeated Sir John irritably, 
He's my butler. I was your butler, Sir John, said Peters, until I... Turned yourself into a caricature, cried Sir John, after fifteen years of service. He added with self-pity. I think it's topping, said Eric, restraining a grin with difficulty as he gazed at Peters' auburn wonder with great intentness. Puts me in mind of old Kitch, he added. There, cried Sir John. You see? And there was triumph in his voice. I think, Sir John, with your permission, I will withdraw, said Peters, with great dignity. Withdraw and be damned, Sir John finished the sentence with a cough. He had suddenly realized Eric's youth. Very good, sir, said Peters, bowing with the imperturbability of the well-trained servant, and, turning, he walked away with the stiffness of deportment he usually assumed when announcing, A person to see you, Sir John. Where's that young scamp? demanded Sir John. And the others, he added, the tint of his neck rapidly approaching normal. In the pair of grey-green eyes Eric turned upon him there was mystery. The hush of the villain of melodrama. He's gone to see Margie, I think, he announced mysteriously. Margie, cried Sir John. Who's he? She's my sister, sir, said Eric, a look on his face that seemed to require only a surplus. You know, we saw her just now, when we came back from the church. On her horse, sir, he added anxiously. He did not want that there should be any mistake, as they had also encountered Miss Marshall. She's frightfully dece in other ways, too, announced Eric. Frightfully what? Decent, sir, said Eric, with a self-conscious grin. I'm sorry, he paused. Sir John had blown through his lips, as if these had been a piece of thistledown to be sent to the four winds of heaven. Of course, it's frightfully sud. Sudden, I mean, Eric added quickly, as he saw Sir John's lips forming an inquiry. But I saw it from the first. Saw what from the first? Sir John stopped dead as if he felt he had a better chance of understanding Eric's mysterious talk if in a stationary position. That they were in love, and all that silly rot. He paused for the fraction of a second, but remembering that his cricket was at stake, he added, And would marry. Then he held his breath and waited. Marry! Eric had not underestimated the power of the explosion. For a moment Sir John seemed in danger of apoplexy. He blinked like a cinematograph film, glanced about him in a dazed sort of manner, blew out his cheeks, and finally fixed his eyes on Eric. "'But he doesn't want to marry,' he cried. "'That's why he—' He stopped suddenly, realizing that Eric was but a child. "'Well, he's all over Margie,' was the rejoinder. Eric had decided that it was no time for half-measures. "'Everybody wants to marry Margie,' he added with the inspiration of the house-agent who assures a client that a number of people are after these desirable premises. Sir John recalled the vision of a girl careering over the countryside on a splendid animal, as he had remarked at the time. If there was one thing more than another he loved, it was a good piece of horse-flesh. The only complaint he had against Vera Truscombe was that she rode a horse as if it were a damned bicycle. Eric's announcement had sobered him considerably. The insubordination of Peters in growing a moustache, the fact that his man had packed him only two collars, and the memory of Tom Bassingthwaite having dunned him before breakfast for the twenty-five pounds, all were absorbed in this startling piece of information. If he interfered further in his nephew's matrimonial affairs, he would in all probability disappear again, the headstrong young puppy, and Sir John had missed him more than he cared to admit, even to himself. "'The confounded sly young puppy!' he muttered under his breath. "'He said it was the railway strike!' But there was no anger in his tone. Eric expanded his lungs to their normal extent. Another obstacle to his mastery of fast bowling had been removed. 2. After breakfast that morning, Smith had gone down to the village to inquire after Thurkettle, and, if possible, to see him. From John Nudd, however, he learned that his late antagonist had left Little Bilstead the previous night. Before doing so, however, he seemed to have expressed himself with some heat upon the subject of the trick that had been played him. He appeared to regard the whole affair as a put-up job, and that the services of a prize-fighter, 
bearing a strong resemblance to Alfred Warren, had been secured. "'But I won't forget it together,' he had assured them malevolently. He had threatened to set about the whole village, hinted at wrecking the public bar of the pigeons, had even gone to the extent of telling Postle that he wasn't going to stand any of his squit, whereat Postle had withdrawn to his cottage, and was seen later with his boots in his high state of polish. Such of the men of Little Bilstead as Smith encountered that morning showed a marked change in their demeanour, particularly those who, like Jack Bean, had been loudest in their denunciations of Miss Alfred. They realised that a man who could give Bob Thurkettle cosh was one to be treated with respect. The women seemed to have gone over to him to a petticoat, judging from the nods and smiles he encountered, whilst the children gazed up at him in awe and large-eyed wonder. Social little Bilstead also was moving, as Smith escaped Colonel Enderby by ten seconds, and Mrs. Spellman by barely fifteen. The object of the one was to tender apologies, as he afterwards expressed it to Miss Jell, and of the other to invite the only lion little Bilstead had ever known to take tea with her that afternoon. Unaware of his providential escape, Smith strolled back to the vicarage, his thoughts busy with the happenings of the past twenty-four hours. What was Marjorie doing? What was she thinking? He was determined to see her again. When Sir John had inquired of him the previous evening what were his plans, he had avoided giving a definite answer. He had no plans, until he knew. Knew what? As he turned to the vicarage drive, he became conscious of a little group standing just within the gate. "'Ah, here he is!' he heard from beneath Miss Lipscombe's faded blue sunbonnet. With her were his aunt and Peter's. "'This seems to be a place of happy rencontres,' smiled Mrs. Compton Stacy as he joined them. She was glad to see Peter's again. She had missed him almost as much as her brother had. "'Good morning, sir,' said Peter's removing his cap once more. He disliked removing his cap when there was no looking-glass handy, and that was the third time he had been called upon to do it that morning. He had discovered that the effectiveness of a cap was in direct ratio to the angle at which it is worn. "'Well, what's the news?' inquired Smith. Peters hesitated. "'I got Peters to make some inquiries about Alfred Warren,' he explained to Miss Lipscombe. "'You remember a man named Gadget?' calling? She nodded, and turned to Peters, an eager look in her eyes. "'Mr. Warren was killed at Neuchapelle,' said Peters. With a quick indrawing of breath, Miss Lipscombe's hand went up to her left side. In swift understanding, Mrs. Compton Stacy linked her arm through that of the older woman. "'Go on,' said Miss Lipscombe, almost fiercely. "'I'm not going to faint, although I am a fool.' "'Tell us what happened, Peters,' said Smith, his eyes upon Miss Lipscombe's face, which had gone very white. "'I saw Mr. Gadget, sir,' Peters continued, "'as you instructed, and he told me that Mr. Warren enlisted in August 1914, under the name of Smith.' "'Smith?' "'Yes, sir. James Smith.' "'Great Gulliver!' murmured Smith under his breath. "'What a strange coincidence!' murmured Mrs. Compton Stacy, who was clasping Miss Lipscombe's right hand in both her own. "'He was defending a wounded officer, and—' With a choking sob, Miss Lipscombe turned, and leaning heavily on Mrs. Compton Stacy's arm, walked slowly up the drive. "'Go on, Peters,' said Smith, his eyes following the retreating figures of the two women. And Peters proceeded to tell how— by what he referred to as diplomacy, he had extracted from Mr. Gadget the news of Alfred Warren's death, and a promise to furnish Lady Warren's solicitors with all the information he possessed. "'But how did you manage it?' cried Smith, puzzled at what appeared to be the entire capitulation of the crafty Mr. Gadget. Peters hesitated, but only for the fraction of a second. "'I'm afraid I had to—to to depend on diplomacy, sir.' not violence no sir and there was regret in peter's voice there were clerks in the outer office and mr gadget was near the bell and what form did your diplomacy take i happened to mention sir that there was to be a dinner of the non-commissioned officers of the battalion next week 
and that his address he paused peters said smith gravely do you realize that was pure prussianism the very thing we fought against it was the only way sir having arranged with peters to send up to the vicarage the clothes he had brought and remain on at the pigeons until he received further orders smith dismissed him as he entered the vicarage miss lipscombe came to the door of the drawing-room and beckoned to him there was a strange softness in her eyes as he closed the door and turned to her mr hildreth she said huskily as she extended a non too steady hand to him i want to thank you for what you have done he took the hand extended to him he could not trust his voice i think she continued a moment later i think i see the hand of god in this and there were tears in her eyes he made good was all smith could think of to say End of chapter 23、chapter、24 Chapter four of The Return of Alfred by Herbert George Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter twenty four Eric pronounces it spiff. Well, Willis, you see, you were wrong and I was right. Willis had just thrown open the hall door of the Grange with that smile he seemed to keep specially for Smith. Yes, sir, said Willis, as he stood aside to allow Smith to enter. It's all very wonderful, sir. You'll be going away now, I suppose, Mr. Al. Sir, he corrected himself. Smith noted the mournful inflection of his voice. Yes, Willis, I'm sorry to say. Is Miss Marjorie in? yes sir and the old man's voice was noticeably husky she's in the morning room sir i shall always regard you as my good samaritan said smith smiling in spite of himself at the recollection of their first meeting thank you sir said willis fumbling at the tails of his coat a moment later producing a large coloured handkerchief with which he proceeded to blow his nose and surreptitiously mop his eyes it'll be like losing mr alfred all over again sir he mumbled through the folds of the handkerchief and-and he trailed off into something between a sniff and a sob cheer up willis said smith touched by the old man's obvious regret that he was going it's not so bad as all that it-it's terrible for us sir was the melancholy response as he continued to mop his eyes mrs higgs has had two goes of hysterics and i'm sure she'll have another before the day's out i'm dreadfully sorry said smith conscious of the feebleness of the remark then there's mrs death sir willis continued as if determined to squeeze every drop of misery from the catastrophe she had visions last night sir and she says she feels another coming on and she can't cook when she has visions sir and he broke off huskily I'm afraid my coming has upset everybody. It isn't your coming, sir. It's your going. It. it. Again his voice filled him. Deeply touched though he was by the old man's grief, Smith found himself at a loss how to comfort him. If. if you were only coming back again, sir, if just for an hour, it would be something to look forward to. I'm sure Mrs. Death will be ill if she has another vision, sir. She says it reminds her of when her baby had pneumonia. It's terrible, sir. The tears were now streaming down his cheeks without any attempt on his part to arrest their flow. Now, Willis, you mustn't give way, said Smith soothingly, as if speaking to a child. Perhaps Mr. Alfred will come back and. He won't, sir, sobbed Willis. I seem to know now that he's dead, and if he did, Bob Thurcattle would kill him. He isn't as strong as you are, sir. What makes you think Mr. Alfred is dead? inquired Smith curiously. We feel it, sir, me and Mrs. Death, sir, he quavered, and I don't know who's to prepare Miss Marjorie's luncheon. We can't give her sardines again, 
she had them for breakfast. Smith turned aside to hide a smile. Now, Willis, cheer up, and tell Mrs. Hicks that I will come back soon, just to see my good friends at the Grange, and we'll have tea in her pretty little sitting-room, and— You will, sir? You mean it? cried Willis, sunlight shining through his tears. In his eagerness he had clutched Smith by the coat-sleeve. I promise, said Smith gravely, more touched by the old man's gratitude than he cared to confess, even to himself. Now I'll go and find Miss Marjorie. No, don't come, he added, as Willis made a movement to lead the way to the morning-room. You go and tell Mrs. Higgs and Mrs. Death. I hope it won't give Mrs. Higgs hysterics again, he murmured, shaking his head dubiously. She has them very easy, sir. Leaving Willis to his lugubrious forebodings, Smith crossed the hall to the morning-room. Opening the door softly, he entered. "'May I come in?' he inquired. Marjorie, who was standing looking out from the French windows, turned with a start. She felt herself flushing, for at that very moment she was wondering if he had already left Little Bilstead, or if he would go without calling. From Eric she had received a full, true, and particular account of the dramatic arrival of Sir John Hildreth and his sister, with old Bass. "'I've come to say good-bye,' continued Smith. "'Mr. Hildreth,' she said gravely, as she extended her hand, "'how does one apologize when one is almost too humiliated to think of—of—' of... "'One doesn't,' he smiled. "'Please don't be magnanimous,' she begged, as she dropped into a chair, motioning him to another. "'I thought I shouldn't have the courage to meet you again,' she said. "'And you have?' "'Yes, but—' she paused. "'I gave you no option,' he suggested. "'I could scarcely run away, could I?' she interrogated. "'You might have tried,' he suggested with a smile. "'Although I warn you, I should have given chase.' "'Please don't,' she said, gazing at the point of a dainty bronze shoe with the air of one who finds it difficult to explain. "'I am very much ashamed of myself. I ought to have known.' "'Why?' "'Oh, there were a lot of things.' Her voice was now quite friendly, he decided. It seemed to have lost that quality of well-bred indifference that had always so piqued him in the past. "'You must think me a horrible prig.' She looked up suddenly and gazed straight into his eyes. "'Shall we agree to let bygones be bygones?' he suggested, and begin afresh. She shook her head with a slow but decided air. "'That's impossible, I'm afraid,' she said. "'Why impossible?' "'When I was quite a tiny thing.' There was the ghost of a smile as her eyes remained fixed upon her shoe-tip. "'I remember.' If ever I had been naughty, I would never allow myself to be forgiven, until I had done—' She paused. "'Penance?' he suggested. She nodded. "'Well, why not do penance now?' he suggested eagerly. Again she shook her head, with the same air of decision. "'It had to be something that satisfied me, something I hated doing, and which hurt.' "'But surely, if I say it doesn't matter,' he began, when she interrupted him. "'That wouldn't make any difference,' she insisted. "'I suppose it's conscience, and I require absolution.' "'But I give it, full measure and brimming over,' he said quickly. "'Surely that ends it.' "'None but a priest can grant absolution,' she said gravely. Her eyes reproached him. "'Let's send for one,' he smiled. "'I know I must seem ridiculous,' she said, a slight flush colouring her cheeks, which seemed to him unusually pale. But I can't explain. "'Will you answer me one question, quite frankly and honestly?' he asked, watching her delicately tapered fingers as they trifled with a jade ornament hung by a black ribbon from her neck. She hesitated for a moment, then looked straight into his eyes. "'Yes, I will. If it hadn't been for—for for what you thought, do you think—' We should have been friends. He was conscious that his heart was pumping with a quite unnecessary amount of vigour. Yes, I think we should. Her eyes fell again, and her flush deepened. Nero liked you, and Eric, she continued with an obvious effort, and I always like the people they like. 
"'After all, you had to go upon the evidence you possessed,' he suggested, "'and everybody recognized me as Alfred Warren.' "'But I should have known.' There was in her tone the persistence of a child who refuses to be comforted. There was a prolonged silence. Smith was cudgelling his brains for something that would help her to modify the harsh judgment into which she had entered against herself. "'I think I owe you an explanation also,' he said at length, noting her distress. "'I think it is I who am really to blame. If I hadn't descended upon you all in the way I did, there would have been no misunderstanding.' She shook her head for the third time. "'It all came about in a very curious way,' he continued. "'My uncle, who was a splendid old fellow, but a bit volcanic, and I had a difference of opinion about the subject of noses.' He noticed the suggestion of a furrow between her brows, as she continued to gaze at the point of her shoe. "'He had selected a wife for me, and somehow we didn't seem to see quite eye to eye, or perhaps I should say, nez à nez. You see, it crinkled when she laughed. She looked up suddenly, a startled expression in her eyes. Then, at the quizzical expression on his face, she smiled involuntarily. My uncle and I had an argument, which developed into something more serious. He practically ordered me to marry her. I expostulated that I could never live down those crinkles. I'm afraid I behaved rather badly by treating the whole matter with unnecessary flippancy. You see, her estates bordered on ours and my uncle was anxious to link them together. He paused for a second, but at a little nod from her he continued. The upshot of it was that he cut me off with a shilling, and told me to go to the devil, so— You came to little Bilstead, she interrupted demurely, without raising her eyes. At that moment he decided she was prettier than he had ever remembered to have seen her. Perhaps it would be more accurate to say that fate— and the railway strike landed up me here, he continued, and— But was it necessary to change your name? she queried, leaning forward slightly. My uncle rather rubbed it in about going to the dogs, and dragging the family name with me. I am afraid I must have got a little short-tempered. I told him that I would never use the name of Hildreth again until I had his permission, and the next morning in the bath I christened myself James Smith. You see, I enlisted under that name— Private Darrell Hildreth didn't seem to sound quite right somehow, when I wanted to stay in the ranks. And that's all there is to tell, he concluded. For nearly a minute there was silence. Her gaze was concentrated upon the point of her shoe. I came to say good-bye, he said, finding the silence embarrassing. She continued to play with the jade ornament she had worn the first time he saw her. You must be glad. She did not look up. "'I'm sorry,' he said. "'I've rather enjoyed it all. "'And—and—' and, she began, then paused. "'I was sorry about yesterday,' he said gravely, interpreting her thoughts. "'But it was unavoidable. "'I ran down to see him this morning,' he added. "'But he had gone. "'He realizes that I am not Alfred Warren.' "'Again there was a period of silence. "'There seemed nothing more to be said.' She refused to be forgiven, and it now remained for him only to make his adieu, return to the vicarage, and prepare for the journey west. Suddenly he had an inspiration. "'Will you take me to say good-bye to Nero?' he asked. She rose immediately, then paused half-way towards the window. "'Only four lumps at the outside,' she warned. "'But this is a parting,' he pleaded. "'We may never meet again, and, because you won't be friends,' You surely won't come between Nero and me. Without a word, she passed out through the French windows and across the lawn in the direction of the stables. From behind a clump of holly, Eric watched the scene, speculating as to his chances of bowling practice. At the sight of Marjorie and a sugar man approaching, Nero became almost frantic with excitement. He blew through his lips in an ecstasy of anticipation. Marjorie called it purring stretching his shapely neck over the half-door of his loose box to its utmost limit. The sight of Smith thrusting his hand into his pocket caused Nero to add to the purr a soft whinny of joy. His sugar man had not only come to see him, but had brought with him those white cubes of joy without which life would lose much of its attractiveness. "'Nero, you must be good,' 
admonished Marjorie, as she fondled his silky neck, whilst Smith extended a hand on which lay four of the largest lumps of sugar he had been able to steal from Janet's store at the vicarage. As he munched the crisp morsels, there was an expression in Nero's eyes which told of perfect content. Was he not in the presence of his beloved mistress, with whom he had such glorious gallops, stopping at nothing and caring for nobody? Was there not with her his sugar-man, in whose pockets the white cubes grew, as he had never known them to grow elsewhere? As the last morsel disappeared, Nero stretched out a peremptory head toward Smith. He was ready for more. "'Don't you think it's a little unfair to Nero?' Smith was saying. "'Unfair to Nero?' she repeated, not following the line of his thoughts. "'Not to allow yourself to be forgiven,' he smiled. "'I mustn't give you any more, old fellow,' he said, as Nero manifested impatience at the neglect of so obvious a hint. "'I didn't mean to say I wouldn't be forgiven,' she said, conscious that once more she was colouring beneath his steady gaze. "'What I meant was, I cannot forgive myself.' "'In the meantime, Nero must go without sugar,' he suggested. "'I don't see Nero,' she broke off. "'You wicked person!' Impatient at the lack of response to his clearly expressed wishes for more sugar, Nero had caught Smith's coat-sleeve between his teeth, and was shaking it as a dog shakes a rat. At the smart pat on the side of his head which Marjorie administered, he dropped the coat-sleeve and turned upon her a pair of reproachful eyes. He hated being corrected at any time, but before his sugar-man. "'You shouldn't be naughty,' she said. Then, drawing his head towards her and rubbing her face against it, she added, "'You must behave, Nero, dear.' For a second he allowed himself to be caressed. Suddenly he started from the gently restraining hand of his mistress. There, piled up in the sugar-man's hand, was more white bliss than he ever remembered to have seen before. He craned forward, but the tempting pile was just out of reach. The sugar-man was looking at his mistress. Why didn't he come nearer? The top of the door hurt. Still he must get that snowy mount. Suddenly the mount came within his reach. The interrogation in the sugar-man's eyes, which Nero had not observed, had been answered with a little nod and he was crunching more sugar at once than he had ever crunched before in his life. "'Can't you see Nero asking you what has become of me?' Smith inquired, as he watched the obvious enjoyment with which his largesse was being eaten. "'Nero cannot always have his own way,' she retorted, with a lightness she was not feeling. "'Think of Willis unhappy, and Mrs. Hicks having hysterics, and Miss Death indulging in visions.' "'Whatever do you mean?' she cried, with puckered brows. He explained the allusion. "'But my not being able to forgive myself will not produce all those catastrophes,' she protested. "'It will,' he replied solemnly. "'Then there's Eric's bowling practice.' "'Oh!' she cried, startled. Her face dyed suddenly crimson. She turned aside, and her eyes dropped. "'Don't you think we might be friends?' he said gently, bending towards her. She did not reply, still keeping her head turned from him. "'I stayed on because I—' He paused. "'Wanted to get to know you better,' he added. Nero watched the pair with speculative eye. Miraculously, a second mound of white sweetness had taken the place of the first. Here, indeed, was a king among men. "'You will try and forgive yourself,' he persisted. "'I—' "'You mustn't give Nero another piece,' she cried. "'So please come away.' "'On condition that it is to the pine wood,' he said, as he produced two more lumps of sugar for Nero. "'I must talk to you, and I think the pines will help.' She turned, and he followed, leaving Nero in the enjoyment of the last of Janet's sugar. In silence they recrossed the lawn, Eric dodging to cover just in time. A few minutes later, with a little sigh of content, Marjorie sank down upon the carpet of pine needles, Smith dropping beside her. He made no effort to break the silence, but continued to gaze steadily at the profile she turned towards him, as she allowed the pine needles to sift through her fingers. His silence puzzled her. Why had she come to the pine wood? What was he thinking? Was he going that day, or would he remain on until the morrow? "'I want to tell you something,' he said at length. 
She looked up quickly, a startled look in her eyes. I have just heard that Alfred Warren was killed at Neuve Chapelle. For several minutes there was silence. Instinctively her thoughts had flown to South Africa, where a widow would weep for an only son. He made good, said Smith presently. I'm glad, she said simply. Poor grey lady, she added. Grey lady? he queried. I always call Lady Warren grey lady, she said, with a sad little smile. Tell me about her. When nearly half an hour later she concluded with the words, She's the most beautiful old lady I have ever known, Smith felt something more than a passing compassion for the mother who had suffered so much because of an erring son. And now I want to tell you something, she said, after another long silence, taking up another handful of needles and allowing them to cascade back to their mother carpet. She paused. Then, as he made no response, she continued, I... I tried to dislike you. She paused again, the pine needle slipping silently through her fingers. I think, she continued, as she took another handful, I think I always knew in my... Really, that you were not Mr. Warren, but I... I forced myself to dislike you. Yes, he said gently, as she hesitated giving him a swift look from under her lashes. Mr. Warren always frightened me, and, and you, I wasn't frightened of you. The words came with a rush, as if they had forced themselves out against her will. Marjorie, he said gently, taking the hand from which the last pine needle had fallen. Please! There was genuine distress in her voice, and in the eyes she turned on him there were tears, pendulous upon the lower lids. "'Are you going to punish us all?' "'Oh, please don't!' she murmured, as one tear lost its balance and tumbled down her cheek. "'Don't you think you might try and learn to like me a little for myself? I try frightfully hard to deserve it, and I don't mind how long I wait.' His voice shook slightly. There was a pause. His instinct was to take her in his arms. She looked so pathetic so distressed. "'You... you don't understand,' she murmured. "'You would always remember.' "'I should remember only one thing, Marjorie,' he said. "'I want you, and... and...' She had not withdrawn her hand. Gently he drew her towards him, and a moment later all danger to Eric's cricket practice was over. "'You'll never think of it,' she whispered a few minutes later. Never, he vowed. I... I just wouldn't let myself, she continued. And once I hit Nero because he... Oh! A soft muzzle had been thrust between their heads. Nero! she cried, sitting up straight, her hands flying to her disordered hair. You wicked person! Who let you out? But Nero was too busy nuzzling Smith's pockets to explain that he represented Eric's masterstroke of diplomacy. Suddenly there came a whoop from behind them. "'I say, isn't it spiff?' cried an ecstatic voice, and a red head appeared from behind a tree. "'It'll be murder if I catch you,' laughed Smith, making a movement in the direction of the red blob, where it had disappeared, and once more the pine wood resumed its sombre colouring of greys and greens and browns. The End End of The Return of Alfred by Herbert George Jenkins Read by Anno Simon, 2011.